Hi guys. I would like to invite you to the audiobook service where we upload more than 300 hours of different audiobooks a week, link in details in the video description. Chapter 1. I had been betrayed. At the same moment I realized this, blood rushed toward my head, making my temples throb painfully. Betrayed. Backstabbed by the very man to whom I had devoted my heart and soul for so long it had never crossed my mind that the dedicated partner being deserted trope would be a story I had become the protagonist of. All the suffering I went through, the sacrifices I made to push Fabian Corps into becoming the best expedition team in the end, this is my reward. Thanks to the quality of the information I provided and the talents I scouted for him, Fabian was able to assemble a decent expedition corps under his command. With my support magic assisting them, he and his expedition members cleared dungeons and leveled up with ease. When crisis fell upon them, I sacrificed my left arm and saved them all. At first, it didn't matter to me whether or not my efforts were acknowledged, so long as Fabian appreciated what I did for him. That was why I hadn't cared even as I got mocked by the others, getting nicknamed Fabian's dog and labeled as a support mage who curried favor to strike Goldie had endured for Fabian and him alone. And yet all I got in return for my efforts was abandonment. Even though he knew I'd die if he didn't come to rescue me. I knew I had to feign calmness as much as I could, but it wasn't easy to refrain from displaying any emotion. Even worse, only Fabian and I were aware of my past devotion. So, have you made up your mind? A voice suddenly interrupted my thoughts and I was reminded that we weren't the only ones who knew. I was so dizzy that, for a moment, I forgot about that man. That beast radiating such a presence it was nothing short of a miracle I even forgot about him was also somewhat aware of what had happened between me and Fabian. Mayor Knox. The descendant of a hero, the only Grand Duke, the Dark Knight, the strongest swordsman he, the man with numerous titles decorating his name, was the one who enlightened me about Fabian's betrayal and drove me to a dead end. Now he was busy ceaselessly whispering honeyed words of temptation to my ears. He was also the one who saved me from the clutches of death, whereas Fabian had abandoned me. I shall ask you once more, June Carantia, will you join my expedition corps, the Dark Knights? He asked, his low-pitched voice paralyzing me, resounding throughout our surroundings like the strike of a hammer on iron. Superficially, it seemed like he was giving me a choice, but that wasn't the case at all. The mere pressure of that knowledge made the inside of my mouth utterly dry. I wanted to escape, but there was nowhere to run I was inside the Dark Knight's camp. There was nothing around me that wasn't of the highest quality be it the material of the tent or the array of furniture, everything lived up to the standards required of the title of Grand Duke. But all those things were outshined by the man himself, Mayor Knox. His black hair was like a lion's mane while his eyes staring at me unblinkingly seemed as if their shape had been carved with a knife. Although Mayor was an impressively handsome man, his aura the air around him made it impossible to casually appreciate his appearance. He was covered in black armor, true to his fame as a dark knight, appearing as if he had been carved from black steel. In short, he was like a fortress, impervious to any word I might say. He truly was a formidable one. Having been bestowed the title of Grand Duke at a young age, Mayor Knox was the first and strongest swordsman to enter the portal gates that had appeared within the Empire when the Felspawn's invasion began. And yet, at this moment he seemed anxious, very unlike his usual self. Was it because I wasn't answering his proposal with an immediate nod? Why are you agonizing over it so much? It is not a bad option in fact, it is the best option you have I cannot, for the life of me, comprehend why you are rejecting it, he said, his tone urging me to accept his proposition. And he was right. After all, everyone wished to join his acclaimed expedition corps, the Dark Knights. Not to mention, be it before or after Fabian's debut, they had occupied the number one seat in the rankings for a long time. However, I wasn't willing to accept his offer. After all, this man this was the core of the Demon Lord, the true final boss of this game I possessed my way into. The true final boss, or the real final boss the strongest enemy that the player would encounter in the end, regardless if they were evil or good the ultimate boss. Chapter 2 this world that I had unwittingly transmigrated into was an RPG game called The Sacred War. Not only did the title evoke a sense of nostalgia, but the story was also a very classical trope, 
defeating the demon lord who wanted to achieve world domination. It was unbelievable that a game released in 2020 came with a plot like this. Granted, playability was more important to a game than the story. But anyway the demon lord's attempt to take over the world resulted in the creation of dungeons throughout the continent, dangerous locations that were connected to the demon realm. The player's role was to accompany the protagonist Fabian in recruiting various characters and clearing dungeons. One of those recruitable characters was the owner of the body I was inhabiting, June Carantia, a support mage in her mid-twenties with grey hair and cat-shaped scarlet eyes. She was my favorite character in the Sacred War though, of course, that didn't mean I wanted to become her. It still eluded me how I ended up transmigrating into the game and possessing June, but again, moving on. In my original world, the Demon Lord was advertised as the final boss the player had to defeat to clear the Sacred War at least for the first playthrough of the game. Actually, the Demon Lord was a fake boss meant to take players by surprise in other words, a figurehead. Once the player defeated the final boss hellbent on world domination, the Demon Lord would be driven to his limits and go berserk. The player would then witness a hollow ending where the Demon Lord used his hidden core to turn back time. But of course, that wasn't the end. This game had a feature that had become increasingly common within games of the latest generation, a hidden ending. To see that ending, the player had to begin a second playthrough. After going through the same storyline with the same characters and battling the Demon Lord for a second time. The plot would then branch out and proceed differently, the former rival of the protagonist, Dark Knight Mayor Knox, would suddenly appear in the Demon Lord's castle. The player would then learn that Mayor was the core of the Demon Lord. To be rid of the Demon Lord's curse that slumbered in his blood, the Duke would slay the King of Evil. However, there was an unexpected factor in all this once the Demon Lord died, Mayor would absorb all his power. Consumed by the vast demonic energies, he would then become the new Lord of the Demons. Only by killing Mayor Knox who, upon becoming the second Demon Lord, would immediately go berserk would the player be able to see the true ending. Therefore, joining his Dark Knights meant being booted straight out of the main story. Not to mention, once Mayor became the Demon Lord, there was a great likelihood that the Dark Knight's core would be captured and persecuted as demonic minions, and I didn't want to be involved in any of that. My ultimate goal was to defeat the Demon Lord and then, as one of those who had fought alongside the champion, Livka a glorious life in the peaceful era that was to come. Even if joining the champion's side was not a possibility anymore, giving up my planned peaceful life of retirement was unacceptable. This was why I couldn't just up and join Meyer's side, despite the bitterness I felt from Fabian's betrayal. His offer that now seemed like a brilliant, golden rope of deliverance would soon become a rotten thread that led to my downfall. My situation was bad enough as it was Meyer's appearance only worsened it, giving me a headache. Cold sweat ran down my cheeks. I had to decline his offer no matter what question was, how. The Duke did not seem like a person who would back down easily. Even now, he was staring at me fiercely, his golden eyes glinting with the determination to have me join his expedition corpse by any means necessary. Chapter, 3 Why, oh why was Mayor Knox so hell-bent on having me join the Dark Knights? June Carantia, the character whose body I had taken over, was the only mage in the game that exclusively used support magic. She had no offensive, defensive, or healing spells in her arsenal. Among all the players of the Sacred War, there was no one who didn't consider June just a filler party member. There was a time when I had hoped that things in this world would be different from my reality. Mages were revered in this world, so I naively thought that even a support mage wouldn't be received too badly. Looking back, it had truly been wishful thinking. Disdain for support mages was prevalent not only among the players from my world but inside the game as well. Being a support mage was enough reason for my family to disregard me and for people to question why I had been included in Champion Fabian's Expedition Corps. Even the other members of the Corps gave me the stink eye, their gazes full of doubt. Back then, it had still been somewhat bearable the humiliation was brief and their appraising gazes were meaningless to me. Reputation. Pa. Everything will reset when the first playthrough is over, anyway, I remember thinking at the time. To me, all that mattered was having Fabian's appreciation. As a playable avatar, Fabian was the only character that began the second playthrough with memories of the first. 
Mayor Knox retained his memories as well, but only because he was the Demon Lord's core. I was the only exception, being a transmigrated person. Then, Fabian had once again set out to gather comrades to help him defeat the Demon Lord. Of course, those who were useless during the first playthrough were not chosen by him. By the end of the first playthrough no, actually, by the start of the second playthrough if I didn't consider Fabian's choice something for me to worry about. It was only natural that I would be included among the expedition members to be recruited on the second playthrough or so I had mistakenly believed. I can't even imagine leaving you out of the expedition, June. I absolutely need your help to defeat the Demon Lord, Fabian had whispered to me sweetly, only to abandon me in the end. Him not showing up at the promised rendezvous point in the current iteration was proof of his betrayal. We had agreed to meet inside the dungeon where we first encountered each other in the first playthrough. That dungeon was located near a village I was staying in at the time, and it had suddenly burst open. The villagers then panicked and tossed the only mage available mineside as a shield. I had lashed out, shouting at them, what do you expect a support mage to do alone? Don't you people know the meaning of support? In short, I had become a human sacrifice. It hadn't been long since I had entered the world while it was still in the first playthrough, so I hadn't had the time to figure out my situation. I had struggled, face bathed in tears, to no avail eventually, I got thrown into the dungeon. Meeting Fabian in there had been a stroke of good luck, otherwise, I would have died right after possessing June. Maybe that was why I had devoted myself to Fabian and thought of him as my lifeline. When the second iteration began, I was able to face the situation with more resolution than I had during the first time. And so, when the villagers decided to throw me in the dungeon again, I followed them without much resistance, certain that Fabian would come to my rescue. Had I known it would have been like that, I would have never gone in. Who'd be mad enough to challenge a dungeon alone? I could only silently regret it now, biting down on my lower lip. Sure, he already had all the information I could provide him so he was done with me. Still couldn't he at least have come to save me? Even if I was too useless to have as a comrade, he could have even though he knew my situation better than anyone else. Had it not been for Mayor Knox, I would have died in that dungeon while waiting for Fabian. Died without even knowing why he hadn't come. I would have just assumed he was being held up by something. Dungeon raiding was a political matter. Since Mayer had entered the dungeon I was in, it meant only one thing, Fabian had given up on the raid. There was only one reason why Fabian would give up on a raid, he had found a more profitable one. A dungeon where he stood to gain more by raiding it than saving me. And most likely the one he went to was the Ignota dungeon. Ignota was one of the dungeons that opened around the same time as the dungeon I was thrown in. By raiding Ignota, it was possible to acquire a ring of Flamisa significantly important item to Fabian, a flame mage. Since he could only choose one, he had given up on saving me. I hadn't even lost to a person I lost to a ring. This was pathetic. As the saying went, you never know what'll happen in life. Life in a game world was proving to be no different than the life in the reality I knew. Who would have thought that, of all the expedition corps that could show up, Mayor Knox would be the one to rescue me? Truth be told, I was shocked when I spotted him. I was truly grateful that he had saved me, but my feelings of gratitude were separate from his offer to join his squad. That suspension bridge effect. I gave my heart away once because of it, and once was already too many. Wetting my lips, I forced them open and said, First thank you for rescuing me, Your Excellency. If it weren't for your assistance earlier, I would have died to that Cyclops. First, you say. You do not seem much inclined toward my offer. Mayer raised a brow, seemingly unsatisfied by my response. He immediately hit the bullseye. I gave him a very innocent smile, put on a troubled expression, and scratched my chin sheepishly. It would have been so nice if he played along and just forgot about the offer, but he was proving to be more persistent than I'd expected. Moving with light footsteps, immediately casting magic upon sighting a monster as someone who obviously knows how to act within a dungeon. You wouldn't be trying to make me believe that you have no thoughts of joining an expedition corps, now would you? He questioned, staring at me. Chapter, 4 Sweat began to form on my forehead. Had he been watching me the entire time I was fumbling to get away from the Cyclops. But I didn't even sense his gaze. 
I hadn't felt such chills down my spine even as I was trapped in the dungeon, being chased by a monster. That's well I'm a support mage, and... How is that a problem? He interjected. But you don't even truly know my skills, your excellency. I cautiously told him what I thought. After Mayer had rescued me from the Cyclops, he had immediately summoned me to his tent, only to begin doggedly persuading me to join his expedition corps. What a joke. Did he think the Dark Knights needed to just act overbearing and people would just suck it up and join? Then again, I suppose some people would do that. Hmm as I contemplated a way to dissuade Mayer from having me in his squad, he seemed to be deeply immersed in his thoughts. He rubbed his chin for a moment before saying, fine. I admit I was impatient. Feeling saved, I couldn't restrain the delight I felt the moment Mayer retreated and involuntarily displayed it. Elated, I hastily smoothed my expression and put on an awkward smile, trying to show him how sorry I was. Haha <laughs> well, I'm thankful that you'd consider giving such a good opportunity to a support mage like me, but... Very well, he cut me off. Let us have another talk after I take a look at your skills. After all, we have yet to finish raiding the dungeon. And so, after he said that, Mayer sent me out of the tent so briskly, it made his earlier persistence seem like an illusion. Interestingly enough, I was firmly convinced that he was never going to let me escape. As I trudged out of Meyer's tent with heavy footsteps, determined to lay low, I wondered how I could dissuade him from recruiting me either way, I needed to hide my skills as best I could. I was doomed. I shall ask you again, June Carantia, will you join my expedition corps, the Dark Knights? As I entered the Duke's tent for the second time, I was struck with a strong sense of déjà vu, the same words, the same voice, and the same suffocating atmosphere. The source of my suffocation stared at me with a self-satisfied smile, very much like a snake leering at an ensnared prey. By raiding the dungeon together with you, I have learned more about your skills. As a support mage, you drastically reduce the time needed to clear the dungeon. You are an indispensable talent necessary for our expedition corps therefore, I insist that you join the Dark Knights, he said. Haha <laughs> I let out a hollow laugh, feeling the urge to cry. I had tried my best to do nothing during the raid, but I couldn't actually stay uninvolved, not with Mayor Knox staring at me with his terrifying gaze the entire time. June Carantia. You must find the dungeon a cozy place since you do not seem like someone who wants to get out of it, he had said, and his implication. If I didn't show him what I was capable of, he would leave me to rot in here. He already looked like he would truly abandon me inside the dungeon if I made the slightest mistake. In the end, I had to swallow my tears and do some work. Upon starting the second playthrough of the game, players would inherit all the ability points and skills they had acquired during the first iteration. This was a display of consideration from the game company that aimed to keep players from getting bored. Naturally, inherited abilities were vastly superior to regular abilities of the same level. Perhaps it was because I had transmigrated, but my body possessed all those game-like characteristics including inherited abilities. Of course, I already had a complete grasp of my abilities, which was why I was able to deliberately lower the level and effectiveness of my support magic. But the problem was the experience I had gained during the first playthrough. I ended up discovering the optimal timing to cast my spells, which made them more effective than I expected, and as a result. I completely failed in laying low. But I couldn't join the Dark Knights not like this. I tried my best to explain once more why I could not join the Duke's team. The Expedition Corps under Your Excellency the Grand Duke's command has such cohesive teamwork that I don't think there's any way I can fit in. Do you not feel it yourself how poor of an excuse you are giving me? He interrupted me, and I couldn't give him a response. He didn't have to point that out like that. Unlike the other time, where he had quietly let me go, Mayer seemed to be bent on recruiting me this time. Just as one would drive a felspawn to a corner, the Duke continued to press me hard. What is the reason that makes you so reluctant to join my expedition corps? He questioned. That's. You will find prejudice against support mages no matter where you go, he continued. Our expedition corps is the only group that can fully utilize your talent. I'm grateful that our excellency acknowledges my skills, of course, but. Then is there another reason why you refuse to join? He asked, cutting me off again. 
Perhaps another core you have already promised to go to? My heart sank at his probing question. His golden eyes seemed to pierce me, an intense and unrelenting gaze that kept me rooted in Plessis was the hunter, and I was his prey. As I then realized that he had herded me straight into a trap, my back became drenched in a cold sweat. What was this, an unavoidable event? Was it even possible to refuse? Licking my dry lips, I forcefully pulled the corners of my lips into a semblance of a smile and attempted to explain. Another core. I've lived in this village since I was born, Your Excellency. The Dark Knights are the first expedition corps I've ever come across. The first one, you say? Mayor asked, lips curling upward ever so slightly. I blankly stared at his smile and couldn't help but think, so he can smile too. I was snapped back to my senses by the sound of his fingers tapping on the table and hurried to say, I just. So you still have some lingering attachments to Fabian? He abruptly asked, rendering me speechless. Chapter, 5 I went wide-eyed at the sudden mention of Fabian's name. His implication was clear Mayer must have realized that I had memories of the first playthrough. All of a sudden, I felt panicky and dizzy, even more so than when Mayer first offered me a position among his expedition corps. Who would have imagined that he would have such a card up his sleeve? More importantly, I wondered if I should just pretend I didn't know Fabian the real question was whether Mayor Knox would believe my words or not. He was practically treating me like a vigilante already. Golden eyes flashing with confidence, the Duke smiled slightly and said, I detest wasting time and talking in circles. I believe I have given you more than enough time, so let us get to the main point now. I sighed tiredly. It seemed that these few minutes after we left the dungeon were all the time Mayer was allowing me to consider his offer. The man was being more difficult than I thought he'd be. At times, simple problems were even more complex because of their simplicity Mayer was exactly that type of person. With a voice that sounded resigned and wary at the same time, I asked him, how did you know I have memories of the first playthrough? First playthrough? What a curious expression. Going by your words, are we in the second playthrough, then? Mayer wondered out loud, seemingly amused by the gaming terminology I let slip by habit. He repeatedly muttered playthrough to himself, rubbing his chin, before continuing. You want to know how I knew? Why, just by looking? Pardon? I asked, flabbergasted. If possible, you should avoid lying. Even a child is better at fooling others than you. You may have thought yourself secretive enough, but your face is like an open book. He chuckled. I was speechless. Surely it wasn't that bad. As my face grew hot by his teasing, I tentatively asked, you're joking, right? I am serious. Although, of course, with the knowledge that I am not the only one who remembers the first playthrough, as you put it, he said, it was easy to catch on to your strange attitude. It can't be I murmured. Indeed. Fabian Ignis he also knows what will happen. So Mayer had already realized that Fabian had retained his memories. It was amazing how precisely he had filtered those who remembered the first iteration from those who didn't. Was this what people called the power of an ultimate boss? His unexpectedly quick comprehension of the situation froze me on the spot. Disregarding whether I felt nervous or not, he continued speaking in a dry tone. At first, I thought I had gone mad everything I remembered was happening again. He tapped his head lightly with his fingertips. And yet, while everything else in the world was happening exactly the same way, Fabian Ignis alone was making completely different decisions. It was then that I became certain, I was not the only one who had these memories. I remained silent and so he went on. Despite knowing you would be waiting for him in this dungeon, Fabian intentionally chose to go to another dungeon. He abandoned you. Therefore, if your intention is to wait for him to come, I would like to inform you that you are waiting in vain. Although I had assumed he would say so, it didn't help me feel any less hollow inside. I inwardly counted to a hundred, trying to maintain a calm appearance. No matter how dejected I felt, I couldn't let it show if I did, I'd be led by the nose. It would be quite troubling to have the man expecting me to join him take revenge. Fabian was Fabian, while Mayer was Mayer. I tried my best to draw a line between us as I responded with feigned calm. 
he probably went to raid Ignota Dungeon to get the Ring of Flames I voiced my speculation. Exactly, Mayer said, sounding genuinely surprised. I cannot understand why you refuse my offer despite being so clever. How can you side with Fabian after all you went through? Side with Fabian? I could side with him forever if only it helped me avoid getting involved with Mayer I could curse Fabian as much as I wanted later, after all. Forcing a laugh, I said, well it's certainly a good item. I'm sure Fabian had his circumstances. Immediately after I uttered those empty words, I felt as if my tongue had become stiff. Only a Buddhist that had attained nirvana could react as I did. The lengths I was willing to go to be rid of Mayer gotta say, what a tough girl I am. Mayer frowned, seemingly not expecting me to be so unwilling. He shot me an impatient look and sneered, are you just that good of a person, or perhaps oh. Now that I think about it, you were famous for being Fabian's dog. Is that why you remain loyal to him despite having been abandoned? I laughed bitterly. I see that you still remember that unpleasant nickname I got. It was a humiliating nickname, yes, but I didn't even have the energy to get angry. Besides, it wasn't exactly wrong to call me that either I was more surprised that Mayer knew about it. Mayer switched his tone into one of pleading, saying, how about you tell me the conditions you want? I will give you the best treatment. Is there a need for the Dark Knight to pick up something discarded by another? I taunted. I will do so all too willingly if that something is more precious than diamonds. You see, I value efficiency over honor, he tried to persuade me, staring at me fixedly with eyes full of longing. They burned hot with the desire to obtain me no matter the means, making me feel as if I'd suddenly become Zhuge Liang. Chapter, 6 No, no can do. I almost wavered there. I swiftly got a grip on myself and chanted, steady now, keep calm. So far, Mayer had been keeping a leisurely attitude however, seeing me tolerate his every word without so much as a blink made anger cross his face. You would have died had I not intentionally entered this place to save you. Despite knowing this, you still remain faithful to Fabian. He pointed out. You you came all this way on purpose. I blinked. Just to rescue me. I was just as shocked as I'd been when I realized Fabian had cast me aside. It was surprising enough that he even knew about me, so why on earth? My reputation in the first playthrough had reached almost rock bottom, whereas Mayer was a celestial being whom everyone wanted to serve. There wasn't a single common point we shared, so there was no reason for him to come looking for me. I was anxious to find even the smallest hint of that reason on Meyer's face as I stared at him, but it was useless. All right. I admit that you being able to recall what happened is an unexpected game, but Mayer trailed off with a small smile hanging on his lips, appearing pleased that I had shown a positive reaction, albeit slight. If his plan had been about me joining the Dark Knights from the start, then rejecting his offer would be next to impossible. As much as he had given up what he could have gained from another dungeon, he likely desired to return with some achievement. This is how much I want you, Mayer added. What a perfect line to take out of context. In particular, the way he kept his eyes fixed on me so seriously coupled with that handsome face made him seem like an obsessive male lead out of an angsty novel. But in reality, he was just headhunting. It is a principle of mine to get my hands on whatever I want, no matter the means, he stated. Your rejection gets me fired up. That's very suggestive I pointed out, feeling a tad uncomfortable. Fabian is, in the end, a failed hero, he continued, ignoring my words. You chose the wrong person to be loyal to. But he was the very reason for the hero's failure. The demon lord would have croaked if only time didn't rewind thanks to the core inside this man. I had much I wanted to say, but nothing I could voice. As I was busy trying to stomach my complicated thoughts, the duke did not waste the brief pause and resumed his attempts to persuade me. But that is not your fault it lies completely with Fabian. You too should be aware of such, having gone through everything. Fabian Ignis failed to defeat the demon lord once, and things will most likely be the same this time around as well. He cannot kill the demon lord, he said with a voice full of conviction. I felt ill just from listening to him. Yes, he was the one who'd kill the demon lord, not Fabian, but wasn't it pointless to kill the last boss only to become the last boss himself? 
Why the heck would I join him when I knew dang well what his fate was? Begging Fabian to join his corps again would be better than joining Mayer, and it was an option I was considering seriously. One might ask, don't you have any pride? Yes, just like everybody else, but the significance of Fabian's existence far outweighed it. He was the protagonist, the only chance of defeating the demon lord. I couldn't give up on him so easily, even more now that this was not a game to me anymore, but reality. Of all the other options I could choose, there was a surefire way to be happy in the future how could I ignore it? But it wasn't as if I could just tell Mayer that we were living in a world inside a game, that this world had a set ending, and that I was behaving like this because Fabian was the protagonist of the game how could I get out of this? I fell into thought, trying to find something that could work as an excuse. Sure, the Duke outperformed Fabian by miles, but in terms of offensive power alone, Fabian was probably better. The only issue was that the commander of the Dark Knights absolutely could not defeat the Demon Lord. Mayer was recognized by the world as being kin to the Demon Lord as a result, any attacks against the final boss would be rendered completely useless until the Demon Lord's health dropped below a certain threshold. His magical attacks were less effective since they were of the same element used by the Demon Lord and there was a limit to using physical attacks. Considering that Mayor Knox was the main offense of the Dark Knights, it was inevitable that he would lose if he fought the Demon Lord from the start. It was the reason why only after Fabian's core whittled down the final boss's health that the Duke could get an effective last hit in. Unless, of course, he changed his Dark Element to the Holy Element instead. Eh. Come to think of it didn't I have an element conversion skill? I hastily checked the detailed description of the skill window. The specified target's element is converted to the opposite element for a certain period. Element conversion was, honestly, an overpowered skill if one only looked at its description however, most monsters in Dungeon Sasside from a few exceptions were of the null or dark element. In short, people didn't need to worry much about elements, which was why the element conversion skill did not shine much. Mayer, on the other hand, was the complete opposite case. The opposite of dark element hang on. Would this work on Mayer too? If so this might just be worth trying. Chapter, 7 If earlier my heart had been racing from the fear of losing track of the future I knew, now it pumped furiously in anticipation of a new possibility. Mayer focused his gaze on me unblinkingly. Had he noticed that my heart had been shaken? I need you to defeat the demon lord. Please, work with me to bring justice and fight evil, he said in a murmur. Why me, of all people? I asked, my tone shrewd. This was something I had to clarify. Because I have memories of the first playthrough. Because I'm a support mage who's more capable than you expected. But you must have been unaware of these factors when your excellency decided to rescue me. So I must ask, why did you? Feeling as if the dizziness in my head had suddenly been washed away by cold water, I tried to visualize the situation as objectively as possible. True, I did feel betrayed by Fabian, but it wasn't like I couldn't understand why he did so. He must have thought it was the best option toward achieving victory against the Demon Lord. While I couldn't blame Fabian for his criminal decision, that didn't mean I wasn't angry. He couldn't imagine leaving me out of the expedition. My foot. He shouldn't have said something like that in the first place. The feeling of being fooled by the empty promises that were typical of a protagonist was just as bad as being scammed by a trusted acquaintance. Its effect on me was quite large pessimism had replaced my love for mankind. In any case, it would benefit me to accept Meyer's proposal if I wanted to act on the front lines as an expedition member. However I still couldn't figure out why he had chosen me. What use did he see on me, when even Fabian had thrown me away? I see that you underestimate your worth. You will be of more use to me than you think this I guarantee, Mayer suddenly said as if hearing my thoughts. He didn't give me a specific reason, however it seemed we weren't close enough to share thoughts. My use indeed, I could be very useful. Much more than Fabian knew, and Mayer guessed. I was confident that, should I decide to fully support him, Fabian would never be able to beat the Duke. By using the game walkthrough I knew, the information gained from the player perspective distinctive of a possessor, and my skills as a support magic specialist, victory in the battle against the Demon Lord would surely be Myers. But would this be okay? 
I hesitated not out of guilt for stealing the protagonist's position I just worried whether I could reach the final ending with the one supposed to become the final boss. Choosing Mayor meant exchanging a certain future for an uncertain one. Then again, it wasn't set in stone that Fabian could reach the true ending either. The path to the true ending was a difficult one, to begin with. Even when it was played as a game, it was a path of suffering that required many challenges. The only reason Fabian was able to clear the first playthrough was because of me and the knowledge I held. But it would be a grave mistake to expect the second playthrough to go the same way as the first. Fabian had likely abandoned me under the assumption that I had already given him all the information I had that was a huge miscalculation on his part. Everything I told him was about the first iteration and that didn't include dungeons and items that weren't related to his expedition core. Because of that mistake, he would fail to complete the second playthrough. I was so certain of this, I could even call it a prophecy. I did feel uneasy leaving the future of this world in Fabian's hands, though. Anyway, I now had a choice to make between a certain future that was out of my control and an uncertain future where I'd be the one behind the wheel. I had the feeling the stress of that choice would give me an ulcer. While I was chewing my lips, conflicted, a shadow of a smile appeared on the Duke's face. I also feel curious curious of where your limits lie, how much you know he wondered aloud and my heart jumped at his meaningful tone. He didn't seem to be talking about the information I knew about the first playthrough had he noticed something else. Could it be that he had found out that I tried to assassinate him? Yeah, I had tried to kill Mayor Knox in the first playthrough. And it wasn't just once. Chapter, 8 To kill the Demon Lord, it was necessary to proceed to the second iteration however, the best case scenario was to off him in the first playthrough. The fewer fights, the better, after all. Back then, I had nothing to lose, so I gave it a try. Unable to let go of my hopes, I attempted to get rid of Mayor Knox, the Demon Lord's core, before the last battle. Needless to say, I failed. As I cautiously observed him, I bit my lips out of anxiety. He couldn't have noticed if Mayor knew I had tried to kill him, he would have killed me on the spot instead of trying to recruit me no. He wouldn't have even come to rescue me in the first place. If I were to judge based on the goodwill visible in his gaze, I'd say it was impossible for him to know. Besides, I hadn't been that clumsy to have left traces. Strictly speaking, what I did for him was more like digging a pit for him to fall into rather than trying to kill him with my own hands. I had discreetly leaked information to the Dark Knights about one of the dungeons I knew, one that seemed too difficult for them to clear misleadingly, naturally. However, my efforts were fruitless, Mayor Knox cleared that dungeon effortlessly. After repeating the same trap several times, in the end, I had no choice but to give up on trying to get rid of him. Since no one else was capable of killing Hema man who could clear high-level dungeon show could I, a mere support mage, succeed? But anyway, it seemed that for the time being, I wouldn't be finding out how he truly felt on the inside nor why he was trying to have me in his expedition corps. Only time would tell, see in as I couldn't even join Fabian's corps at the moment. However, there was one condition the most important one that I had to negotiate before joining up. Surveying Mayor sharply, I said, in exchange for joining, I have a condition. A condition? I took a deep breath. I had no idea how it happened, but I was living in the husk of what used to be Juni had stolen her life. It wasn't like it had been my choice, but I still felt sorry for her. That was why ever since I had possessed her body, I had constantly thought about what I could do for her. But no matter how much I thought about it, I could only come up with one answer. I want you to I want you to please carve the name of June Carantia in history. To engrave June's name someone who had been ignored for being a support magin the annals of honor so that she wouldn't be forgotten as a mere shadow in the background. I felt this was the only way I could atone for visiting her body. Mayor raised an eyebrow, taken by surprise. Then, after a moment, he burst into laughter. Ha, ha 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 ha. I never expected you to place such a condition. I had no idea you were so hungry for honor. It was easy for him to misunderstand from his point of view. I couldn't correct him, nor did I have any intention of doing so. I quietly waited for his bout of laughter to end and, a while later, he spoke again with a satisfied grin. Very well, I will have your name recorded in history for eras to come. 
you shall forevermore be remembered as the vice-captain of the man who slew the demon lord. Since he had declared as such, I had no more reason to refuse. Whatever the case, this life was the only opportunity one had left so I couldn't carelessly throw it away just because Fabian abandoned me. I swore to myself that I would survive to the end and live a grand life as a hero in a peaceful world. Yes, given a second chance, even a dog would change owners. Therefore, since I was Fabian's dog once, why not become the Dark Knights? With a determined heart, I nodded and said, fine, I'll join the Dark Knights. A wise decision. You will not regret choosing me over Fabian, he assured me with a smile that reached his eyes, something I had never thought I would be seeing. The moment my guard lowered, he grabbed my hand for a big shake, making me feel as if I sealed some huge deal. His hand was so big I couldn't grasp it completely, even when I stretched mine out as much as I could. I would like to thank you for your decision, he continued. I will not treat you badly, nor will I spare any support you may need. If you have any problems, you may come to find me any time. Find him any time. It shouldn't be that easy to meet him, even if we were in the same corps. Haha <laughs> you're almost treating me like the vice-captain of an expedition corps, I joked. Did I not say I would give you the best treatment? He said, standing up. I do not lie about such things. His upright figure cast its shadow over me. As he was still holding my hand, I had no choice but to get up as well, albeit with a crooked posture. It almost looked like he was escorting me. I was reluctant lyled away by the hand, feeling awkward as heck inside. Chapter, 9 As he spoke, Meyer's tone was very kind. We shall discuss the details of defeating the demon lord after we return to the base, he said, his voice sounding from way above my head. Don't I get an adjustment period? I asked cautiously. I trust in your ability to cope. I don't know what part of me you're trusting in. I would say you are reliable enough, considering how you participated in the previous battle as a supporter, he said. Though I've apparently been cast aside in this second round. That is because Fabian Ignis is a fool, Mayer said. Strangely enough, he sounded delighted. Who would have imagined we'd stand side to side, insulting Fabian together? It truly made me realize I was one of the Dark Knights now. Yes, indeed what a fool. I replied in a small but butter tone full of self-mockery. Everyone, this is June Carantia. From now on, she is one of us. Hello. I'm June, a support mage I introduced myself, cautiously observing my surroundings as I gave a deep bow in greeting. The Dark Knights clad in a black uniform and armor all focused on me, their eyes showing a mixture of incredulity and stupefaction. We did clear a dungeon together a while ago, but that and joining the Dark Knights were separate matters. A stranger they ran across in a dungeon joined them right afterward. I could understand their bewilderment. After all, from their point of view, this recruitment was ridiculous. However, their feelings only appeared on their faces no one was daring enough to try and appease their curiosity in front of Mayer. With each step their captain took, the other members made way like the Red Sea parting from Moses. I glanced at the prophet in black and swallowed dryly. He looked very handsome. And that wasn't just me even when I played the Sacred War on its release, all players aimed to recruit Mayor Knox because of his good looks. To the despair of many, he was an unrecruitable character. Back then, no one had a clue that he would be the final boss of the true ending. Axion. Mayer called out loudly. Yes, your excellency. A handsome, scholarly-looking man answered his call and dashed toward us. He had curly red hair braided to one side and glasses perched on the bridge of his nose. Mana could be felt just by looking at his hair. That was Axion Flama, a flame mage. Although he was also a famous individual, he wasn't as well known as Mayer. Still, he was a core member of the Dark Knights, peerless when it came to flame magic. As comrades who will be braving through life and death together, the captain said, I hope you will take good care of her. You mean to say that she will be part of our main force? Indeed. She is a talented asset who will become the vice-captain of our corps. Axion's eyes widened in astonishment, and so did mine. Vice-captain, you say? Immediately, I grabbed Meyer's arm and asked, hang on a second. 
What do you mean, Vice Captain? A I E E. Axion suddenly exclaimed, looking even more shocked than before. I wondered if I had done something wrong, but before I could ask what I had in mind, Mayer laughed. Did I not say I would give you the best treatment? He replied in a matter of fact tone. However, this wasn't an issue that could be easily overlooked like Mayer was making it out to be. I had thought he would treat me like a vice captain, not as one. There was a subtle difference there. I had been under the impression that he would treat me well without giving me any power. Noticing my apprehension, Mayer sighed heavily and said, Everyone else is eager to become my second in command, yet you seem dissatisfied about it. Because I know my place well. I shot back, then begged him to take back his words, but the shameless man just smirked instead. I am sure a vice captain would be regarded with more importance than a regular member in history books, he said, pausing for a moment before continuing. But if you are against it, then. Very well, I'll take it. Vice Captain. I replied swiftly, just in case he took back his words, and he laughed loudly. He knew exactly how to use the carrot on me I must have looked like Sun Goku on Buddha's palm, dancing at his every word. I huffed, annoyed. While Axion blankly watched as the two of us talked his gaping mouth showing no signs of closing any time soon Mayer was rubbing his chin in satisfaction. Good. Since I have a definitive answer from you Axion. I ask that during our journey back to base you teach our prospective vice captain everything she needs to know about the Dark Knights. Yes, sir. The mage promptly replied in a disciplined tone, even though he was glancing at me with confusion visible in his eyes. After giving his subordinate what was practically a one-sided notification, Mayer turned to me. Then, June, I shall be on my way. I need to receive a report on the previous dungeon. If you have any questions, he added in a softer tone, ask Axion. Chapter, 10 As soon as I nodded, he turned around and disappeared somewhere. Meanwhile, Axion looked between the captain's retreating figure and me with eyes overflowing with astonishment. Wow this is the first time I've ever seen His Excellency behave like that, he said. Well, yeah, I shrugged. This isn't your ordinary case of recruitment. No, not that. Well, yes, that's strange too, but Axion babbled incoherently, a clear indicator of how lost he was at Meyer's behavior. His Excellency didn't even say anything when you grabbed his shoulder. Is that such a big deal? I asked, confused. I had appeared out of nowhere and became the vice captain, but he found that more serious. Axion was too immersed in his thoughts to pay me any attention. Normally, he would have given you a look full of disdain, or shaken off your arm, but no, he even made a joke. Uh, Axion? Then again, it's extraordinary enough to have been chosen by His Excellency as a new member of the expedition. You certainly are worthy of it the time taken to raid the dungeon got reduced by a whole two-thirds, after all, Axion mumbled to himself, off in a world of his own. He didn't look very sane as he went back and forth between denial and acknowledgement. Spooked, I involuntarily stepped away from him, and the motion seemed to belatedly snap him out of his reverie. With a bright grin, he looked at me and said, Ah, my apologies. I was a bit confused as this isn't something that happens so commonly. Just in case, I'd like to make it clear that I never asked His Excellency to take me in as one of the Dark Knights. He was the one who proposed it to me from the start. As I spoke, I recalled the conversation I had with Axion back in the dungeon. He had been against having Misumion they had found alone in a dungeon among them because I was a suspicious person. He had insisted that it would be troublesome if I clung to them later in an attempt to try and join the Corps however, Mayer had strongly insisted on bringing me with them. In hindsight, I should have noticed something was off, but now it was too late to regret anything. After that, Axion had continuously bothered me even while we were clearing the dungeon, annoying me so much I even swore St. Marianne's oath an unbreakable vow to him. I had promised and never asked to be recruited as one of them, and I made good on my promise, the captain had been the one who invited me to the corps. Ah, the oath he murmured a bit sheepishly. Actually, I should be the one apologizing. I'm sorry about my actions back then. His change of attitude was quick surprisingly so. With an uncomfortable nod, I replied, well it was understandable. I know how support mages are looked upon. 
but because I met you, I have realized how helpful support mages can be so thank you for expanding my narrow view of the world, June. Please call me Axion, I'm a ranged attacker of the Dark Knight's first platoon, Axion said, extending a hand toward me for a shake of reconciliation. I surveyed the gesture with mixed feelings. As Meyer's faithful right-hand man, Axion was extremely displeased when Fabian Kor made steady achievements in the first playthrough, rising to fame alongside Meyer's name. The two Expedition Corps rarely met, due to both being busy closing dungeons, but there would always be a big commotion whenever they did. I could still remember how he ignored Fabian Kor for having a support mage. In any case, aside from not having a good personality, he was fierce-tempered, too. It was why I had been expecting him to lord it over me for being a newcomer. Surprisingly enough, though, he willingly welcomed me. His abrupt change in attitude was almost freaky. Axion held power among the Dark Knights. There was nothing to lose from being friendly with him, considering how he was the second strongest damage dealer after Mayor. I laughed lightly and accepted his handshake. I look forward to working with you. I feel ashamed for my particularly irritable behavior in the previous dungeon. You see, at the time I was taking the lead as a test from the captain, which is why when I came across an unknown factor from the very start he trailed off. No wonder. I did think it weird that Axion had been the one cracking down on me so hard when his captain hadn't been saying much. Was your evaluation ruined because of me? I asked, worried. No. I received very good marks because of you. Thank you, he said, his eyes curving up and expressing his gratefulness. It was puzzling to me how he acknowledged my skills much simpler than I thought he would. Chapter, 11 During my time with Fabian's Expedition Corps, I had rarely received acknowledgement for my efforts, even when the results were positive because of me. I had joined the Corps at a time when they were still incomplete and well in the midst of leveling up. Since everyone was going through a period of growth, they had mistakenly believed that whatever good achievements they obtained was due to their own efforts when in fact it had been my support that had made it far easier for them. At the time, I had accepted things as they were, still under the illusion that all I needed was Fabian's appreciation. I would be through with the others once the second playthrough began. Who would have thought he'd toss me aside like this? This was why people shouldn't be trusted too much. Normally, I wouldn't have trusted Fabian so much. Because I had played the game from his perspective, I had thought I knew him well. Looking back now, I couldn't help but sigh at my stupidity. This time, however, would be better. I wouldn't consider this a game anymore and would avoid hastily judging with the things I knew. I planned to make Mayor Knox and the Dark Knights the strongest of them all because of the hurt I felt, just so Fabian would be unable to catch up in the end. I wanted to wait and see how well he did without me this time around. Every year, a performance report meeting would take place in the Imperial Palace and all the Expedition Corps would gather. Since the meeting for this year had just ended, there was one year to go. The mere thought of Fabian's face twisting into a grimace when we met a year from now was enough to make my lips twitch upwards. I was being spiteful, yes, but so what? I wasn't a champion or anything so there was nothing wrong with me feeling a trifling bit of triumph. Considering the betrayal I had suffered, to end it at that was already polite enough of me. Even if the time came that Fabian clung to me, I wouldn't have the slightest inclination of going back. As if he wouldn't abandon me twice over. Besides, a woman had to have loyalty. My thoughts might have been different had I told Mayer that I didn't feel right going with him, but since I chose to join his corps, doing the moral thing was the way to go. The moment I admitted to myself that I belonged to the Dark Knights, not the Champion's Corps anymore, a party member window appeared for me. My eyes filled with determination as I checked the list of all Dark Knights, which only I could see. Axion took me for a tour around the camp, giving a simple explanation about the Dark Knights. Then, looking like he had just realized something, he asked, now that I think of it, your parents must be worried to tears about you. Since you joined us, you'll have to live in Noctentoria, so how about taking a trip back home? Ah, uh, my parents I trailed off, tone aversive. I couldn't stop myself from grimacing it was awful just thinking about June's parents. Perhaps my feelings toward them could be explained by them being the first evil I had encountered upon waking in this world. At that moment, 
There was a loud noise from far away it was a crowd of villagers that had belatedly received news of the dungeon being closed. The dungeon really is closed. We've finally saved. Someone cheered. To think they'd managed to close it so quickly as expected of the strongest core, the Dark Knights. The villagers began to sing praises to the Dark Knights. I felt like they had some other motive and I wondered was I twisted inside for thinking that their lauding didn't seem derived from pure gratitude. Moments later, the village chief showed up, pushing through the crowd. He bowed his crooked back to Mayor and said, Thank you for saving our village. Although it's not much, we have prepared a festival to express our gratitude so I hope you will partake in it with us. The way the old man bent low, his face almost reaching the ground, stirred sympathy however, I knew the kind of person he was on the inside so he only seemed detestable to me. June. As the only mage in the village, you have a duty to fulfill. I want you to hold on in there so the gate doesn't open until the expedition corps arrives, he had said back when the dungeon opened. This man had talked about duty and whatnot when he had always looked down on me for being a useless support mage. And so, the villagers had insisted that I go inside the dungeon ultimately forcing me inside despite knowing there was nothing I could do in there. Putting aside my disgust, the village chief was being so pitifully cautious around the captain that he almost seemed slavish. Though of course, the latter didn't care about that and curtly rejected the village chief's offer. I have no time for a feast we will depart immediately. The village chief didn't give up. But still, if you could take our sincerity into consideration. Exclaiming so, he prostrated himself before Mayor. For him to be putting in so much effort to have the Dark Knights join their festival, there had to be something he was after and sure enough, all the young folks with passable looks that lived in the countryside village were gathering around. Chapter, 12 It was glaringly obvious that they were trying to take the opportunity to cozy up to the Dark Knights. Of course, they wouldn't dare approach Mayor Knox, but the members under him were a different story. If the Dark Knights defeated the Demon Lord, its members would be guaranteed successful lives as comrades to the champion. Also, the village chief's grandson was elegantly handsome if he could gain the favor of a dark knight mage, it would already be very good. On the village chief's part, he needed to make the expedition corps stay no matter what but who was Mayor Knox. He must have put up with this kind of person countless times after closing dungeons. He passed by the bowing village chief without even responding anymore. Why your excellency? The village chief cried and tried to chase after the captain, only to be blocked by dark knights. His Excellency has refused. Stand down. The Dark Knights members formed a wall to drive off the villagers. But. The old man hesitated, at a loss, when unfortunately his eyes met mine as I stood among my comrades. His eyes went wide in disbelief and he cried out, J. Jun. You're still alive. He sounded like he had never imagined I'd come out of that dungeon alive. Axion frowned, seemingly noticing the odd tone of the village chief's words. It looks like he never even considered you could still be alive, he remarked, turning toward me. Say, shouldn't he have asked about you first before talking to his excellency about a festival? I completely agreed with his words however, if the chief had the kindness in him to worry about my survival, he wouldn't have thrown me in the dungeon in the first place. I was used as live bait under the ridiculous pretext of appeasing the dungeon's anger, I said with a shrug, so I'm sure he didn't expect me to come out alive. Is that true? There's no way I would have gone inside a dungeon alone as a supporter otherwise. I can't even defeat a single monster by myself. Axion stared at me, shocked. It seemed like it was his first time seeing such a thing, but surely he had heard of such ignorant human offerings being made in countryside villages. Doing such an illogical, inefficient, irrational, and nonsensical thing in this time and age he muttered. Although I had no idea what he meant by this time and age, I agreed with him. While we were conversing, my father and stepmother who were both equipped with the four flaws of being illogical, inefficient, irrational, and nonsensical showed up in good time. Chief, what happened to the festival? Why, June? Every single one of them put the festival before June's survival, yammering about it when I had practically come back to life but I was used to their ridiculous antics by this point so I just clicked my tongue and didn't reply. Go and block the gate, June. You're a mage so I'm sure you can do it. Do you all even know the meaning of the word support? 
It's not something that'll be solved by me going in alone. I had shouted at them. But you're a mage, aren't you? The gate is opening as we speak while you're here, not budging. If the villagers die because of you, can you bear the guilt? Their lack of concern didn't surprise me, seeing as they were the very ones who spouted that load of dog turd. After a moment of shock, my parents' faces darkened within seconds and they began reproaching me. We were so worried about you. Why are you here instead of returning right away? How much more trouble will you cause for His Excellency after he rescued you? Excuse me, what? Not contented with yelling nonsense, they pushed past the other villagers and approached me, prompting the expedition members to immediately block their path. That, however, only made them yell more. We're her parents. Why are you stopping us? How can you stop parents from going to their child? If you can't let us pass, then send her over, please. My stepmother and father rushed to say. No matter how I looked at it, they seemed a million years away from being worried about me. Standing beside me and watching their farce, Axion grimaced in quiet disbelief as he whispered to me, Are they your actual parents? My mother is actually my stepmother, but my father, yes, I said. Axion bowed in apology with a bitter face. If only I could turn back time, I'd take back my words about your parents crying. I'll count it as you taking them back, I replied, unconcerned. How could Axion have imagined my parents to be like that? Even I found their attitudes hard to believe at first. The information I had was from Fabian's perspective so all I knew about June was that she had voluntarily entered the dungeon for the village's sake. She recalled what June had said when she met Fabian. You saved me, champion. You're the savior of our village I wish to offer you what little help I am capable of in your journey. Please take me with you. Perhaps that was why when I was playing the game, I passed off Juna's support mage being alone in a dungeon as just a contrived plot device for a smooth story progression. I hadn't known she had been kicked out by the villagers. Chapter, 13 This was also the reason why I had erased looking after family and friends from my list of things I can do for June. Gaslighting, physical and verbal violence, neglect ion after transmigrating, I had suffered through all these up until I was thrown into the dungeon, but June must have suffered abuse from her horrible parents throughout her entire life. The very thought if it was enough to arouse feelings of sympathy. June. I suddenly heard. Just as I was feeling depressed thinking about June, her parents pushed their way through the crowd to reach me, burning away my sentiments. I wondered how they got so close where did the dark nights go. A glance around and I discovered that the core members were watching me cautiously. Mayer had personally declared that I would join them as the vice-captain and entrusted me to Axion, an elite member of the Dark Knights. In this situation, anyone could tell that I was about to become someone in a position of power This seemed to be making the ordinary members walk on eggshells around me and also why they had allowed my parents through. Unbeknownst to them, that had been the wrong decision. The correct choice would have been to stop them, even if they were my parents. I clicked my tongue, displeased. But regardless of how I felt, my parents who had used me as a ticket past the Wall of Dark Nights looked flushed as if they thought they were receiving special treatment. My father haughtily walked forward and asked in a voice much louder than usual, June. I want to express my gratitude to the Grand Duke for saving you. Where is His Excellency? His Excellency is busy. And as for expressing gratitude, I've done that plenty enough, I said. Oh, child, he cooed, your thanks alone isn't enough. You've got to show an example, especially when it comes to this sort of matter. Come now, lead the way. No matter how I looked at it, he seemed more interested in something other than saying thanks. The real June might have felt hurt, but me? I just found it annoying. Didn't I say His Excellency is busy? Also, there is honestly nothing for father and stepmother to say thanks for. Me coming back alive. You're not even happy about it, I said sharply, refusing them. Child, how can you talk like that? Is making us look bad the only way for you to feel better? That's what you were like when I went inside the dungeon. You people pushed me in there to die. Did you forget about that already? I sneered. Goodness. Look at what she's saying, exaggeratedly muttered my stepmother. If there weren't people around us, she would have stared daggers at me by now, 
maybe even clutched me by the hair. Unfortunately for her, Axion was standing beside me. It was laughable seeing how she tried to look like a good person in public. I see you've been feeling very unhappy she said. But still, we're family so don't be angry. I really felt like I was going to lose it. Dealing with these shameless, brazen-faced people was not the way to go. I was trying to come up with a way to get these people to leave when Axion spoke up for me. I believe that's enough of saying farewells. Saying farewells? June Carantia is now part of the Dark Knight's core and we must depart immediately. There are other dungeons we need to close so we cannot delay here any longer, he explained. The disbelief on my parents' faces as they gazed between me and Axion was almost palpable. Their jaws dropped in shock they were having a hard time believing that the child they had ignored so much had become part of the core their village had tried so hard to make ties with. June is one of you. June W. What happened? What happened? I did well is what happened, I replied apathetically. I didn't intend on revealing my new affiliation it was awful just thinking about them going off selling my name, boasting about a successful daughter. Seeing the faces of my parents twist, though, telling them didn't feel like it was such a bad idea. Mere seconds later, I realized I had underestimated them too much. Perhaps they had gone mad from denying reality because they began to spout nonsense. Did you make trouble for them, June? You must have begged them to take you in otherwise, how would they accept a child like you? Could it be that the Dark Knights need people? Why, that's just perfect. How about having our Eugen join up as well? One of them said. Eugen. I parroted, dumbfounded. Don't be ridiculous. You. How can you be like this to your little brother? Are you trying to steal our Eugen's opportunity to join the Dark Knights just because you barely managed to be accepted by them? They shouted. What do you think family is for? Do you think it won't benefit you to have Eugen doing well? They didn't know when to stop. He's only ten years old. I screamed. It wasn't that I disliked my half-brother Eugen, but enlisting a kid who was barely capable of swinging a wooden sword into a dungeon raiding expedition corps. Ridiculous. It would be utter insanity to send the boy on an actual dungeon raid even having him as an errand boy would be a nuisance. Regardless, my parents continued to blather. A boy's got to become a squire from an early age anyway. Eugen is smart and agile too so. Chapter, 14. Yes, the other one agreed. His Excellency even took in a supporter like you. Eugen will be more useful. Axion couldn't stand there driveling any longer with a sharp jut of his chin, he gestured to the Dark Knight's members beside him. Get them out of our sight, please. Yes. As several Dark Knights grabbed my parents by the arms, they struggled to free themselves and, raising their voices, said, Why are you doing this? It is only with goodwill that we. I believe I said we have no time to delay have you already forgotten my words from a mere couple of minutes ago? Or did you find them so laughable that they weren't worth remembering? Axion's narrowed eyes glinted dangerously behind his glasses his usually respectful manner belied his fierce temper. Or perhaps do you think only the dungeon near your village should be closed with haste, but dungeons near other villages can wait? Is that it? Really now aren't you stepping over the line? T that's not what I meant, I. You're misunderstanding this. We just wanted to be of help to the Dark Knights, so. My parents sweated bullets as they tried to come up with excuses, but Axion only shook his hand in response, irritated. Immediately, expedition members lifted the shameless duo and took them over to where the other villagers were standing. Axion then looked at me, an apologetic expression on his face. Looks like I stole your opportunity to give them a piece of your mind. I'm sorry. Not at all. I'm sure they wouldn't have listened to anything I said. They've long considered my words to be the wind passing by their ears, I said, glancing at where my parents were being dragged off to. They were screaming in my direction with reddened faces something about me being unfilial and an ingrate. They didn't have the balls to confront Axion, the one who had chased them off, and so they poured all their resentment on me. What of it, though? It wasn't like they were my real parents so it served them right to be treated like that. With a giggle, I patted Axion on the back and said, Still, I feel good thanks to you. That's a relief. He chuckled. 
A united front against a common enemy was indeed the best way to build up camaraderie. I bumped fists with Axion and had to say, the guy's got a big fist. Meanwhile, the villagers could only suck their thumbs as the Dark Knights quickly packed up their camp. Already experienced in the act, it didn't take long before everyone was ready to leave. Do you have anything else you want to bring along? Axion asked me. No, nothing in particular. We can just go. He gazed at me silently with sympathy-filled eyes as if looking at a child who had never been given a proper set of clothing before by their family. And I realized that it wasn't that far off the Marquis really didn't have a proper set of clothing. Thinking back to the practically empty closet I had back home, I recalled how the few pieces I had to wear were all patched up and old. All this time I had naively thought that it was something that couldn't be helped since I was a commoner in a rural village. But now that I thought about it, my half-brother Eugen had decent clothes despite being a growing boy and more than one set at that. Since I had never stayed in the village for too long, I had never felt the difference, but now I could see it very clearly. The realization of how blatantly I had been discriminated against made me let out a bitter laugh. Axion suddenly turned to me with a worried smile on his lips perhaps he mistook my reaction as me being hurt by my parents' unfair treatment, because he said, don't worry about it anymore. Right, now that I think of it, a mage's uniform is provided as equipment. Really? Yes. I briefly forgot about this because mages usually dress as they want but I think there are some mage uniforms left somewhere. If you would please wait a moment he said, walking away. Hey, wait a minute, I don't need it right away Axion strode off without even giving me a chance to stop him. What a hasty fellow. And off he goes. It didn't take long for him to return with a mage uniform in hand. True to the Dark Knight's name, the uniform was a long, black dress-like robe with long sleeves and the symbol of the Dukedom of Noctentoria embroidered in silver thread on the chest. I couldn't find a mage uniform for officers please wear this, for now, I'll have a new set made for you when we return to base, Axion explained, his mouth twitching at the corners in dissatisfaction. Wondering what was making him unhappy, I took a closer look at the uniform and saw that the quality and finish of the fabric were inferior when compared to what he was wearing. What a shame to be giving something like this to our vice-captain to be, he grumbled to himself. However, the uniform was only lacking when compared to Axion's clothes compared to what I was wearing, it was practically a robe made for a fairy. I'm satisfied with it, I said. It's much better compared to what I have on right now. But it doesn't even bear the mark of a support mage. As for having a class symbol on it well honestly, you can tell a mage's class just by looking at the color of their hair. It changes according to their mana, after all, I said. Indeed. The denser the mana a mage possessed, the more vivid the color of their hair would be. That was why the top-tier flame mages Fabian and Axion had burning red hair, while mine was literally in the gray zone like any average support mage. I twirled a lock of hair that hung down my shoulders on my fingertips. Just then, Mayer appeared, all in good time. Let us depart now, he told us. Seeing me wearing a Dark Knight's uniform, he paused. Chapter, 15 Mayer was silent for a long while. Now that I think of it, it seems I was not being considerate enough. The Dark Knight's uniform matches well with your hair. I wasn't sure about that, but he was definitely paying lip service to imply that I had chosen well in joining his corps. I didn't put much meaning in his compliment, though. Thank you, Your Excellency, I replied. I am your captain now call me captain, not your excellency, Mayer insisted with a solemn face. Axion and the other still addressed him as such, however, but whatever. Boss's orders, anyways. Yes, captain. I nodded obediently. Hmm it is not at all satisfactory to have you wear the standard uniform. Upon our arrival at the base, I shall have a new set befitting your status commissioned, he said. Why these two were so disapproving of their corps' knight's uniform was beyond me. Meanwhile, Axianho had been listening to the side stared at me with amazement, murmuring, His Highness was never the sort of person to say such things. The captain was human too what was wrong with saying a few compliments. Still, I didn't know if he found that Mayor giving a compliment was hard to believe, or the uniform suiting me disregarding Axian's reaction, Mayor looked at me and spoke very seriously, In any case, now you know. 
your new uniform will be provided during your initiation ceremony, once we return to base. Yes. And I have sent word for a horse of your own to be readied. Go with Axion to the Cavaliers to be given one. Well, that was good news. Normally, only elites could ride horses while the rest of the troops would move on foot. Riding a horse wasn't nearly as comfortable as driving, but it sure beat the heck out of walking. During the first playthrough, I had only managed to get a horse when I was already midway through it so I knew how important having a steed was. Not long after I finally got to ride one, I lost my arm and ended up walking again. Having the privilege of traveling on horseback immediately fueled me with more loyalty, no, dedication than praising my looks, making me vice-captain, and whatnot. It was then that Axion finally recovered from his shock. But your excellency can June ride a horse. This promptly reminded me that horses were a valuable resource, so much so that the number of households in a village that reared them could be counted in one hand. It wasn't that commoners didn't know how to ride horses, most just didn't that was even more prevalent in kids like me, who grew up without a proper place in the house. But I had learned how to ride in the first playthrough, though. Before I could even clarify that, Mayer spoke up. She can, he said, in a matter-of-fact tone. I figured he must have seen me on horseback since he remembered me from the first iteration. And then, after giving a one-sided answer, the man went and disappeared somewhere again. The captain was a diligent person who was always busy and never stayed still in one place. It made me wonder if he couldn't be satisfied unless he knew everything that was happening within the expedition corps. Mayer was, in fact, a micromanager in other words, a control freak. As far as his corps was concerned, everything had to go according to his plans. Such a tiring personality it truly made me question how he had even endured having me join his team. Or perhaps he just didn't want to leave an unexpected factor out of his reach. While I reflected on Meyer's personality, I heard Axian murmur in an amazed tone, Wow! You sure are a woman full of surprises. It's just riding a horse, I replied, nonchalant, but he only shook his head at me. It's rare for the average person to know how to ride a horse, he said. But I suppose His Excellency went over this as well while interviewing you. Ha! <laughs> Well I sighed. I'm sure his exu, the captain had me join as vice-captain because I'm ready for action. He's not the type of person who'd give out positions based on potential first, after all. As an extreme control freak, it was of the utmost importance to Mayor Knox that his expedition corps members could work well together in a dungeon raid. It was why he rarely made impromptu changes to his lineup of elites. Initially, recruits would be assigned to the Third Corps and from there they'd rise in rank gradually, only after displaying their ability in cooperation and individual strength. However, going up in rank did not mean becoming an elite. Only when a vacancy opened in the Expedition Corps Mayor envisioned would then someone be selected to become a fully-fledged Dark Knight's elite. Dot. In a way, it was similar to how a professional club operated. To put everything into perspective, having someone join and immediately become the vice-captain like me was an extremely unusual case. Perhaps I gave him the impression of knowing too much about the Duke, because Axion blinked repeatedly, puzzled. That's true, but you seem to know a lot about His Excellency, he said. Chapter, 16 I gave him an awkward smile. I couldn't help it how was I supposed to explain that it was thanks to the information I had about the mayor from the first playthrough. Well you just need to look at the man and you'll know, don't you think? Although my reply was evasive, fortunately, it seemed to work on Axion since he nodded in agreement. My place was right behind Mayer, slightly angled from where Axion was. In other words, the very front. Even after I had become an old-timer in Fabian's corps, I had never been in such a position it had belonged to his childhood friends and close aides, Decca and April. Thinking about it now, I was not like them, so why did I think Fabian wouldn't cast me aside? My last self, in retrospect, seemed all too laughable and the good treatment I was receiving at the Dark Knights made the contrast even more obvious. But that didn't mean I could fully trust Mayor Knox giving my heart away only to receive betrayal in return wasn't an experience I wanted to repeat. I swore to myself I'd keep the relationship between us as collaborators only, nothing more and nothing less. This time I would draw a line, bold and clear. I glanced at Mayor Knox, who was facing forward. 
His sharp side profile that almost seemed like it had been carved with a knife was exceptionally eye-catching. Let us depart, he commanded, and the dark knights immediately began their march. The villagers could only watch us leave from afar. Some among them spotted me riding a horse right behind Mayer, kicked out in the corps' uniform, and turned wide-eyed. Over there isn't that June. She was alive. I mean why is she over there? Could it be that June with the dark knights? But ain't she a support type? A mere supporter joining the dark knights? That's absurd. Hey, Mr. Carantia. What's going on? Do you know anything? Even with so much distance already between us, I could hear their chattering. Apparently, neither the village chief nor my parents had said a word about me. They must have been too embarrassed to say anything, considering how they were chased off and carried away by several of the expedition members. TSK. I heard Mayor click his tongue, annoyed. If I could hear them so clearly, then he surely could hear them even better. I felt a bit embarrassed by those people's behavior, like a shameful side of me had been exposed. He slowed down his horse and waited for me to catch up until we rode side by side. As I shot him a wandering look, he began talking loudly as if he wanted everyone to hear what he was saying. What do you think of receiving this province as a gift for your enlistment, June? This province? Yes. Becoming a provincial lord is not a bad option, he continued, voice still raised. You get steady taxes and you can replace whomever you like, be it a village chief or whatnot. Not even a moment after Mayor finished speaking, I heard the gasp of an old man in the distance. Probably the village chief. Giving them some support is not bad either, considering this is your home. If there is a guild you want to establish, I will accommodate you to the best I can, he added. It was only then that the villagers looked at one another in realization. Why, it looks like June truly is one of the Dark Knights. You fool. She's wearing their uniform, isn't it obvious? Must be quite the high position if she's going to be granted land. Then shouldn't we be buttering up to June? They murmured among themselves, finally figuring out how far I'd climbed up the social ladder. Our village would grow in leaps and bounds even with just a single large guild established. I know, right? It's always hard going to the village beyond the mountain for work. Lots of other villagers would come over, so we'd have more businesses, too. The villagers became radiant at the thought of their dreams coming true. So long as they received proper support, it would only be a matter of time for their small rural village to develop into a city. But would June be willing to support our village? Speaking of that, the chief was the one who had June forced inside the dungeon. She won't be forgetting that. Besides, her parents were always unfair to her. Figures why she'd be through with them. The complexions of the village chief and my parents worsened more and more as the villagers continued talking. Concluding that their opportunity had been stolen by the three, T villagers glared at the culprits with bared hostility. Chapter, 17 The villagers had been complicit with my abuse, yet they shifted all the blame to my parents and the chief as if they didn't have a single fault. Pretending to be spotless, uninvolved what a joke. Putting aside my resentment towards my father, stepmother, and the village chief, the others were equally disgusting. I could still hear it, clear as day, how they had yelled that I would be the ruin of the village. They were malicious to the point where the indiscriminate hostility that came from beyond the dungeon gates was more welcoming in comparison. I repressed a sudden bout of nausea and forced myself to say, I'd be troubled if I received this province inhabited by them. You may as well bestow me something better down the line, please. Then I shall do that, Mayor replied and returned with his steed to the front of the march. Behind us, the village chief visibly sighed in relief, no doubt glad that he could keep his status. However, the villagers were all glaring at him sharply. I bet they felt like a good chance had just slipped out of their hands, akin with the possibility of getting a guild and whatnot. I could roughly picture what would happen in the village after my departure, nothing much would be different from what it currently was. But at minimum, my parents and the village chief wouldn't be able to walk around with their heads held high as they used to. The value of the name Dark Knights was truly high, considering how Fabian's core had been ignored like it was nothing when I joined him during the first playthrough. 
Before Fabian began to accumulate fame, June's parents had labeled him as a fraud because he wanted a support mage like me to join his team. And yet, when Fabian's expedition corps began to be renowned as the champion's force, the duo weaseled their way into the base to cause some trouble. The pains I went through to pry them away back then. But I was sure that they wouldn't have the balls to come to the Dark Knight's base, and this certainly left my heart at peace. Thanks to that, I was able to leave the village feeling more refreshed than when I had done the same during the first playthrough. And boy, how that made me feel good inside. When I found some time to take a breather, I opened the party member status window that I hadn't had time to take a good before, not with everything that had been going on. The game customization of this world granted me a special ability I could call up game interfaces, such as status windows. Through them, I could check on my level, the stats of my party members, and even see the amount of experience someone needed to level up. It also enabled me to monitor spell casting delays, receive support spell type as well as the duration of each. I had access to information unknown to others, and that Wasto summit up overpowered. First, I checked my status, level 23. I started at level 20, but it seemed I had leeches quite a lot of experience from the Dark Knights. To be fair, that dungeon had been level 35 and I had almost died back there. As the memory rose to the forefront of my mind, I felt a chill ripple through my body and I couldn't help but rub the back of my neck to try and alleviate the sensation. Although I had joined the Dark Knight's mid-raid, I had clearly gained more experience this time thanks to the core members eradicating every single fell spawn in the dungeon. Back in the first playthrough, I had been level 21 when I left with Fabian. The level 35 dungeon had been difficult for Fabian to progress through, so he had focused on killing only the core fell spawn and clearing the dungeon. He had deeply regretted not being able to obtain more experience from the remaining monsters. It couldn't be helped, though there was a limit to the number of people that could enter a dungeon. Because I had already been inside when they entered, Fabian Core had had to exclude one of its core members from entering the dungeon. It was admirable how they had managed to clear the dungeon with a cumbersome level 20 support mage who couldn't even cast a proper spell because she was still in the first iteration of this world and that came back to bite me many times after the incident. It was why the members of Fabian Core had begun to look at me unfavorably. Perhaps from that very moment onward we were on a bad start already. This made Mayer appointing a level 20 support mage as his vice-captain even more shocking. At first, I had thought Mayer offered me the position of vice-captain because he didn't know my level. Which was something usually hard to tell whether it was yours or another's imagine my surprise when I found out you could only discover someone's level by using a levelometer. Since I thought he didn't know my level, I had discreetly asked Mayer about it, as level 20 and 40 might have been all the same in his eyes. To my surprise, he hadn't seemed the least bit concerned. He had said, levels can be raised. I do not neglect the talented because of such things. But with me in the core, the average level of the Dark Knight elites will drastically fall. It will still be higher than the current Fabian core, he had said, reassuring me. I still felt incredulous whenever I recalled that episode however, his words weren't wrong. Mayor Knox was level 80 the average level of the core was still 50 even if we just combined mine and Meyer's levels. The maximum level attainable in the game was 99, but getting there was no easy feat. As a game, sure, but when the game turned into reality? It was like trying to reach God's domain. Chapter, 18 Considering how my ultimate ability was resurrection while the cost of triggering it required an equivalent exchange, it still wasn't something ordinary. The minimum condition for defeating the Demon Lord in the first episode was an expedition core with an average level of 60. Fabian wasn't even level 65 at the time, while I was level 62. Taking into account that reaching that level took bone-breaking effort, Mayor Knox who was level 80 from the start truly was an overpowered character. Perhaps that was why he was the true final boss. Already shaken by Meyer's level, I began to examine his other abilities in detail. As expected of the strongest swordsman, his physical attack and defense were both high. Also, as the core of the demon lord, his magic attack was no joke. His magic defense, on the other hand, was a bit weak but only when compared to his other stats it was still higher than most people. What the heck was this cheat character? No wonder all my assassination attempts in the first playthrough failed. His level and stats were so high, 
it would be strange if he wasn't able to defeat the demon lord. It was quite vexing had I known he was like this, I would have directed my time and effort to self-improvement. Everything I had done back then, from organizing information about dungeons that Mayer would be unlikely to clear to deliberately approaching the Dark Knights so I could leak aforementioned information all my efforts were in vain. Speaking of efforts, I wondered if Nova had joined the Dark Knights. Nova Felim, a giant, axe-wielding shield-keeper of the Dark Knights. Younger than me, Nova had been a rising star among the Expedition Corps who, for some reason, had been very kind and caring toward me. According to him, I resembled his big sister or something. I felt slightly guilty for having used him to leak information to Mayer, but he had managed to clear those dungeons alongside the captain and returned with huge level-ups. I remembered the bright, innocent smile Nova had given me in my previous life, I had helped him get a better standing in the core. Of course, gratitude aside, I still had a guilty conscience. The result didn't change the fact that I had used him. I scrolled through the entire party member list, but I couldn't find Nova's name. It looked like he hadn't joined yet I should be nicer to him if we met later on. Maybe it was because he had thought of me as his big sister, but I secretly cared for him as well. Although I already had a half-brother of my own, we were practically strangers it was why I felt emotionally closer to Nova, who had always been nice to me. Why are you zoning off? Mayer asked abruptly. He must have become suspicious from watching me mutter to nothing but air for a long while. This was why I tried to check status windows only when I was alone I had let down my guard because of the tedious horse ride. It it's nothing. How silly. Mayer chuckled, then turned his head towards the northeast. We will soon be arriving. I followed his line of sight and saw a tall castle among the mountains in the far distance, so tall that it gave the impression of piercing the skies. There lay the dukedom of Noctentoria, Meyer's base of operations. Noctentoria Castle was a stronghold strategically surrounded by a forest. The shroud of trees was so thick, sunlight rarely shone through the leaf canopy. After a long trek over the mountains, we finally arrived at the castle. The gatekeeper quickly spotted the expedition corps' flag and blew a horn, announcing, His Excellency has returned. The firmly shut gates opened and the returnees marched their way inside. It was my first time visiting Noctentoria Castle I never got to enter the base of another corps, to begin with. I had been to the Imperial Palace, though, during the annual performance report meetings. However, the atmosphere in Noctentoria Castle was different more solemn and serene, like a monastery. It was already surprising enough that Mayer had a base, and it was even a castle thanks to his nobility status. Then again, perhaps that was why he had formed three corps. It was astounding. Back in the first playthrough, Fabian Kor had only managed to get a base after crossing the midpoint of the storyline. And it was a very small base to boot. By the time the final battle had approached, they had managed to acquire a small castle, but that couldn't even compare to Noctentoria Castle. Even back then, many envied Mayor Knox's base. Everyone in the Fabian Corps had had an absolute belief that Fabian would slay the demon lord and rise to the seat of the emperor that, once we were through with it all, the imperial palace would be our new base. They had smiled so often back then, dreaming of a happy future. Using the palace as our base had been a joke, and yet everyone firmly believed it would become reality someday. Right now, however, I felt like I was starting the game with a cheat code. Chapter, 19 this was my second life in more than one way but it felt new and that wasn't bad. In fact, I liked that it didn't feel like I was living the same life again. Repeating the same experience wasn't very pleasant, especially when I could feel the discrepancy between the information I knew and the reality that would come to pass. If it wasn't for the big advantage I had from my insider knowledge, this life would have been almost no different than a curse. While I was absent-mindedly looking around the castle, Mayer got off his horse and said, Welcome to Noctentoria Castle, June Carantia. Who would have thought me, in Noctentoria Castle now I truly feel like I'm a dark knight, I replied, also getting off my steed I couldn't stay on horseback after he had dismounted, after all. I spoke without much thought behind my words, but it seemed Mayer didn't like my reply his face turned rigid in an instant. Finally feeling. It appears my treatment of you hasn't been satisfactory. I that's not what I meant I uttered, panicking. Nothing good would come from offending my superior, 
especially since I had no one to back me up in this place. I opened my mouth, ready to give an excuse amid my bewilderment, but Mayer cut me off. This is also your base now. Remember that, he said, eyes shining intensely. It was almost as if he was being wary of Fabian, who wasn't even around us. He must have been really bothered by Fabian stealing his thunder in the final battle. And now that I thought about it, that was entirely possible. Moreover, he could be thinking that I still had lingering attachments to Fabian. It couldn't be helped that Mayer didn't trust my loyalty after all, I had none. However, it wouldn't be good for me if he ended up distrusting my words because of that. I needed to pacify him somehow. But of course, Captain, I replied in a flattering tone and smiled at him. I noticed a while ago that, for some reason, Mayer seemed to enjoy having me address him as Captain. And sure enough, although his expression didn't appear to change in any noticeable way, his aura significantly mellowed. Well, then how about I show you around the castle? He suggested, drawing closer to me. Show me around the castle. Wouldn't I have to stick to his side all day long then? No, thank you. You don't need to go so far. His suggestion had been so sudden, I even forgot I had to keep him as happy as possible. To my surprise, I had stepped back, but what was the point? One single step from Mayer was enough to cover two of mine. Maintaining a distance that was practically no different than a moment ago, he asked, very naturally, do you dislike going around with me? It's not that, Captain. I'm just aware that you're a very busy man, I replied. Indeed I am, but you are the vice-captain of the Dark Knights, no. Nothing could be more important than introducing the base to you at the moment, he said, repeatedly emphasizing the word vice-captain. I felt oh so very grateful that he was driving my new status into my head for me, just in case I somehow forgot, I suppose. But still, a tour through an old castle with Mayer just didn't sit well with me. A stranger being guided by the Grand Duke around the base. Might as well ask for a spotlight and some trumpets to go along. It would be better if someone else escorted me like Axion, whom I had struck a fair friendship with on the way to the castle. I tried to insist that guiding me around the castle could be left to the others, but everyone was too quick on the uptake the captain had yet to even give the order yet they had all dismissed themselves. Mayer asked, what are you looking around so much for? I slumped, defeated. Haha it's nothing, let's go. There was no helping it. I needed to try my best to hide behind Mayer and avoid being seen. Unfortunately, just as I was about to follow the captain, head lowered in resignation, a grey-haired elderly man came out to welcome him. What a relief to have you return safe and sound, Your Excellency, the man said. Did the performance report meeting go well? Vince. Mayer greeted the old man with a smile, which was rare of him. Judging by the uniform, the old man seemed to be a butler. You came in a good moment I have someone to introduce to you. This is June Carantia, the vice-captain of our expedition corps. Mayer introduced me in an elated voice, pulling me forward. My efforts to hide behind his cape were futile I was dragged right before the butler. Chapter, 20 It was one hell of an introduction that skipped straight to the main point with no explanation. I wondered if everyone else was accustomed to Meyer's manner of speech and contemplated whether I too should be getting used to it, but thankfully, that didn't seem to be the case. The butler was visibly confused. Vice Captain, you say? Indeed. She is a talent I barely won over with hard effort, so see to it that all her needs are met. Yes, sir, the butler replied. He seemed uncomfortable he glanced at me in disgust and adjusted his reading glasses on the tip of his nose. It did not escape me how he pointedly stared at my hair it was why I hated how hair color reflected a person's mana type. The only ones that liked it were attention seekers who had a popular mana type. I twisted my lips, disgruntled. I had had enough. I wanted to get away from the butler's disbelieving gaze, but Meyer's grip on my shoulder was unrelenting. I couldn't even bulge. Unaware of my feelings and he would remain unaware for the rest of his life Mayer kept me in the front as he continued to speak. Come to think of it June, what is your preferred type of room? A high story or a low story room? A sunny one? Just say the word and I will give you the best I can. 
The butler stared at me with increasingly widening eyes as the captain kept on talking. I wanted to laugh. Even if he looked at me like that, I didn't know why the duke was being so good to me. I just wanted him to stop staring at me so questioningly. Meyer's attitude was so favorable toward me that his memories of me from the first playthrough weren't enough to explain it. I hung my head, avoiding the butler's eyes. For some reason, I got a hunch that I'd be staring at the floor the entire day. My hunch proved to be correct, as usual. Everyone who saw me walking beside Mayer looked as if they'd seen a ghost. I continued my futile attempts to hide behind his cape and at times his shadow, but with how he kept checking on me and chatting, I didn't get what I wanted. I truly wasn't used to the look those around us were giving me. Their gazes made my ears burn hot. I always had little presence when I was with Fabian Cora I had always kept myself a step away from the center of things. No one would spare a glance my way, and my name was rarely mentioned by other people, if ever. Now, though. Just who is she for His Excellency to talk so intimately with? Someone asked. Never seen her before I suppose she's a recruit. But there's still a long while until recruits are picked. She has gray hair another person murmured. Can't be that she's a support type mage, right? As if. She probably just has gray hair. A support type mage joining the Dark Knights? Ridiculous. It wasn't just the expedition members even the workers of the castle were gossiping. I didn't want to listen to their chattering, but whether I liked it or not, their voices reached me loud and clear. I did not doubt that Mayer could hear them too with his superior senses, yet he continued to feign ignorance as if nothing was amiss. Feeling that this could not go on, I tried to stop this train ride of a tour. I'm sorry, but I think we've just about looked around everywhere. We still have not entered the main area, he replied. I tend to be confused when I try remembering too many places in a day, you see. That is not something I would expect of an expedition member who has cleared many a complex dungeon. Noticing my excuse for what it was, Mayer smiled as he firmly stated, I understand that the interest you are gathering is making you uncomfortable. But I must take you around like this to imprint your existence among the Dark Knights with relative ease. So there was a reason he was parading me around the base, to let everyone know he had my back. But still isn't it too radical to appoint me as vice-captain out of nowhere? I think there would be fewer protests if you recruited me as a somewhat low-ranking member, at the very least. I suggested. Even the people who weren't sure whether I had joined the Dark Knights or not were making such a commotion already they were sure to explode into a riot if they knew I was to be vice-captain. Mayer, however, did not seem concerned in the slightest. I do not recall if I have told you this before, but I am not fond of wasting time. You would have eventually become the vice-captain regardless since I must constantly discuss things with you. I am thrilled that you trust me so I trailed off. Mayer insisted on having his way so brazenly that he looked almost innocent, and to that I could only nod weakly. Two resources were necessary to avoid wasting time, and they were money and manpower. The former wasn't required in this circumstance but the latter, in this case, had to be none other than myself. In other words, I had to work my butt off. A sigh slipped from my lips as I recalled the conversation I had with Axion and the other dark knights as we sat around a campfire, right before arriving at Noctentoria Castle. Chapter, 21 Everyone will be surprised when we return to base. Because the captain brought along a support mage? Because His Excellency personally recruited somebody, Axion explained, eliciting nods of agreement from the others. I still couldn't wrap my head around it, though. Players had a nickname for Mayor, Chow Chow. Yes, that Chow Chow from the Three Kingdoms period in Chinese history. The reason for the nickname was the collectoresque talent trait given to Mayor the majority of the useful characters in the game were under his flag. All the recruitable characters of the Dark Knights had good stats, and naturally, Axion was included, despite being non-recruitable. This begged the question, how is it that a talent collector like Mayer had never personally recruited somebody? I couldn't hold back my curiosity and asked, but isn't the captain quite the greedy one for talent? That he is. And he's meritocratic too. He treats his men according to their ability rather than their social standing. The captain is incomparable to those other expedition corps that give out positions based on noble status or some of donations. 
it isn't like he lacks money, after all. In fact, His Excellency has ample finances, being a Grand Duke. Few it really ain't easy having a boss like him, one with power, skill, and lots of money. Isn't that why you joined as well, team leader? Spearman Vegan asked and Axian nodded. Vegan was in his early forties and was the eldest in the corps, but his rascal personality belied his age. I shot a quizzical look at Axian, who shrugged and explained, You see, I'm not one to listen to those weaker than me. Ah, I nodded. It was questionable whether that was something that anyone should be proud of, but the man held his head high, so what could I do? Uncomfortably play along, it seemed. Vegan smirked and continued, as a dark knight, your most important task is to be useful in a dungeon. Exactly. No matter how much potential you have, if you aren't ready for immediate action, you start from the third core. In that sense, June was really amazing. She was so well coordinated, it felt like she had been with us for three years already. Totally His Excellency's type. Exactly. Completely His Excellency's type. Those two seemed to be omitting some words, making everything sound misleading couldn't they say His Excellency's preferred talent. Speaking of which, didn't June say it was her first time in a dungeon? Wow, then she really must be a genius. I had been so certain they'd be displeased with me suddenly joining the team as their superior to my surprise, they were being quite friendly. Whether that was because we cleared a dungeon together or because Mayer had given them a warning, I didn't know. However, this warm atmosphere incomparable to what I had experienced during the first playthrough was certainly unfamiliar to me. Still, one question remained, why had Mayer never stepped up to recruit somebody before? It was odd, especially considering his meritocratic personality. Another core member called Zinni a little older than me and in charge of taking the vanguard as a shield keeper spotted the wondering look on my face and giggled. Dear me, we ended up going off topic, she said. Anyway the Dark Knights is the expedition core furthest in the lead, is it not? The force people all over the world aspire to join. You mean, there's no need to go scouting for people because they'll come looking to be recruited on their own? Yep. But, but for example, maybe you come across someone of fine caliber on the road, by coincidence. And then maybe you scout him. Were there really no cases like that? Not until now, but Zinnia paused for a moment. With you as the precedent, I don't know how His Excellency will act from now on. Now that June's one of us, there'll be more people from high society hoping to get recruited by the Duke. They'll go I'll become the June second or something along those lines, Vegan said with a teasing laugh. People from high society wanted to join. The very thought of it made me shudder I was against the idea of having my name become synonymous with Cinderella's. As we continued to chat, we ended up talking about enlisting with the Dark Knights. Normally you take an enlistment exam to join the Corps. You've heard of it as well, right, June? I have, I nodded. The Dark Knight's enlistment exam was famous, nothing short of a grand event where talented people from all over the world came to exhibit their skills. Some would challenge the examination many times over, while others would apply only once before trying their luck with another corps. That's how we joined 2-0, by the way our team leader was the best among the other candidates in his time. I'd say that I'm top out of the entire Dark Knights, not just compared to the exam candidates back then, Axion declared confidently. The other members seemed used to his attitude they merely glossed over his remark with disinterest. Come to think of it, it's already time for us to start receiving rookies. Indeed. It's supposed to begin a few weeks after we arrive at the base, so it's probably not that far off. June will probably have to attend, I think. Silently, my expression twisted in an odd grimace, involuntarily expressing my reluctance. Zinnia quickly noticed it and worry flashed across her face. In any case she began in a concerned tone. There are many who've had to fight to join the Dark Knights. You can expect some envy directed at you for just popping in from nowhere, June. Well I suppose I'd react the same way if I were them. I nodded understandingly. A vice captain dropped out of nowhere and just so happened to be one of those mages. It would be strange if people saw me favorably. Even during my time with Fabian, I was ignored and ridiculed for being what I was. Because I had been a regular member of a corps at the time, it had ended at unkindness, 
but now that I had become a vice captain. It wasn't like I was going to get bullied, right? Getting bullied at this age. Chapter, 22 Obviously, people would feel less willing to show me respect due to my standing. Perhaps my inner turmoil was apparent on my face because Zinnia came to console me. Putting everything else aside, the Dark Knight's core is composed of those who have gathered out of admiration for the Duke. They may envy your closeness to His Excellency, but I'm sure they'll be more accepting once they witness your capability. Would they really, I wondered. I didn't reply and, seeing the concern still showing on my face, Axion brazenly added, she's right. Take me for an example at first, I was a tadpole, but after seeing you in action I gave you the respect you deserve, didn't I? What a proud thing to say, team leader. What's not to be proud of? He retorted. But the problem is we need to enter a dungeon to see your abilities, June. How about asking His Excellency to go on a dungeon grind? Please tell me you're joking, Zinnia muttered, aghast. A dungeon grind. I guess there's no other way than that. No, June. How could you take his words so seriously? Although the topic veered off course due to some arguing, Axion's suggestion was certainly worth considering. The best way to showcase my abilities was to go on a raid together, after all. But there was one problem, the enlistment exam was much closer than I had thought. I worried whether I would be able to mingle with the other members before the new batch of rookies was chosen. There were only a few weeks left and that was too short a time to build interpersonal relationships. As I fell into thought, I chewed on my lips, anxious. Then again, perhaps this was for the better I could form my own faction from among the rookies. And if Nova joined this time around, things would be a little easier. While I was busy running a one-woman show inside my head, I failed to notice the captain staring at me. Suddenly, he stopped and looked down at me, asking, do you dislike having me assign you to work? At first glance, he seemed to be asking for my opinion, but why did it sound like he was daring me to agree? It seemed Mayer had misunderstood my slow pace as an expression of how unwilling I was to work in his expedition corps, which wasn't the case. I shook my head hard, almost excessively. No, that's not it. I like to work, I firmly said. Work? I liked it, yes. Working meant leveling up the core and only by raising everyone's levels including mine could we safely clear dungeons and defeat the demon lord, no. I was the type to put safety first. Honestly speaking, the world peace that would come after I died wasn't very important. My hard work was an investment for the future, like when one studied hard in middle and high schools. To obtain a happy and comfy future, I had to grind those levels now. Whenever there were high risks, there would be high returns. I would face many difficulties as a vice captain, but wouldn't my effort be rewarded just as much once Mayor slew the demon lord and became the emperor? Therefore, I had to work hard to achieve that end. I clenched my fists and inwardly cheered myself on, eager and determined to grasp a happy future. I've never been in a position that entails responsibility, captain, but since you put your trust in me, I'll try and do my best. How reassuring, he said. I have faith in you. Do not forget to come to me any time if you have any trouble. His lips curved in a discreet smile as he patted my shoulder in a stately and trusting manner. I wondered if he learned these kinds of things because he was born as the heir to a dukedom. Was there a book titled Effective Ways to Pet a Subordinate as a Superior or a Leader or something? I was impressed, but that wasn't what mattered. Putting aside working hard, I had no desire to be the center of attention or the topic of gossip among the Dark Knights. We had yet to visit the dining area or the training grounds, and there would certainly be many people within those areas. If I were to escape Mayor, this was my chance. I shot a tentative glance at him and tested the waters to see if I could sneak away. Yes. Well then, if you'll excuse. Well then, allow me to guide you to the main castle now, he ruthlessly interrupted me. Ah, okay. Meticulous as he was, Mayor did not allow me to escape and then he led me around Noctentoria Castle. Everywhere. To the stables behind the castle, the mess halls one for regular members and one for officers the training grounds, and even to the unfrequented prayer room in the Northern Tower. Chapter, 23 Even as I was practically being dragged on a tour around Noctentoria Castle, 
I tried all sorts of ways to stand out as little as possible but with Mayor Knox as my guide? Fat chance it'd work his size alone was eye-catching, not to mention how he was the boss around here. Whenever we passed by people, they would bow in greeting, their gazes immediately pasting on me the moment they raised their heads. Oh, the puzzled look on their faces. Thanks to that, I left an impression on every member of the Dark Knights I met. I felt like a twelfth grader taken to a big family party and being introduced to every single cousin or a job-seeking graduate. Despite how I reeled from the stress of sudden exposure, Mayer seemed satisfied to have achieved his goal. Now then, I shall give you some free time. Get acquainted with things around here, he said like he was giving salve to the bruise he had inflicted. How long is some? I hesitantly asked. Until your initiation ceremony is scheduled. I have to go through a separate initiation. Naturally. After all, you are the vice captain of the Dark Knights, he said. Then, uh, I hesitated. Do I have to go up to a podium and, like, give a speech? Stuff like that? I would say you must at least give a short word on your thoughts and ambitions. Warg I seriously hate this, I said and clutched my head in horror, letting out an involuntary groan. As far as I was concerned, even becoming a student council officer was amazing I wasn't cut out to be an expedition corps officer. Seeing my reaction, Mayer looked at me quizzically. Do you have stage fright or anything of the sort? That's not it I just prefer not to go on stage. I'm a backup gal type of person, I said honestly. Even while I was in college, I didn't like being the presenter in group assignments, to the extent I'd always call first dibs on doing the PowerPoint presentation. However, he still wouldn't let me avoid doing a speech. It cannot be helped, then, Mayer replied, tone dripping with pity. Try your best. Meanwhile, it looked like my room got ready while we were going around Butler Vince came to have a word with the captain. The vice captain's room has been prepared. Just in good time. Where is it? It is the White Deer Room of the Southern Tower. A fine room. You did well in readying it, Mayer said before turning to me. June Carantia. I shall escort you to the end. What? No, 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 I can get there by myself just fine. I just need to head toward the greenhouse, right? You should go back and rest too, Captain, I said, desperately trying to dissuade Mayer from guiding me to my room. Of course, he didn't back off so easily so, in the end, I had to run away. Fortunately, he didn't chase me. Once I finally reached my room, I sighed in relief. Just by stepping into this private zone, the tension accumulated in my body dissipated completely. Without even bothering to have a look around the room, I flopped straight into bed. My room was on a high floor and it had a good view. Everything was as I had requested of Mayer, so much so that he had even taken my passing remark of the bigger the bed, the better into account. I rolled about the bed wide enough for five finally, I could rest easy. It was a wonder how relieved I felt just from having my own room. Minutes later, I dozed off with my clothes still on. I didn't even realize I was out cold until a knock at the door woke me up. Um, Vice Captain. Are you in? Why were you looking for the vice captain here ha hang on? I called out, suddenly realizing that I was the vice captain. I hastily got to my feet and checked whether my hair was okay and if there was any dried saliva on my face there was a mark on my cheek from the blanket, but it was passable. I strode over to the door and opened it. Yes, what brings you? Hello, vice captain, said the woman standing on the other side of the door. She seemed to be around my age, with neatly braided light brown hair and wearing a maid uniform. My name is Mary and I'll be serving you during your stay in the castle. I thought you'd have woken by now, so I brought some water for you to rinse your face. True to her words, there was a trolley carrying a bowl of water behind her. I didn't quite understand the situation I was inch brought me water to rinse with. To serve me. But nevertheless, I couldn't just leave her standing outside. Come in first, please, I said, stepping aside. Yes. Mary nodded and demurely stepped inside, then placed the bowl of water onto the table in the room. Then she added two drops of herb oils and sprinkled some leaves in the water. I washed my face while feeling the awkwardness of having a spectator. It was my first time experiencing such a thing, 
except for when I visited the Imperial Palace during performance report meetings. When I lifted my hair, water dripping from my chin, Mary immediately handed me a towel already pleasantly warmed to dry with. After putting away the bowl, she asked, Will you be having your meal at the officer's hall, or shall I bring it here? Um, could you please bring it here for now? The thought of being ogled by people in the dining hall did bother me, but I didn't intend on going out of my way to avoid them I just had something to ask my new maid. Chapter 24 Mary promptly pushed the trolley out of my room and, minutes later, came back with some decent-looking breakfast. I didn't have the mind to check out the room properly on the day before, but now I could see there was an adjacent office and a simple dining room as well. Also, befitting its name of White Deer Room, there was a stuffed white deer head hanging in the center of the dining room. Such bad taste could it be that there were other stuffed animals in the other room as well. While I was busy with my thoughts, Mary went about setting up my meal. I sat at the table and took a bite of bread. So, Mary the first casually asked. What exactly is the scope of your work? I am to help with room cleaning and your meals, maintaining clothes, managing your equipment as well as relaying requests for them, and assisting with your schedule, she enumerated. I will provide all the necessary support you'll require in preparation for dungeon raids, Vice Captain. The supporter of a support mage that probably made her a secretary. Do all the other members of the Corps have someone like you, Mary? No. Aside from His Excellency and you, Vice Captain, only five elites are assigned personal assistants. The Duke's command is to focus on dungeon raids rather than bother with trivial matters. Aha! Normally, a Vice Captain should have more assistants, however, because your appointment is still temporary. I was the only one assigned for now as the head maid, she explained. Wait a second, you mean I'll have even more people helping me? Yes, Mary answered with a nod and I felt slightly impressed. So this was why it was so good to have a Grand Duke for a captain. I couldn't help but marvel at the unprecedented treatment I was receiving. As a service worker, Mary was perfect, showing no distraction throughout our entire conversation. Her job was to assist me, while my job was to raid dungeons all right, guess I had to work to earn my keep. I offered a handshake to her and said, well then I'll be in your care from now on, Mary. I will do my best in assisting you, Vice Captain, Mary replied with a smile and accepted my hand. We shook hands with firm grips conveying our respective resolves. A felspawn opened its smelly, filthy mouth widely, dripping with saliva mixed with blood from God knew who. The sludgy ground slowed our pace and the red eyes glinting around us oppressed our hearts. We had entered a dungeon I had been firmly against entering. I had advised that we would be overstretching ourselves were we to challenge it at our level, but the core members had become too drunk with our previous victories. They had pushed forward with the raid and this was the result, exhausted mana and many injuries. The core of the core's offensive forces, Fabian, was barely hanging in there as well. We had no more holy water to use, and the healer of the expedition the priest April had long run dry of holy power. We had nowhere to run and I spared a moment to wonder if this would become my grave. I could practically hear how everyone was losing hope. Even Fabian seemed overtaken by helplessness I saw his grip on the sword weakening. Were we going to end like this? I fiercely bit my lips and the metallic taste of blood filled my mouth. I couldn't just give up on the life June had given me. Life was a gamble. Nothing could be gained without sacrifices. It was better to try something than to die without resisting like this. Just as everyone else was about to give up, I finished gathering my resolve and mustered up what I had left of mana to cast a series of skills. Mighty strength. Divine devotion. Feeling strength surging from within, the flames of hope sparked in Fabian's blue eyes. As soon as I finished the incantation, I yelled, Go now, Fabian. He shot toward the fell spawn, flaming mana roaring from his sword, and power to a far greater extent than usual. Squeezing out everything he had, he instantly slew the monsters before him. I felt like we might be able to survive this, and I wasn't the only one everyone's faces lit up with anticipation and hope. One after another, the Felspawn were defeated. However, when Fabian lowered his guard for a fleeting moment, thinking he had killed all of them I yelled in panic, Fabian, behind you. Be careful. Kook. 
but the monster's jaws had clamped down faster than my voice could reach him. Chapter 25 The felspawn bit Fabian's left arm, tearing a chunk out. With gritted teeth, the champion retaliated by beheading the monster. Ha, ha he gasped for breath after killing what seemed to be the last creature in the dungeon. F.A. Fabian, are you alright? How's your arm? Asked the core members as they rushed toward their leader. His childhood friend April frantically worried about his injury. Your arm was nearly torn off, she said. The injury will linger if we don't treat it right away, but I still haven't recovered my holy power. Don't worry, April, I'm fine. Fabian grinned at the worried members surrounding him and shook his left arm at them. Seeing that he was indeed fine, April was moved to tears. Oh, Saint Marianne. As for me, however, everyone else's relief felt like a distant dream, something separate from my reality. My mouth felt parkedno, I had been gaping without even noticing, dripping saliva. My vision had long been blurred by tears and blood ran down my left arm, consumed by a scorching pain, and fell to the ground along with my tears and spit. This is all thanks to June's support magic, Fabian said. What June's? June, thank you June. Fabian sounded puzzled. Had he finally realized my condition? He quickly approached my hunched, kneeling body. June. June. Are you okay? Get a hold of yourself. Why is she behaving like this? Why is her arm suddenly in tatters? Only when they realized the state of my arm did shock color the eyes of the other core members. Fabian's face turned grave he must have realized that I had transferred his wound to myself. He urgently turned to April. If we treat her after exiting the dungeon will she fully heal? An injury of this degree the healer hesitated. It'll be impossible to fully recover even after we leave the dungeon. We'll have to amputate it. Good lord. The festive atmosphere created by the defeat of the Felspawn instantly plummeted into that of a funeral. Feeling their sympathetic gazes, I gasped for breath and forced myself to rationalize amidst the pain, pretending to be fine. It was worth it investing an arm both Fabian and I lived thanks to that, didn't we? It would be restored once the second playthrough began, anyway, so it was okay. It was a dream of when I lost my arm. What happened after that was an obvious story. My arm was gone, I became a cripple, and I was still a useless support mage within the Expedition Corps. Nobody acknowledged how I had saved everyone thanks to my ability instead, I got a mocking moniker for casting a spell of sacrifice for Fabian, loyal dog June. Did she even do anything to be proud of? It's a relief that Fabian's arm is intact thanks to her sacrificial magic. True. Support mage June's arm is useless, but champion Fabian's arm is a treasure to humankind, after all. Of course, Fabian had stood up to me whenever I was showered with insults but in retrospect, that was only a pretense. Had he confessed that it was thanks to my spell that he had been able to defeat those monsters, no one would have belittled my contributions. I learned a lesson from that incident self-sacrifice brought nothing but self-satisfaction and nobody would give any recognition for it. The first thing I did after waking up was to check if my left arm was moving properly I still couldn't get enough of seeing it move. After staring at my well-functioning limb for a moment, I got out of bed. Mary, who had come to attend to me since morning, remarked, You seem to be in a good mood today, Vice Captain. Did you have a good dream? Oh, is that how it seems? I smiled brightly as I received a towel from her. I didn't have a good dream, no. I'm just so satisfied with life right now. I felt like I wouldn't be losing an arm while I was with the Dark Knights, not like I did back then, at least. Not counting the booming supply of holy water, in the first place, they wouldn't barge into dungeons I advised as dangerous. My work and life balance were now incomparably better than in the first playthrough. Perhaps this was what it felt like to work in a company with good welfare. Not like I knew what being employed was like I had transmigrated while I was doing nothing but preparing for employment. This was probably why people were so hell-bent on time traveling. I hummed and asked Mary, could I have something to write with? I'll prepare it right away, she said and immediately brought me the tools. I rubbed my hands together, staring at the quill, ink, and paper that had appeared in front of me in the blink of an eye. 
To properly utilize the information I had, I needed to categorize them and make a comparison between the danger levels and the current capabilities of the expedition members. No one would make sense of it anyway since I would write everything in Korean. Chapter 26 I could write both in my mother language and the language of this world. Although I had none of June's memories, I could use her abilities. This was why I had an upsetting time in the beginning, because I remembered nothing about family and so on, despite having no difficulty communicating or using magic. I had no real use for Korean but it was convenient to use it when writing things only I was supposed to know. The language of this world was like English, which was why I wasn't worried about my notes being discovered. Even if they were, the two languages were so distinct, the content wouldn't be easy to decipher. The quill smoothly glided across the paper as I jotted down everything I could recall about dungeons and item sources. Writing them down one by one was easy, perhaps because I was doing it for the second time. The first time I did it, back when I was part of the Fabian Corps, I had a horrible time practically squeezing my head for memories. I could still remember, clear as day, how I had labored in the room of an inn, working under the lamplight until the night became day. The result of my efforts was a semi-strategy book and it was thanks to memorizing its contents that I could recall everything with such ease. Done. I cheered and gathered the papers I spent two whole days writing, making a booklet out of them. Since I would check it often, I opted to cover it with sturdy leather. Considering it was the second playthrough, I thought of letting Mayer know about the booklet, but I rejected the notion within seconds. If what Mayer wanted from me wasn't my abilities as a support mage, but the information I knew I would lose my value by telling him. Truthfully speaking, hadn't Fabian set the precedent of abandoning me, thinking that he had learned everything I knew? Besides, I would just end up looking suspicious since the booklet had information on dungeons that Fabian hadn't managed to clear previously. Seeing how Mayer remembered me, he would doubtlessly remember which dungeons Fabian had cleared before. Knowing details about dungeons that hadn't even been cleared before was perfect for drawing suspicion. It was better to only give hints here and there when the opportunity came. Of course, I didn't think I could keep the booklet a secret forever since Mary would be reporting on whatever happened around me. This was a separate matter from the trust one had from her her loyalty was owed to her wage payer all she needed to do for me was to be a good assistant. I wasn't so shameless as to expect secrecy from Mary when I wasn't even her employer. Still, it seemed better to hide for the time being, or at least until I made my faction within the Corps. I was sure Mayer wouldn't be ridiculous and reproach me for hiding it. He wasn't completely open with me either, after all. Gotta keep our privacies, right? One of the things I did very well was keeping Fabian in the dark regarding the second playthrough. Had I told him everything, things would have turned into an even bigger mess. The passage of time had returned rationality to me and I could plainly guess Fabian's current thoughts. He without a doubt intended on growing a bit stronger to defeat the demon lord, which had to be why he didn't want to give up on obtaining the ring of flame, as it would increase his attack power as a flame element user. While I was with Fabian, I gave him clues about dungeons, pretending they were gained by using my support skills. He likely believed he could clear the second playthrough with the information I gave him and therefore didn't feel the need to take me along. However, he would have likely been troubled had I joined another expedition corps and did the same for them there was no need for two to be in the know, after all. Maybe that was why he had left me to die. I didn't lose my head in the clouds, thinking of how he left me, his comrade, or how he couldn't be so horrible my shattered trust made me question Fabian's very nature. The facts spoke for themselves if it weren't for Mayer, I would have died alone in the dungeon. In the present, I was a seasoned corps member, which was why I could hold on for far longer and why I could just barely meet up with Mayer. I had luck on my side too, of course. Had he been the tiniest moment later, Mayer would have found my dead body instead. Pity, oh pity. I was alive and well, and he was clueless that I had joined hands with Mayer Knox, the man he was most wary of. I was glad Fabian didn't know I remembered the first playthrough, as he wouldn't have used such a passive method of getting rid of me otherwise. He would have killed me for certain. I ridiculed Fabian inwardly as I praised myself for my past decision. Chapter 27 It was almost afternoon tea time when Mary came in with a tea set and some light snacks. Are you finished with what you were doing? She asked. Yes. Starting today, 
I'll have lunch and dinner in the dining hall for the time being. I had been cooped up in my room for the past several days, organizing information, and so I was able to finish the booklet faster than I had predicted. Do you remember where the hall is, Vice Captain? It was natural for Mary to worry about that as I had never stepped foot in the place since Mayor gave me a tour of the castle. Remembering places and locations is my specialty, I replied with a smile. Ah, she chuckled. I suppose that was a silly thing to ask the vice captain of a corps. Familiarizing oneself with a visited location was a basic skill expected of any expedition corps member since getting lost in a dungeon was practically suicide. After enjoying a moment of relaxation, I set out earlier than usual for dinner. It had been so long since I last went out watching the sunset sky, I reminisced about the days back in my world when I would pull all-nighters studying in the central library when I did exams until late afternoon. The sky in this world looked just like the one back home. I entered the dining area and the atmosphere immediately became unsettled. People began murmuring among themselves upon seeing me, the root of many rumors, after so long. I couldn't help but sigh at the sight of them gossiping about me from a distance. I knew my disappearance would have this sort of a bad effect. It would have been better if I had come down for some meals every now and then, but it was too bothersome to do so while I was busy. Focusing on one thing at a time was much more efficient, after all. I ignored their stares and went further inside. I briefly considered going to the officer's mess hall, but then I remembered that despite already being treated like a vice captain, I had yet to be officially appointed, thus I simply headed for the regular mess hall. The food there was distributed on trays and, although it was for regular corps members, the quality of the meals was rather good. Then again, the Duke wasn't one to be thrifty on this kind of matter, so long as the men performed well. I picked a bowl of tomato soup with plenty of vegetables and sat alone at a table. There weren't that many people in the hall, perhaps because it was too early for dinner, which meant that it was exceptionally easy to listen in on conversations. I perked up my ears, curious as to the rumors going around about me. Maybe they'd say something like how ridiculous it was to have a support mage as their vice captain, or something like that. But as the saying went, reality always surpassed imagination. Is she the one? The vice captain His Excellency took a fancy to. I heard someone say. Took a fancy to. Wasn't that a strange way to put it? But that was merely the start there weren't just one or two things I wanted to refute in their chattering. It wasn't enough that the Duke recruited her personally, he even made her vice captain right off the bat, they continued. Judging by her hair, she must be a support mage another person interjected. Since when did the Dark Knights accept their kind? Maybe maybe she forced His Excellency to take her in through some shady means, you know. Shady means? Yeah. Like, say, the voice lowered, seducing him physically. The last comment was so shocking, I almost spurted tomato soup all over the table. I tried my best to pretend like I wasn't eavesdropping, and fortunately, they were too focused on their conversation to notice. But His Excellency isn't interested in things like that in fact, he detests such types. Well, there are so many exceptions being made where that woman is concerned, after all. True. Putting aside the Duke's dedication to destroying dungeons, it's kinda understandable that he'd make irrational decisions about his lover, right? It honestly doesn't make sense this special treatment, I mean. What's so useful about a support mage? Unless she's his hidden lover. Yeah. Even after arriving at the castle, he took her around on purpose. Oh, I saw his face back then. The way His Excellency looked at her, it was no. Joke. He was laughing so often, too. Wait, the Duke was laughing. I'm serious. It was like he couldn't take his eyes off her, almost as if he was in love in love with my abilities, most likely, since people with a talent like mine weren't common. It seemed like Mayer taking me on a castle-wide tour was more detrimental than helpful. He probably hadn't expected this result either. What did the ones who returned with them say? Well, they said she's skilled, but I'm sure they're just trying to get in her good graces ahead of time. She's the vice captain now, but who knows when she'll become the Grand Duchess. Maybe that's why she's been staying inside all this time you know. Together with His Excellency. I had never expected the truth behind my days of seclusion to be distorted like that. Such absurdity. 
Me, Mayor Knox's hidden lover. The man was renowned for being ascetic. Women and whatnot did not interest him all he cared for was closing dungeons. These people surely knew that, too, and yet they went on about Mayor and I doing what? Sure, the captain had never personally recruited someone before, but this was just. Chapter, 28 It was shocking how they found it more plausible that the Mayor Knox gave out a position because he was smitten instead of thinking that the support mage he took in was useful. Perhaps that was just a reflection of how terrible support mages were. My lips trembled as I was struck with the urge to clutch my belly and laugh out loud at the ludicrousness of it all. There wasn't any logic in their gossiping for me to get angry. Me and Mayor knocks up a tree. Ha! I thought I had gotten used to being treated like a dog, but this was new. Still, I couldn't just leave things as they were. While I had expected rumors about me to fly around, I didn't think they'd be nothing but scandals. This won't do, I murmured, convinced that I had to do something. Just as I was glaring at my food tray, pondering about the easiest method to fix this entire situation, someone called out to me in a cheery tone. Oh, June. Long time no see. I looked up, only to see Axion. Why was he here instead of in the officer's mess hall? As he put down his food tray and sat opposite of me, I asked, how come you're over here? I came because I thought I saw someone who looked like you. Are you done hunkering in your room now? Yes, well, pretty much. I nodded. It was only after Axion came over that the gossiping nearby stopped. He dunked a piece of bread into his tomato soup as he asked, I'd like to ask the same myself, by the way. How come you're over here, June? I'm sure His Excellency has permitted use of the officer's mess hall. He has, but as I haven't been officially appointed yet. You're surprisingly uptight. He laughed. A woman of principle, are you? I just want to avoid doing things that'll be frowned upon as much as possible. There's enough talk about me as it is. Axion stuffed his cheeks with bread as he said, would just let them talk if it were me there's no helping it anyway. I wanted to retort that it was easy for him to say that but seeing how he stared at me with his brazen face, I felt he would truly live up to his words. He probably never bothered about what others thought, the egoist he was. Everyone would acknowledge him for being a powerful flame mage, after all. I don't think it's at the level of just talking, though, I added with a sigh. Such is the fate of the popular. Get used to it, June. I stared at him, speechless. Was he trying to add oil to the fire or what? I low-key hated myself a little for seeking advice from him. Suddenly, Axion started swiveling his head around, startling the diners nearby as they rushed to avoid his eyes. He smirked. You're definitely an interesting subject of gossip. Everyone must be keen to hear the gossip after such a long time of nothing but training. But people who cross the line by prattling about someone else's affairs do so because that's the only thing they care about. They're the sort who'll fall behind eventually, so don't give it much thought, June, he said. That's cold. We have to be cold. And he was right. Being cold-minded was necessary because a split-second decision inside a dungeon could be the difference between life and death, even more so when it came to judging people to trust one's back with. Axion's eyes shone behind his glasses as he continued, however to suggest that His Excellency, of all people, would be swayed by his emotions in a matter concerning dungeon raids those people have insulted not only you for their amusement, but the duke as well. And as a member of the Dark Knights, that cannot be forgiven. No wonder Axion's attitude was so hostile he seemed displeased that Mayor was involved in my rumors, almost raring to secretly slit someone's throat despite having just told me not to bother about it. Who knew what would happen if I agreed with him here? Well you couldn't understand it at first either, I replied in a slightly softer tone. Not understanding and questioning His Excellency's command are two different matters. Didn't I faithfully obey the Duke's orders despite my unacceptance? That was true, so I conceded and let him act all haughty and high-headed. At this point I'd say you're most certainly one of us now. I stared at him. You weren't certain of it until now. Ha <laughs> ha. You see, it would have been terrible if you had run away before becoming vice-captain. So should I assume you're about to tell me something that would have made me run away? Very astute of you. He nodded. 
So, what is it? This secret that'll scare me off, I asked disinterestedly. I wasn't too curious as I knew almost everything except for secret information only known among the Dark Knights but I felt I had to make some conversation. Perhaps my reaction was satisfying, or maybe he just wanted to go on and say it, but Axion looked excited as he began, I told you last time that His Excellency has never personally recruited anyone besides you, June, but... Yes. I think people are overreacting even considering that. Is it because I'm a support type mage? That's not completely unrelated, but I think it's more because of His Excellency's usual disposition, he said. Usual disposition. His Excellency is uninterested, to an extreme degree, in anything other than closing dungeons. It was the only thing he derived joy from. Bingo. His had to be it. It was kind of an open secret that Mayer was driven insane by his loathing of demons and fell spawn alike. The only reason there was little talk about it was that the act of closing dungeons itself was a socially recommended virtue, to begin with. But the man was not normal, of that I was sure of. Chapter, 29 I assumed that it had something to do with the demon lord's core inside Mayer, but I couldn't say anything about that. Whenever His Excellency hears about an open dungeon, he can't be satisfied unless he goes and closes it. It must be why there was an incident two years ago where he closed three dungeons in a row, Axion said. Three in a row? Yes. Thanks to that, we had to stick it out with nothing but jerky and dry rations for half a year. It took a whole week to get rid of the stench of monster blood on our bodies. It was just horrible. Even as he said that Axion looked strangely elated as he recounted the suffering he went through. Clearly, he wasn't sane either. The incident of closing three dungeons in a row was publicly known because the Dark Knights often mentioned it in pubs during performance meeting days. As a country bumpkin from a rural village, I wouldn't normally know about this, so I feigned ignorance and nodded. That's awesome. That, June, is your future. You mustn't run away. I won't. Truly. Axion jokingly asked. I couldn't wash properly for months. Because our uniforms are black, I couldn't tell how dirty it actually was. Oh, the streams of blood that came out whenever I did laundry. Phew. Was he indirectly telling me to run? The faster we close dungeons, the faster we can defeat the demon lord, and then I'll be completely free. I'll have an easier time in retirement if I work hard in advance, I replied, shrugging. Besides, I had already gone through such experiences many times when I was with Fabian late runners had to work their legs to the bones to barely catch up. Moreover, the Dark Knights had plenty of funds and didn't need to be miserly. Fabian Kor, on the other hand, I could only sigh whenever I thought about them. In a way, I think you'll get along very well with His Excellency, Axion muttered with a frown, unaware of my circumstances. Thank you for the compliment. Coming from him, that could indeed be considered a compliment. For some reason, though, when I gave Axion a nod of thanks, he scrunched his brows even more, inexplicably muttering birds of a feather under his breath. But it seems that your goal isn't to close dungeons. Well, of course. I plan to sit on the honorary post of the last seven and live gloriously. My apathetic reply made Axion smile sadly. At times, His Excellency gives the impression that closing dungeons is his only purpose in living. Honestly, it's to the point where I'm curious about his plans after the Demon Lord dies and everything is over, he said. Then, with a sigh, he confessed, I'm telling you this because you said you're not running, but we have the occasional deserters here too. Deserters? Pushovers attracted by the glory of the Dark Knights, he explained. They have decent magical abilities but are wimps with no backbone. Every one of those fools tried to gain some fame with the contribution of casting a few spells from the rear line, but they have dropped out. It was understandable. Mages capable of joining the Dark Knights would be eagerly welcomed in other expedition corps. Here, though. On top of the regular member treatment, there was darn hard work to do. However, there are those who remain despite it all. Of course, they all have some other motive in mind rather than improving themselves. Could they be enduring it for the sake of the future after the demon lord is slain? I wondered. Yes. Only the officers will join the final battle anyway, 
so they're avoiding the truly dangerous fight. Wouldn't the world belong to the Dark Knights after our elites finish the job? Axion sneered. They're fixed on the petty gains they'll get from being one of us by then. Figures. The Dark Knights have a relatively low death rate since they thoroughly prepare before entering dungeons. It wouldn't be difficult to just hang in there. You even know the death rate among us. You must have been researching a lot. Ha, huh, I laughed it off innocently. I knew already, but I was glad he had misunderstood it. Going back to the main topic the Duke has firm ideals and he tends to march straight towards them. It's an aspect of him I admire a lot. So, you mean to say? I prompted. He's a bit far from what you'd call being tactful as he's crazy about dungeons. Admiration aside, Axion's appraisal was rational. Yes, well. He didn't seem to be much of a listener. I thought back to how Mayer had dragged me around the castle despite my obvious reluctance. But Axion firmly shook his head at my reply. No, you haven't even seen all of it. I haven't. Whenever you're involved, he becomes extremely, exceptionally considerate. Axion exclaimed. Although only relatively, he added. Oh is that right? I wondered what he meant by considerate, but I didn't need to ask out loud Axion began to explain every little thing. His Excellency asked what sort of room you'd like, didn't he, June? That's the thing he's not the kind to even give such an option, to begin with. And what about the enlistment gift? Ha! He chuckled. How about guiding you around the castle himself? It was two days ago that I realized, for the first time, he even had the common sense to do that. I stared at him, speechless, as he went on. Also, didn't His Excellency tell you to call him Captain? Within the entire Dark Knight's core, you're the only one to call him that way. Chapter, 30 Well, that's because I tried to explain, but he cut me off. And remarking on how your hair matches well with our corps' uniform? When I first heard that, why, for a moment I thought His Excellency had morphed into something else before coming out of that dungeon. How astonishing was that? Axion exclaimed, becoming increasingly discomposed, seeming incredulous at his own words. My impression of Mayer had been that of a normal, albeit a tad overbearing person I knew he was crazy about dungeons, but during the first playthrough, he hadn't been as nuts as Axion suggested he was. Was it something I never knew in the first place? Or was it that Mayor Knox had changed? I tapped the table with my fingertips as I pondered about it, feeling like something was strangely out of place. It was like I was a tiny inch away from catching onto something. You being appointed as vice captain is something I can accept easily. I know you're truly skilled, after all. His Excellency's recent behavior, though he trailed off. Perhaps he thinks treating me nicely will be helpful in clearing dungeons, I suggested. Doesn't that sound more plausible than His Excellency being under his lover's thumb? That's true, but even I was surprised at first, despite knowing what you're capable of. Of course, I was convinced of your skills right away, but the others he winced. They probably don't accept you because they don't know your ability. I guess I'll have to prove myself to them, then. If you ask me, it's something that'll be solved with a single trip to a dungeon. If you ask me, it's something that'll be solved with a single trip to a dungeon. That's what I was thinking of. I'll do some pruning while I'm at it, too. He chuckled. Now that I knew what people thought about me and the rumors going around, what I had to do became clear. My original plan was to be cautious, but there was no need for that anymore with the rumors going around. Since Mayer had granted me a privilege so great it gave people the wrong idea, there was no reason for me not to make use of it. After finishing my meal, I got up with the food tray and shot a grin at Axion, who still had leftovers. Let me ask you one thing, Axion. What is it? The captain. Where is he usually at in the evening? Most likely in his office. He normally deals with paperwork and holds tactical meetings after dinner time, Axion had said. Following his advice, I made my way to Meyer's office and knocked on its thick oaken doors. Come in. The low voice that came from behind the doors sounded imposing and detached at the same time. Mayer didn't seem to be in a very good mood I must have come at a bad time. I clicked my tongue and pulled the door open, immediately plastering a bold smile on my face. 
It's been a while, Captain. Have you been well? Ah, uh, June. Meyer's voice abruptly softened once he noticed it was me coming in. Did your work go well? It was like seeing a brick suddenly turn into a brownie. He certainly seemed overly favorable to me the unexpected contrast in tone was so big, it dazed me. Either way, as bewildering as it was, having Mayer in a good mood was far better than a poor one, and so I felt more comfortable when replying. Yes. I just happened to have something to tell you about the oh, you already had a guest. The guest was a man with short golden hair and a larger build than Myers, clad in a white vestment that contrasted sharply against the compulsory black uniforms of the Dark Knights. Although I was meeting him for the first time, I already knew who he was, August Divinitas, the main healer of the Dark Knights. If Axion was said to be Myers' right-hand man, August was his left. The man was so big and muscular, he could be mistaken for a paladin or a battle priest. Surprisingly enough, he was a priest who focused solely on casting holy spells. A famous saying of his was strong muscles, stronger heels. It sounded ridiculous, but no one dared to refute him with such muscles on display. What could anyone do but gulp nervously at the sight of those white vestments bulging with brawn? And the most surprising thing? Despite what his appearance suggested, he was an outstanding theologian. The man was living proof of why one mustn't judge others by how they looked. In any case, what I had to say to Mayer wasn't something I could share in front of August, someone I was meeting for the first time. I positioned myself as if I was about to leave the room, saying, I can come again later if you were in the middle of talking. But Mayer leaned forward and replied, how could anything come before you? It just so happened that we finished talking through the important things. Right, so what brings you to me? I glanced sideways at August, feeling troubled. Thankfully, it seemed that Mayer had enough sense in him to catch my drift. He curled his lips and continued to speak, leaning back on his chair. Now that I think about it, it seems introductions are in order. This here is August Divinitas, the best priest of our expedition corps. Reverend August, this is June Carantia, the woman who will become the vice-captain of our corps. Chapter, 31 Sister, I am August Divinitas. August bowed his head in greeting, expression flat. Then, do enjoy your talk. If you will excuse me. He strode out of the office before I could even reply. Perhaps he didn't like me considering my current reputation among the Dark Knights, that seemed to be the case. Getting on a priest's bad side was a bit worrisome, though as I gazed at the door August had just exited through, I swallowed back a groan. As if he had read my mind, Mayer said, Reverend August is always like that. Do not worry too much, his attitude does not imply he disapproves of you. I wasn't worrying, I was how did you know? For a moment, I considered playing dumb but decided not to. I didn't want to seem pathetic by trying to give a poor excuse. It shows on your face, Mayer answered with a smile. But I had my head turned around me face wasn't visible to you, I said. Then allow me to put it like the back of your head showing it as well. He was completely messing with me. Oh, come now. Do not pout like that. Mayer smiled. So, what has brought you to me? My lips were acting out of my control, it seemed. I cleared my throat with a cough. While this was far better than having Mayer be in a bad mood, it was necessary to stop fooling around. I fixed my posture into a disciplined, rigid stance and began, I have something to discuss regarding the reorganization of the Dark Knights. Reorganization he hummed. You did not seem very pleased about becoming the vice-captain, yet you're already performing your duties even before your official appointment. So he knew I didn't want the position. He knew it all along and pretended not to see anything. How nasty. I felt an urge to give him a piece of my mind spark inside me, but I quickly shut my mouth, afraid of being strung along with his pace. I forced a smile on my lips. If I have to do it anyway, I have to do it right. That part of you is very trustworthy. Then how do you intend on proceeding with this matter? Mayer stared at me with plain interest. Having those golden eyes fixed on me made me feel like a gazelle being chased by a leopard in the savanna grasslands. But I couldn't give in to the pressure. This was the time to stand strong and deliver my opinions. Steadying my heart, 
I held my head high and began explaining with confidence, I have been informed that when desertion occurs within the first corps, which is composed of elites who'll join the battle against the demon lord, the numbers will be replenished by members with potential from the second and third corps. Indeed. The first corps had been founded by the strongest Dark Knights members in their respective fields, such as Mayer, Axion, and August. Compared to them, the second corps members were skilled but not enough to be part of the first corps. As an aside, Vegan and Zinnia, the two I chatted with on the way back to base, were part of the second corps. Dungeons of the average level were mainly cleared by those aforementioned two corps. It was rare for only the first corps to clear a dungeon unless it was of high difficulty. I assumed that the idea behind this setting was to have the second corps experience various high-level dungeons as a form of training. And finally, the third corps was composed of members who had the skills but still hadn't adjusted to the Dark Knights. They weren't incapable incompetent people couldn't even join, to begin with. But the third corps size is the same as the first and second corps combined, I said. I believe it's too big. So you suggest I get rid of it? Yes, I nodded. Mayer hummed and rubbed his chin, thinking deeply. The third corps has its use. Members of both the second and third corps are mixed in groups to clear low difficulty dungeons that the first corps does not need to mind. As the saying went, many a little makes a mickle. I could understand his line of thought as during performance report meetings, expedition corps were judged by the number of dungeons cleared and their difficulty level, which was why even low difficulty dungeons couldn't be given up on. It was necessary to get a good grade on the performance report to gain the chance to battle the demon lord. Regarding that, he had lost to Fabian Kor by a hair during the first playthrough. Each and every dungeon must count to Mayor this time. Fabian Kor had managed to top the Dark Knights because they had focused on quality rather than quantity, and that was possible because of the information I had provided them. I cautiously started, you may be offended by this, Captain, but. Chapter 32. I am not offended in the least, so speak at ease. During my time with Fabian's Expedition Corps, we focused on clearing high-level dungeons and it turned out to be effective. I believe that is what the Dark Knights should be doing now. That was a curious thing. Back then, it was as if Fabian's Corps already knew when and where the gates to high-level dungeons would open. I fell silent. At the time, the members of Fabian's Corps had all thought God had chosen them when their good opportunities had originated from the information I secretly gave to Fabian. But now things are different. Both Fabian and I remember the first playthrough, do we not? Mayer pointed out. In other words, we both know where the big dungeons will open. It will be a game of dungeons, a contest of who does the closing first, yes. Therefore, the side with more numbers will hold the advantage. But things won't go exactly the same way as they did the first time. Games designed for multiple playthroughs wouldn't proceed identically when playing for the second time. Naturally, the second playthrough would become easier, but that wasn't synonymous with lower difficulty. In the case of the Sacred War, additional dungeons with increased difficulty would appear, and this was something Fabian didn't know. You seem to know something. Mayer stared at me for a long while as if craving the answer to it all but I couldn't tell him. I pried open my dry lips to give the best reply I could. Since I've joined, it's only natural for me to aim for our victory in the performance report meeting. I want you, Captain, to please focus on improving your skills for the future after that for the battle against the Demon Lord. Thankfully, Mayor didn't dig too deeply. He backed off from the subject without a fuss and turned back to my original topic. Very well. Then by what standard do you intend to manage the Third Corps? I also acknowledge the necessity of the Third Corps since there's no harm in closing many dungeons. But right now, we have way too many unnecessary personnel assigned. There are no financial problems in keeping them. It's not a problem of finances, I began carefully. It's a problem of will. There's been too little movement between the First, Second, and Third Corps as of recent. It's stagnation. Maybe that's why, but I could see several members who've fallen complacent. Members who plant themselves in the third core with no thoughts of moving up to the second. Hm Mayer seemed to know what I was talking about as well. Still, he said, even so, they are useful for closing low-level dungeons. 
Did you not say it yourself too? That there is no harm in closing many dungeons. Those members are like rotten tangerines, Captain. Rotten tangerines? Leave them be, and the rot will spread. This was why it was important to establish the right atmosphere. There was a large difference in work efficiency between everyone being motivated and everyone being lazy, taking things for granted. It might have not mattered until I joined, but since I did. Not anymore. I intended on pushing the members on a hard schedule that didn't end at closing dungeons but also involved personal improvement, and this was sure to draw out ready complaints. I had to get rid of the potential issue beforehand. By sifting out the unwilling, the Dark Knights will become much stronger from within, which will lead to faster closing of dungeons. My conclusion is that even among our men, it's necessary to sort out the wheat from the chaff. It will be a significant undertaking to distinguish every single one of them it will take quite a while, no doubt, he murmured, pensive. Fortunately, I happen to be talented in that regard. I smiled brightly. Thanks to the party member window, I was capable of checking combat-related parameters of party members in detail as well as their will to fight. I had zero intention of buttering up rotten tangerines to inject some motivation into them that would simply be a waste of time. I preferred to focus on giving experience to those full of drive and talent instead. As for those who did have the right spirit but disapproved of me, I didn't mind. From their perspective, they were hard workers whereas I was just somebody who got in through connections. But wouldn't it be utterly contemptible for one to complain despite not having even put in the effort? Whiners like that wouldn't give a darn how hard I worked, or how much I contributed to the core. In short, these sorts of people were my number one priority target of removal, but I had no thoughts of getting rid of them immediately there had to be an order to things. Of course, I added, there will be protests if I proceed with the reformation right after becoming vice-captain. Besides, I also need time to understand the ins and outs of the Dark Knights so first, please give me a special unit to work with. Mayor immediately asked, a special unit? Do you wish for members that are tried and tested? He seemed ready to put every elite in the special unit if I so much as nodded, but since that wasn't what I wanted, I refused with a shake of my head. No. In fact, I want the opposite. I bet that even if I do my best helping those kinds of geniuses grow, I'll just be seen as piggybacking. Then? He prompted. I am certain there are members within the Corps who are devalued and lack recognition. I'll take my pick from among them and raise them well. I have to prove my worth to have some grounds in making the changes I'm proposing later. Of course, if people still rejected me and spread false rumors after everything I did, there'd be no choice but to resort to a more forceful method. Chapter, 33 I had indeed joined the Dark Knights through the back door, but being this man's lover. No matter how many times I thought about it, it didn't sound any less comical. With a chortle, I wondered whether Mayer also knew of those rumors. Then again, so what if he knew? Perhaps he was simply ignoring them as he wasn't the kind to care about reputation. Besides, it wasn't something Mayer couldn't solve. The rumors wouldn't die just because he refuted them instead, they might spread further. In the end, earning the troops' acknowledgement was the most efficient way. Mayer, who had been silently contemplating my decision, rubbed his strong jaws as he muttered, raise them well, eh I am curious how you will do so. There are no shortcuts to growing stronger. There's only one way although they will get a bit of a boost through my magic, I said. You will have them go through a trial by fire? Yes. Very to my liking. Mayer smiled, seeming just as satisfied as when I accepted his offer to join the Corps. I had planned on making some changes regardless, but now that you have joined us this is a good opportunity to turn things around, he announced, rhythmically tapping on the armrest of his chair. Only after he finished his internal calculations did he continue speaking. Very well. I shall permit the creation of a special unit. You shall have full rights over it, including member composition, so take whomever you like. And with that, I had Meyer's permission. Although I did think he would give it, the possibility of refusal still made me anxious. But I could finally smile brightly. Thank you. I am not jesting if needed, you may even pick me. I awkwardly laughed off his remark. Taking Mayer in as part of my unit would only bolster the rumors, not quell them. 
one more thing he suddenly said very seriously. I will send you a unit member. Make sure to keep them by your side at all times. Was it a watcher? As I had no thoughts of doing anything that I'd need to hide, I nodded. Yes, sir. I will also pass over the dungeon selection rights to you. Simply report the results to me afterward. This much privilege is necessary for a vice captain. Ah, and you shall be given power over the lives of your men, he added. Power over their lives. I echoed, startled by his unexpected words. Because you never know what will happen inside a dungeon, Mayer said, staring at me with golden eyes that shone like a desert bathed in sunlight. Talk to Vince to get any equipment you may require. This is all I have thought of is there anything else you need? No. I believe this is enough to build a unit. Very well. Bear in mind that as long as I can slay the demon lord, I will spare you no support. Leave it to me. I bowed formally at his show of resolve. With Mayer giving me such tremendous support, I had to live up to his expectations. For the first time since joining the Dark Knights, I could see which way I had to go, which road to pave forming a special unit was a project that I had to make succeed. It did not take long for rumors of me building a special unit to go around. I never meant to hide it, but people were getting wind of it faster than I had thought. Most members of the Dark Knights reacted similarly. A special unit? Did you just say that a support mage will be leading a team? What do you think the standard of selection will be? Oh, I hope I don't get chosen. What do I do if I'm picked? From what I heard, that woman only has one experience of clearing a dungeon. Won't I die if something goes wrong? Such commentary was within my expectations but not everything went as I predicted. I entered the mess hall, only to find it completely empty. It wasn't time for meals yet, but even so, normally there would be one or two people walking around. Perhaps all the dark nights were busy hiding, afraid of catching my attention and getting chosen, which spelled trouble for me. I would miss the chance to inspect prospective members of my team. I had planned to select them personally, but I supposed it was nice not having to listen to all the backbiting. Then again, with how they've been saying things practically to my face, I couldn't call it backbiting. Thanks to the experience of the first playthrough, as well as being a support mage, I was used to people talking behind my back. Even so, it was quite irritating to be the target of a pestilent rumor. Although this situation of hide and seek was unexpected, it wasn't a big problem. I was troubled, yes, but it was a mere hindrance that didn't render me helpless. I was left with no choice but to pick them by their profiles. I looked between the list of members I received from Mayor and the party member status window, ruminating with delight on who to pick. Weighing which talented member to choose, like filling up a shopping cart, made me feel like I'd returned to being a gamer again after so long. Chapter, 34 As I sat by myself in the sunny mess hall like I had bought out the place, a shadow suddenly appeared over my table. Why are you sitting there and smirking to yourself, June? Are you all right? Oh, Axiom. I didn't notice, I am working. I hurriedly wiped the mirth off my lips as Axiom stared at me oddly. Do you always make that strange face when you're working? He asked. Ha ha. Well it's a rewarding task. I laughed it off awkwardly, and Axiom sat across me with worry on his face. You really are a piece of work he commented. To think you have the leisure to laugh, even with the burden of forming a special unit. Just because I'm burdened doesn't mean I have no reason to laugh. The authority to form a team however I liked was immense. It was a happy trouble of making the selection and deciding who to raise first, so there was no reason to grow serious. Clearly, though, I was alone in my excitement as Axion sighed deeply. Even with the profiles, you'll need to see them in person to understand their talent and potential, but everyone's busy avoiding you. I have a way around that even if they continue hiding, so it's fine. The numbers of the status window didn't lie, and while they were busy avoiding me now, once I proved the insight I had, every single one of them would be scrambling to earn my favor. Imagining the future, it was all too easy to laugh off this degree of hardship. Besides, they can hate it all they want but they have no right to refuse my choices, I added with a chuckle. The unit will ultimately be made the way I want so don't worry about it. That's not what I'm worried about. 
then what is it? I worry about what'll happen after the unit is formed, he said, and then paused, seemingly reluctant to continue speaking, but he couldn't maintain his silence. After a long period of hesitation, he continued, seeing how averse they are to you already, there's no knowing how obedient they'll be inside a dungeon. Uncertainty leads to anxiety. It's not that I don't trust in your capabilities, but anything could happen inside a dungeon. You need to have at least half of the unit on your side. You fear a mutiny. Axion nodded heavily. The world of dungeons abided by the law of the jungle. I was a useful but not powerful mage when it came to clearing dungeons. Therefore, it was natural to think that I'd have no way of getting out by my own power if the worst situation happened. Truthfully, as far as this matter is concerned, I think His Excellency made a hasty decision. Should things not go as planned, I volunteer to accompany you several times. As concern colored Axion's face, I realized I was truly in a pickle if the situation was bad enough for him to worry about the Duke's decision. Then again, I had to admit, genius ability and experience were two different things. All Axion knew was that I only had one experience in clearing a dungeon, and I was just tagging along during that, too. I was sure he felt dubious and worried as personally leading an expedition was a whole different matter. Thanks for looking out for me, Axion. I smiled. In reality, I didn't lack such experience perhaps I had even more dungeons under my belt than Axion. As for any mutinous members in my unit my plan accounted for that as well. Since the captain said he'll send a member on his behalf, I'm sure nothing major will happen. And if something does happen I have a trick up my sleeve. As a support mage, I had no offense, defense, or healing magic. However, I had something else. If someone didn't have any teeth, they wouldn't starve they just had to chow down with their gums or whatever. In the branch of support magic, there was a spell called Divine Devotion that transferred all damage suffered to a specific party member. Its purpose was to aid in the survival of important members with relatively weak health. It was the very skill I had used on Fabian back then, sacrificing my arm in exchange for his. About it being a sacrificial skill, well that was a matter of perspective. In case of mutiny, the spell could also transfer any damage I suffered to another core member. Of course, I would keep this tidbit secret everyone would feel disgust and aversion if they found out the mage they entrusted their back to had that sort of spell. Axion's eyes widened and he urged me to solve his curiosity. What is this trick you speak of? It wouldn't be a trick if I told you. You're going to keep it a secret even to me. Now that's sad, he lamented. I'm sure you have one or two secrets as well, Axion. Axion groaned and clicked his tongue I had hit the bullseye. Well, then seeing how confident you are, I'll worry a little less. Also, you said His Excellency would send someone with you did he mention who he'll choose? He said he would tell me only when it was decided for certain. To be honest, I thought it'd be you, I confessed. I assumed that was why you came to talk. Goodness, you make it sound like I'd never come to talk to you unless I had some business, he said sullenly. That's not what I meant, but maybe you have a guilty conscience. Ha! Huh. It was only after an exchange of jokes that Axion's expression eased and he seemed less worried. Yes, well I'm sure His Excellency has his own thoughts. He'll definitely send you someone capable, he muttered. I believe so too. I nodded in agreement. I didn't care whether that somebody was a watcher or not. I only hoped they would be useful. Chapter, 35 Well, then I look forward to working with you. You you're the one the captain promised to send? Indeed, sister. The priest replied, expressionless. I stared at him blankly. How could that man give away the main healer of the corps just like that? Was that even allowed? The main healer was irreplaceable, especially when considering Meyer's immense health other priests healing wouldn't even be enough to heal a scratch of his. How could he be so willing to hand over such a priest to a special unit that would last for only God knew how long? Putting aside his role as a watcher, the priest must be here to keep me from dying inside a dungeon no matter how. Even August wasn't free from the limitations of a human as resurrection magic was impossible for him to cast. Regardless, he was a high-ranking priest capable of bringing a man back from the brink of death. Although there was a precedent for a high-level priest being chosen by God to learn resurrection magic, 
there was no such individual in the present era at least. Level 99, the prerequisite to learning an ultimate skill, was by no means easy to reach. It wasn't the domain of humans. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that achieving this feat was equivalent to taking a step closer to the realm of God, as all ultimate skills were on the scale of a natural disaster or a miracle. In Fabian's case, he would learn a spell of tremendous power upon hitting level 99, one that could rip apart heaven and earth. But strictly speaking, it was nothing but a possibility. The person with the highest level I had ever met was Mayor Noxie was level 80 and even he needed far more experience than he had available at the time to reach level 99. Simply put, it was impossible to reach that goal. The odd thing, however, was that my ultimate had been available to me from the moment I had opened my eyes to this world. Was it because I was an irregularity, a transmigrator? Then again, what of it? I would never use that skill, not with the risk it entailed. My ultimate skill scale of souls was a resurrection spell that could bring back the dead by sacrificing oneself. While it was a truly amazing merit to be capable of using resurrection magic that even priests couldn't use, despite not being a priest myself, considering that the spell would cost my life there was no way I'd ever use it. Speaking of which there was a time when I was willing to use scale of souls for Fabian because I thought everything would be over if he died in retrospect, it was a stupid and moronic thought to entertain. In any case, having August in my unit was quite good as I didn't want to die like any normal person. At least with a priest like him with us, no one would have their arms neglected to the point of needing amputation because the priest didn't have enough holy power. Whatever his purpose, be it for surveillance or something else, I decided to gratefully accept this staffing and offered a handshake of goodwill to August. Then I look forward to working with you. The priest didn't accept my hand, instead simply giving me a curt nod and making the sign of the cross. I was no good with this guy I could only awkwardly take back my hand at his brusque response. As a near introvert, I found it hard to get along with people like August. I wasn't brazen enough to keep talking to a silent person, nor was I accustomed to silence enough to clam up in tandem. Nevertheless, I had no choice but to get used to it. Ever since he joined my unit, August followed me around constantly, like a bodyguard. Perhaps things might have been different if he weren't so large, but with the way he constantly radiated his presence behind me like a halo, it wasn't easy to ignore him. Alas, it wasn't long after his arrival that rumors spread of August joining the special unit, which was an expected result considering how he stuck close to me. The hilarious thing, though, was that the negative reputation of the special unit reversed. Apparently, while I wasn't trustworthy, August's entrance into my unit made for a completely different story. I would be the first to admit that it was incomparably safer to have him around and understood their rapid change in attitude after all, we all only had one life to live. And so, the core members who had been avoiding me all this time began to show themselves, one after another. Thanks to this, I could personally inspect my potential new members instead of looking through them on paper only. Chapter, 36 I looked around the third core and was greatly satisfied that I could check every detail about them that I had failed to find through the member profiles and party windows. One member was using a sword when he had more talent with a bow, while a mage would benefit more from using his mana in a more versatile way, and didn't that archer look pretty useful too? More people were unable to properly exhibit their abilities than I thought, which made me consider my task a worthy challenge. While I scanned every one of them for fear of missing someone talented, August was watching me. He had been quietly following me all this time, but then he suddenly broke his silence. After taking a look, what do you think? The tangerines are all fresh and pretty. Pardon? August creased his forehead slightly, confused, but I was too busy to mind as the list of my unit members was about to grow bigger. I decided to first check on the ones I had kept an eye on for a long time but I came by some unexpected news in the midst of searching for them. Died? I blinked. In this short time? Yes. I received a report of his death in a recent dungeon raid, Mary explained. My face turned stiff. The core member who had died was seventeen years old, which was young even among the Dark Knights. The boy was a bowman but he had an excellent talent for the sword, and I thought he would be easy to raise as I liked, given his young age. 
This was why I intended to make him the main physical attacker of the special unit, but. A dark sense of ill boding crept inside my head, pushing out the disappointment of my plan going amiss. I had a bad feeling. Although my senses were dull when it came to myself, my hunches were never too off in cases like this. Something was definitely going on. Feeling an inexplicable anxiety rise up, I asked Mary, that report could I have a look at it too? Of course, she nodded and left the room. It didn't take long for her to return with the report and I urgently flipped through its pages. August seemed to think I was overreacting. Death in a dungeon is common, he said. I know. And I also know that the death rate of the Dark Knights is significantly lower compared to the other core. I didn't take my eyes off the report as I responded. As I read further down the closely written papers, my brows furrowed deeper. After going through it all, I closed the report and asked, Mary. Could you let me know if you notice something different, or something else of note in this team? Of course. Mary left with a nod, leaving me and August in the office. The priest, who was thinking over my strange attitude, asked, You seem to think that something is going on, sister. I rubbed the sides of my mouth without replying. Voicing my thoughts would lead to a hasty conclusion, and there was still too much uncertainty for that. However it was so suspicious. Perhaps he found my silence frustrating because August picked up the report I had been reading and took a quick look at it, only to raise a brow. They have a normal team composition and a normal rate of mortality he muttered. The other teams suffer about the same number of losses. In fact, when compared to others this team has fewer deaths. That's the strange thing. I sighed as I explained. The number of deaths isn't the important thing. How they died is what matters. What do you wait? Seeming to have realized something, August began looking through the report again, a deep furrow wrinkling his forehead. Now I know what you were concerned about, sister. I still have a way to go. The mortality rate of this team was average perhaps below average which was questionable. A core member dying in a dungeon usually occurred when there was a big problem during the raid, and whenever that happened it would result in a series of casualties but this team was different. Although they rarely suffered big losses all at once, their members would almost always die one at a time. Furthermore, the deceased were mostly those who had joined the team last. I would say this went unnoticed because the casualties they suffered were similar to the other teams this situation is indeed strange. His Excellency must be informed. But that wasn't the only strange thing there was a difference in the information between my party window and the report. The team leader of the Blue Flames, Spearman Whipra. Nevertheless, even if I were to press down hard, the culprit would play innocent and insist I was finding fault for no reason. Informing Mayer about the situation would be pointless without any evidence. These sorts of wrongdoers would only grow even more cunning if given the chance to escape. They had to be dealt with in one fell swoop, and for that to happen, evidence was necessary. I gazed out the window with my chin cupped and murmured, for now, let's keep watching for a little longer. Chapter, 37 The Dark Knights were divided into three corps, and those were further divided into teams composed of a mix of members from all the corps. The practical components of a team formed for swift dispatch to dungeons were, team leader, shield keeper, priest, and mage. Upon receiving a report of a dungeon appearing somewhere and its level, a suitable team would be immediately dispatched. When I first met Axion, he had mentioned undergoing a test by Mayer which would decide if he was qualified to lead a team into a high-level dungeon. All of this was possible because of the large number of capable men in the corps, and it was also why the Dark Knights could close so many more dungeons than any other corps. The aim of the team I had my eye on was to clear low to mid-level dungeons. In other words, its team members were around the level range I intended on recruiting into my special unit. Why did things have to be so hard, dang it? The vacant position of the core member I had dibs on was filled in by another member who I, yet again, had dibs on Sevi Ventus, a fourteen-year-old boy who was perhaps the youngest of the Dark Knights. Like his predecessor, Sevi was an archer, and I was paying particularly close to him because he had the potential to become a mage. His talent had yet to bloom, but once it did, he would be a huge catch. And that was because his element was wind. If he were assigned to assist Axion, the main firepower of the core, 
the latter's power would be amplified several times over. I was certain the flame mage would love to have the boy realize his potential. After all, who didn't like to perform even better? The utility of wind magic itself was quite good, and the fact that Sevi was able to join at such a young age spoke for his competence. The combination of bow and wind was so good that nothing needed to be said about it. In short, raising him well alone would be a tremendous help to the Dark Knights. However, I had never heard of Sevi Ventus before that probably meant the boy had died before his talent manifested itself. Had Sevi emerged as a wind mage, he would have been treated quite well in the Dark Knights and wouldn't have died so easily either. The mortality rate of mages was, in fact, the lowest after priests. Considering how Sevi was on the brink of awakening as a mage his death must certainly be connected to the blue flames as well. I had to act quickly, but it was difficult to just up and take him away as my initiation ceremony and vice-captain appointment would only happen a week later. As I was currently an outsider, it would be overstepping my bounds to issue orders. I briefly considered waiting until the next week, but it would be terrible if Sevi went out to a dungeon and died while I waited. Concluding that I had to make haste, I looked for Mayer and asked him if he knew about Sevi. Who? Sevi Ventus? Yes. Is there any reason for this interest in him? I frowned at his reply, but then again, he didn't know Sevi's potential as a mage. Sevi has the talent of a wind mage, I said. What? As I had expected, he was startled by the news. You can even tell such things with your ability? He asked. I quietly stared at him. Oddly enough, he seemed more surprised by my ability than Sevi's. He gazed at me with tender eyes full of admiration as he said, It seems I was the one underestimating your worth. You are amazing more so than I thought. His golden gaze grew even more intense, his eyes lit with the desire to possess and monopolize. I sighed at the restless look on his face. It wasn't like I had anywhere else to go. My intention was to bring the blue flames to attention after gaining some more certain evidence, but at this rate, I felt I had no choice but to make a report. I relayed every detail of my suspicions to Mayer. I suspect that the blue flames are intentionally sacrificing their team members. The thing is, there's no way to openly stop them due to the lack of evidence. Ichem. At his lack of response, I continued, in Sevi's case, I can simply bear some insults and take him into the special unit in advance, but if this team isn't stopped, other talented members may be lost. We have to take them down at this opportunity. The Blue Flames team leader Whipperet does not have a bad reputation. Mayor frowned. He could be said to be a founding member of the Dark Knights. What reason is there for a man like him to victimize his men? What other reason could there be other than an all-too-common story with an equally common cause? There could be lots of reasons, I replied with a shrug. Like, say, he wants to monopolize the dungeon clear rewards, or perhaps he hates seeing recruits with better talent climbing the ranks. Although my tone was light, the situation was serious. Chapter, 38 Mayer rubbed his strong jaws, pensive. Death in a dungeon due to a lack of ability is one thing, but a competent member dying from a stab to the back is a problem, he muttered solemnly. So then, how do you wish for this matter to be solved? I was taken aback by his cold reaction, even though the life of a fourteen-year-old was at stake. I barely swallowed back my bewilderment and replied, since team leader Whipperat is a founding member, other members will protest if he's questioned. We need proof of his wrongdoing. I plan on catching him off guard and red-handed to procure irrefutable evidence. That will not be easy. His words made me laugh a little. I'm a support mage, and my reputation is bad, I said. Who would have known that my devaluation would end up helping me? Living and learning, wasn't that the saying? They'll ignore me for sure no one thinks I'm capable. If I join their team alone with the pretext of gaining dungeon experience before becoming vice-captain, they won't be too wary. Would that not be putting you in danger? He pointed out. Well they might try killing me instead of Savino, they'll try that for certain. What? Meyer's face twisted into a frown and he immediately protested. If you will be in danger, then I reject your idea. Better to send someone else or give up on Sevi at once. Dungeons are always dangerous. Besides, 
I won't join without a plan. I value my life the most. What do you have in mind? I can use transformation magic, I explained. Support mages could use all kinds of magic aside from elemental, offensive, defensive, and healing types. At first glance, it looked like they had no spells at their disposal, but all null elemental magic fell under the branch of support. Long story short, support mages were good at miscellaneous things that were utterly useless in dungeon raids. Of course, the spell is nothing more than a trick for the eyes, I added. But if I use it to transform someone on my side into one of Blue Flame's team members, I'll be prepared for that dangerous moment. Transformation magic sounded amazing and all, but what use could it have in clearing dungeons? What use, when the world would end if those dungeons weren't closed? And even worse was that to use the transforming spell, unlike other support magic, one first had to obtain the consent of the spell target. It was unusable if the target refused, so its usage was very obscure. Still, it was fortunate that it could be useful in this matter. Mayer gazed at me, impressed. Every single time, I am surprised by your abilities. I think you're about the only one who says that, Captain, I replied shyly. It was embarrassing to see him react like that to something so trivial. Even so, his gaze was as serious as ever. Fabian truly is a foolish man, he remarked. I think so too. Well, then I'll take this as the plan being decided. Very well. However, I cannot rest easy letting you go alone. I shall accompany you. It was my turn to protest. What? You will. Closing high-level dungeons already kept him busy enough so I didn't even know what he was talking about. Disregarding my shock, Mayer stared at me stoically as he said, Did you not mention transformation magic? If I use that as well, it will not matter if I follow you. But, Captain aren't you busy? Your life is at stake here. While I did send you August, he is, in the end, a priest. There is a limit to what he can do to humans. And so it seems best that I go in this case. I couldn't tell who was cleaning up after who at this point. Unable to win against Meyer's firm stance, I had no choice but to let him do as he liked and nod in acquiescence. The small reassurance in all this was that I wouldn't be in any danger with Mayer as my bodyguard. A base and a province were similar but different. The provincial right was power over territory and its people, whereas a base came with the right to dealing with dungeons. The dungeons that opened nearby a base all belonged to the expedition corps of that base. In case a dungeon appeared that the owning corps couldn't solve, they would receive help from other corps. However, the one with the final say would always be the native core. The number of dungeons was fixed, while the number of expedition corps varied. Any corps would eagerly pay a commission to the local corps to close a dungeon. Some of them didn't strive to deal with dungeons themselves, instead opting to secure a profit by selling the clearing rights, hence why all expedition corps tried to obtain a base. But none of this had anything to do with the Dark Knights. They had a large base in the province of Noctentoria. While other expedition corps might ask for their assistance in solving a high-level dungeon, no one would dare to ask for a commission fee in return as the Dark Knights always had a plethora of dungeons to deal with. And just as I had worried, a new dungeon was assigned to the Blue Flames before even a week had passed. I went to pay a visit to their team leader, Wipra. Chapter, 39 Wipra was a man in his late thirties with grizzled hair. He responded coldly to my sudden visit. I thought the special unit was only taking people, not barging into other teams like this. Barging in. I just want to gain experience, even a little, before becoming vice-captain. It is arrogance to expect gaining experience by entering dungeons a couple of times. As they say, a journey of a thousand miles starts from a single step. I deflected Whipper's hostility with a broad smile, and he clicked his tongue disapprovingly. He surveyed me as if to grasp my intentions, but by the look of his frown, he didn't seem to have much success. Why our team of all others? He asked. We are not capable enough to afford having a support mage like you. I've heard that you have a long career as the leader of the Blue Flames. Besides, the level of the dungeon we're going to isn't so high, is it? You're being exceedingly humble. Regardless of his sarcasm, 
I gave a jolly good laugh and flattered him in return. Whippera appeared to have realized his sneering was ineffective as he resorted to glaring instead. After a long moment of silence, during which I estimated how many times he was cursing inwardly, he spoke again. Will Reverend August also be with us? No, just me, I replied. Whippera shut his mouth again. I could almost hear the cogs in his head spinning. The man was visibly struggling but failing to suppress his animosity, which felt too excessive to dismiss it as annoyance derived from my intervention. The impression I had was more like he couldn't tolerate my very existence. With a sudden, spiteful sigh, Whippera said, not being able to afford having you in our team is not being humble but speaking the truth. You may not know since your first dungeon raid was with Axion, but we do not have that much firepower. You may end up dying as we lack the strength to spare escorting you while clearing the dungeon. Even so, are you fine with joining? He seemed to want confirmation on whether or not I was okay with being in danger, and this was only natural after all, he had to push the blame on me in case I died. How blatant I can handle taking care of myself, one way or another. I'll be fine. Even if I do end up dying it'd be out of my incompetence so it can't be helped, I answered, smiling even wider than before. Whippera's face brightened as if I had given just the answer he was waiting for. Could you give me an official confirmation on what you said just now? Sure. I could even sign a document right away. I also ask that you swear to regard me as the leader of this raid and that you'll follow my every order as a subordinate, he added. I swear. Very good. Let us meet tomorrow morning then, at the main gates. We shook hands then. Although our motives were different, as far as appearances went, we couldn't have looked any more harmonious. On the next morning, I donned the mask of an ignorant vice-captain who entered the corps through the back door and joined the Blue Flames. Its team members, clad in black armor as befitting of a dark night, welcomed me with hostile gazes. Whippera looked particularly confident as he dragged me along to make an introduction to the rest, perhaps because he was before his men. Now, now. We have two new faces joining the dungeon raid this time. I'm sure everyone here knows June Carantia. She's a support mage and our exalted vice-captain-to-be. The others were quick to respond to my introduction with sniggers and irritated sighs. Whippera's tone was practically dripping scorn his thoughts were almost written on his face, and I knew he wasn't going to give me the treatment a vice-captain was due. I want everyone to leave a hard-working impression on our rumored vice-captain he continued. And this here is Sevi Ventus, the archer who'll be standing in for Jaeger, who died in the previous dungeon. I look forward to working with you all. Holding a bow that was taller than himself, Sevi's bobbed hair fluttered as he gave a deep bow in greeting. The boy's expression was terribly cold, much too unfriendly for a rookie who had been newly assigned to a team. I stared at Savino, Mayor disguised as Sevi and mouthed at him, your expression. Manage your expression. Somehow, it was deeply disturbing to call him Mayor with the way he looked. Sevi Mayor frowned, but complied with a sigh, he put on an awkward smile and I couldn't help but wonder why he was acting so poorly. Normally, he could smile so well then again, the man had probably never dreamed he'd one day transform into a brat half his age. There had been no need to even ponder on who Mayer would transform into. We had no clue who the accomplices involved were, and if the transformation target was too well known, we'd risk being exposed. Choosing Sevi, on the other hand, posed the least risk as he was a recent recruit. Looking at Meyer's skills now, I patted myself in the back for such a good decision. He most certainly wasn't cut out for infiltration. Chapter, 40 Then, suddenly, Whippera put his hand on my shoulder in a show of intimacy as he asked, What's the matter, Reserve Vice Captain? Is there a problem? Fearing that Meyer's identity would be discovered by chance, I swerved my head away from him, but I didn't miss his face twisting into a frown. I furtively removed Whippera's hand from my shoulder with an uncomfortable laugh and replied, No, nothing that you'd call a problem. You're not unhappy that I've dropped courtesy, are you? See, this is how I always talk to my subordinates, Whippera said with a purposeful, sly glint in his eyes. He was clearly implying that if I didn't like it, I could leave whenever, but I couldn't do that. I put on a foolishly bright smile and answered, I don't mind it at all, just do as it suits you. 
I understand that a somewhat vertical relationship is necessary to survive a dungeon safely. I like that our reserve vice captain is quick on the uptake. Whippera snickered and exchanged looks with several of his team members. The man was acting just as suspicious as a certain captain I knew did he think there was no way he'd be found out. Or was it that he didn't care either way? Either way, while I pondered about it, we arrived at the gate of the dungeon and began to make careful progress. The blue flames worked quite well together, perhaps due to their long companionship. Spearman Whippera in particular possessed a powerful attack. While the team leader was penetrating the heart of the enemy, Mayer fired his bow to keep the other nearby monsters in check. We got a better shooter this time. You're right. The last one wasn't that good. Mayer did tell me he was proficient with the bow, but I didn't expect him to be so good with it. And so the captain fit into the team without drawing much suspicion. Me, on the other hand. How moronic. Whippera shouted. What were you thinking, doing that there? Do you have a death wish? I had loitered just within the margin of not being a complete hindrance as it would be terrible if they noticed something wrong and laid low. I needed to provoke Whippera a little more to draw out his true intentions, after all. Blast it. How is a shrew like that supposed to be the vice-captain? He spat. His excellency must have lost it. I did tell him to speak comfortably, but that didn't mean he could be so vulgar. Upon entering the dungeon, Whippera had turned into a complete tyrant. It was almost as if he had become a different person. Judging by the escalating degree of his cursing, I was sure this dog intended on burying me in this dungeon otherwise, there was no way he'd be so obvious about it. However, the man's blatant attitude put me at ease the mutt's incoming betrayal was as predictable as the day coming after the night. I silently shrugged off his insults and apparently, Whippera assumed I feared him because he cursed me even more enthusiastically with his cronies. My actual source of concern was, in fact, Mayer. The man-turned boy would clench his small hands with increasing intensity every time Whipper spat venomous words, and it was nerve-wracking to see his veins popping, as if ready to shoot his bow at any moment. Get a blasted move on already, you lazy dolt. Whipper shouted, kicking me in the back. His rough, armored boot sent me rolling to the ground. Staggering back to my feet with a groan, I couldn't contain my anger from showing on my face. He was stepping over the line. What's with the look, eh? Got a problem? Whipper glanced at me with disdain, his brow raised, and when I didn't reply, he passed by as if I were trash on the floor. Unfortunately, his actions were still at the level of pulling rank, therefore I needed more evidence. I could only meekly lower my eyes as I couldn't afford to explode here but wasn't there a saying of how plans existed to be changed? As Mayer suddenly took a step forward, I instinctively realized I had to stop him. You unholy son of a. Ma, Sevi, I hurriedly interrupted him. Thanks for helping me up. I clung to Meyer's arm, crying out in an artificial tone. To my sadness, even though he looked like little Sevi on the outside, his stats remained unchanged. In the end, I failed to hold him back and ended up flopping to the ground again. Chapter, 41 Ugh, why me again? Treating me like the neighborhood punching bag. Mayer stared at me in bewilderment after the unexpected incident. Whippera turned back a second later to check what state I was in, then sneered, Ha! How weak do you have to be to get tumbled over by that kid's helping hand? Fortunately, he didn't seem to notice Meyer's surge of anger. I laughed foolishly, relieved, and got to my feet. Then, turning my back toward Whippera, I glowered at Mayer and tried to tell him through my eyes that now was not the moment. Perhaps my desperate message made it across as he nodded dazedly. Much time had passed after barely defusing the mayor bomb that had almost blown up. As we moved forward amid the tense atmosphere, we arrived before the boss battle in no time at all. Only after reaching the front of the room with the boss monster did Whipper reveal his real self with a dangerous look in his eyes, he said, it's your time to shine, reserve vice captain. Not a second after he was done speaking, the other members of Blue Flames surrounded me to prevent my escape. You've been the least helpful so far while we were progressing through the dungeon, he continued. What I'm saying is, the time has finally come for your useless self to make a difference. You should do your part since you've been piggybacking this far. 
I surveyed every person surrounding me as I asked, what do you mean? They stared at me with ridicule in their eyes as if looking down at a cornered rabbit. Taking a step forward, Whippera cried out, you'll know once you're in there. Blade of Revenge A spell was cast on my body the very instant he uttered it. I quickly looked through the explanation of the magic used on me. When a designated party member takes damage, the user's attack power increases proportionally to damage percentage. The designated party member was me. It was clear he wanted to sacrifice me to boost his attack. Are you surprised that I'm a support mage? Whippera took out a dagger with a smirk. I steadied my breath and stared at him, replying, I'm more surprised that you're a piece of scum that sacrifices comrades. Honestly, both points weren't truly anything to be surprised about I had approached him with suspicion in the first place. Besides, I already knew that Whippera was a support mage. He may have hidden this fact from the dark nights, but the party window showed everything. I had been curious as to why he was hiding his class, but it turned out he was using it to stab comrades in the back like this. This explained why he couldn't make it public. It was comparatively easier to hide the fact of being a support mage. Gray hair was quite common, and even if one did awaken as a mage in the middle of life, there was the excuse of graying early. Whippera snorted, taking my calm as my last struggle. Ha! Huh. What feigned composure! Abusing a spell created for the sake of taking revenge for a party member. Saint Marianne would be stunned to know. Oh please, call it application, not abuse. Don't they say that magic is a study of application? Whippera's smirking face was utterly repulsive, lighting the urge in me to smash it in, but I couldn't do that because I had to get more information out of him. There was no concrete evidence as Whippera had only cast the spell on May needed more explicit proof from his mouth, or for him to stab me so that I could convict him for the crime of homicide. Truthfully, I was seriously inclined to letting him stab me, although I kept that as a secret since Mayer would be shocked to know I put on a mask of being afraid and asked in a trembling voice, are you going to kill me? So you finally figured out the situation now? Am I going to kill you? Offering, sacrifice Whippera nodded. Yes. Think of it as sacrificing yourself since thanks to you, I'll be able to kill that boss easily. Aren't you capable of defeating that boss with the team even without killing me? Why are you taking the risk of killing your comrades? With the team? Whippera snorted. Won't the experience be shared that way? Chapter, 42 Finally, I understood the gist of things. Experience gained from a dungeon boss monster was distributed according to contribution. Whippera still lacked attack power and level to single-handed defeat a boss monster, but it was another story if his attack power was doubled. You would kill your team member just to gain experience all to yourself, to grow stronger alone. Humph, such narrow thinking, he replied. Take a long-term view, wouldn't peace come to the world if I used all you useless cretins to grow stronger and eventually defeat the demon lord? A sacrifice for the greater good is inevitable. What bull droppings? How many promising sprouts must Whippera have trampled on? I was struck by an appalling illusion of a mountain of dead geniuses. Piled one after another by a mediocre man in his desire to become a genius and knowing that his life would end as a mediocre man without even gaining any proper renown, even after all his filthy deeds, made it all the worse. Why were the other team members cooperating with him? Blackmail? Or was it? I looked around at the others in a daze, but instead of avoiding my eyes, they faced me without the slightest hint of shame, their faces colored by greed. Their share of the reward that was what they would get. Whippera got to have experience, while the team members got to have money. This had to be their strange form of mutual dependence. As my mind worked furiously to understand the situation, Whippera grabbed my chin and forced me to look up. He held a knife to my throat as he whispered, I don't hate you in fact, I pity you. As a fellow support mage, I know what garbage our abilities are. The keen edge of the knife was chilling. He didn't seem intent on killing me right away, however he soon withdrew the knife. When I was despairing at the difference in talent between me and those of the first corps, I awakened to magic by chance. I was happy at the thought of becoming a magic spearman but not for long because I realized my element belonged to that of a blasted supporter. The anguish I felt then. 
What, was he owed good magic or something? He couldn't even be grateful for what he had. I had more than one thing to say, but I quietly held back. I had to let him go berserk and expose him completely. Yes but I soon realized that it was all part of God's will that's right. Saint Marianne granted me this magic because she wanted me to become a more powerful spearman. He prattled on and so far, it seemed conceivable. Anyone would self-rationalize this much. The problem, however, was that it didn't end here. The mediocre wouldn't know the will of God he muttered. I'm only doing as I'm meant to by gaining more power, regardless of the means and methods because I am a chosen one. Seeing him go beyond self-rationalization and into the zone of utter insanity, talking of God and being chosen, I felt it was time to deal with this lowlife and shut him up but Whipper continued to blather, lost in the heat of the moment. This ability of mine may be useless, but it can help me become a greater spearman. But you? You're nothing but a support mage. Look at how pathetic you are. What can you do with this thin arm of yours? Then, suddenly, Whipper twisted my arm. Ack! I screamed. My body was indeed worthless, but I didn't want to hear that from the scum that doped up on the lives of others. Swine like him were the reason behind the reputation of support mages falling into the mud. He was a snake in the grass and had to be eliminated on the spot. The worst thing that could happen was his dog dropping ideas spreading and drawing the like-minded into one place. Unaware of my thoughts, Whipper clicked his tongue with pity, continuing, I'm sure you must have been desperate as well, not sparing the means nor the methods. Isn't that how you became vice-captain with that body? I too was only being desperate. Don't use me for your sophistry, I snarled. Unlike you, I'm a talent personally scouted by the captain. I was done with being polite. I knew Whippera inside out by this point, so there was no need to listen to him any further. But just as I was about to give Mayer a signal to end this farce, Whippera suddenly stepped back despite seeming ready to stab me at any time. Still putting on a strong front he smirked. Well, that isn't a bad attitude. The dog that barks doesn't bite, isn't that the saying? No, I really was scouted I had spoken the truth yet Whippera didn't seem to believe me at all. Considering how we're fellow support mages all right. I'll give you a choice. And no sooner than he said this, another team member dragged over Mayer. Maya, Sevi. I called out cautiously. Why was he bringing over the tiger that was keeping quiet? I admit that I had been about to call for him, but were they doing me a favor, or looking for trouble? Now, you choose, Whippera said. Either you sacrifice the boy and become one of us, or you become the sacrifice. Chapter, 43 Now, you choose, Whippera said. Either you sacrifice the boy and become one of us, or you become the sacrifice. Choosing the former would likely allow him power over me, the vice-captain awaiting appointment, and consequently the dark knights through blackmail. The latter would result in both me and Sevi Mayer being killed. The man-turned boy was, as usual, staring at me with his deadpan face, but I could sense the dissatisfaction in his eyes that showed his desire to undo the transformation. I shook my head at him. The situation couldn't be any more uncertain. Mayer was indeed strong, but could he defeat all the others when he was completely weaponless? Of course it would take, what, ten seconds? Still, I felt it would be more helpful to lessen the risk a bit more. Why are you so confident that I'd join your side? I asked, trying to divert attention my way. If I reported your crimes. Who'd believe in you? Well, obviously. You're alone, while we're many. Besides, we've worked with diligence in the dark nights for so long. It's a piece of cake framing you for our wrongs, he said, and my silence prompted him to continue. Think carefully. It's not a bad choice you have a bad rep in the dark nights as it is. With the blue flames on your side, you'll have a standing of your own. Whippera persuaded me gently at first, but not getting the answer he wanted, he started screaming. How long do you think a garbage support mage can last as vice-captain? Support magic is more useful than you think, I replied. Useful? Does trash have use too? Because that's what support magic is. That's rich, coming from somebody who's fervently benefiting from it. I glowered at Whippera, 
twisting my lips into a sneer. Your method is wrong. Don't go around telling anyone what your class is. It's an embarrassment to us support mages. Oh, really? You want to die, is that it? Whippera's face warped with anger. It was clear that my mocking words hurt his pride. With clenched teeth and a forced smile, he gripped the dagger in his hand harder as he kicked my legs out from under me. Fine, then, he snarled, I'll do as you wish. Don't worry, you won't be lonely we'll bury that arrow shooting brat right beside you. It was as I had predicted, he had planned on killing Sevi too all along. The captain won't sit by and ignore this matter, I warned him. His excellency won't think much of anything as long as a dungeon gets closed, Whippera said. I'll report that you caused a panic during the raid and inflicted extreme damage on the team before dying by a monster's attack. He raised his dagger into the air and I shut my eyes in anticipation of the pain that would sear my neck but I felt nothing. Instead, Whipper released his grip on my shoulder. Kook. Hearing a groan, I tentatively lifted my head and saw Mayer clutching Whipper's arm like a kite that had caught prey. Next, I saw that the blue flames who had been holding Mayer were splayed across the ground, looking dumbfounded. Whippera looked equally at a loss at the sudden turn of events, struggling in vain to get Meyer's hand off him but failing to make the transformed captain even budge. Mayer gazed down at me, gnashing his teeth in fury as he savagely hissed, just why? I felt a chill, more intense than when Whippera's knife was at my throat as in the next instant, Meyer's figure turned hazy the transforming spell was wearing off. The young boy before my eyes was engulfed in light and, seconds later, he was replaced by a giant man cloaked in a menacing air like a denizen of the dark. Now returned to his original form, Meyer's shadow fell over me as if it were devouring my very being. I let you test my patience and you plan on giving the signal only after getting stabbed. Correct? He growled. His rage was frightening to the point of inducing hiccups, even more so because he was so close and so focused on me. While I did think that he wouldn't like my idea very much, this was beyond my expectations. I intended on reducing the risk somehow, I awkwardly laughed, giving out an excuse. You would cut your throat for that. Do not give me that nonsense. I had a plan I grumbled at Meyer's loud reprimand as I got to my feet. His glare at me was intense, almost searing my skin. Why your excellency? That brat just now was. Chapter 44. The members of the Blue Flames muttered in disbelief, staring foolishly at their captain. Their surprise was to be expected transformation spells were rarely used and few were capable of even casting it. Not all support mages could use the same spell unless they were a pro at their branch of magic like I was. At a loss about what they should do next, the Blue Flames' unease made their weapons shake in their grips. Eventually, they lowered their arms to the ground. Kark. Whippera dropped his dagger, unable to bear the pain of his arm being twisted, and the clang of metal against stone rang sharply throughout the air. In any case having figured out this much should be enough to convict them of their crimes. Mayer flung away Whippera's arm and, despite his hefty weight, the man was sent rolling away like a fluttering leaf. The arm brace was crushed, showing just how powerful Meyer's grip had been. The sight made me flinch. I'd been shaking hands with him all this time. Good lord. I repeatedly swore to myself to take care of how I acted around Mayer from now on. Whippera looked between me and Mayer with a deathly pale complexion, his expression a contrast of great despair and small hope as he began squeezing out words with difficulty. K.N. Now that it's come to this having grasped the situation, Whippera's eyes glinted ominously. He understood what was going on, yet he didn't make a wise choice here instead of begging for Meyer's mercy, he made the worst decision. Pointing at me, he cried out, S.C.'s that shrew. If I can gain power by killing that woman, I, I can defeat even Mayer. So he thought that killing me and doubling his power would make him a match for Mayer? What a joke. Since I knew Whippera's stats, the response of the Blue Flames only looked like suicide to me. Not even having proper knowledge of their own superior's capability was pathetically absurd. Mayer too seemed incredulous as he let out a low laugh. Despite giving the command himself, Whippera seemed anxious as his body shook noticeably. His unease infected his team members, rendering them hesitant to act first. 
Believing it was too late to ask for Meyer's forgiveness, he gritted his teeth and screamed even louder than before. And Mayor Knox is a human as well. He's not even armed properly right now. You just have to kill that so. At this rate, we'll all be screwed. The man's thoughts were obvious, like a cornered rat biting at a cat thinking that Mayor was off his guard, the rat thought he could defeat his captain. Clearly, the oversecretion of endorphins in the face of imminent death had paralyzed his mind. Whipper's desperate resistance made me sigh. To think of picking a fight with Mayer he must have thought there was still hope. Yes, that had to be it. Then shouldn't I let him taste a little more despair? I gestured for Mayer to pause and picked up the dagger Whipper had dropped. Twitching the point of the blade at its owner, I drawled, so you think you can defeat Mayer Knox by killing me? Anger and hate sparked in Whipper's eyes. You sly wench. Playing innocent despite bringing Mayer with you. I swear on my life that I will bring you down with me. No sooner had he finished vowing that, I made a long cut on my forearm with his dagger, a wide smile on my lips. June Carantia. Mayer bellowed furiously, his voice ringing through the dungeon. He strode over with astonished eyes to grab my injured arm. Contrary to his large and rough hand, his grip was as gentle as one would caress a withering flower. I'm fine, I reassured him, I'm telling you, I'm fine. Fine. Give me your AR weight. The injury mayor trailed off in the middle as he looked at my forearm with confusion the slashed cloth that covered my forearm showed perfectly intact skin. What in the world he murmured in bafflement. Suddenly, a groan of pain burst from Whipper's mouth. Gah! Yark! Blood dripped down his left arm from the exact spot where I had cut myself and he spluttered confusedly, W what the? W-I-M-I. Everyone, including Whippera, looked at me, stupefied. With a wide grin, I said, you're not the only one with that kind of ability. Having predicted what would happen, I had cast divine devotion earlier on when I sensed things were going wrong. The designated party member takes the damage suffered by a party member instead. This spell which was, in a sense, a warding charm was the secret card up my sleeve which I had prepared in the case of a mutiny. Although I ended up using it faster than I had expected, it had worked. The effects of support magic prioritized the first spell cast. In other words, Whipper would receive damage even if I was attacked, and because I didn't receive damage, Whipper's power wouldn't increase. Blast it, June Carantia you witch. Whipper cursed. Perhaps because he was also a support mage, he was the first one to understand what had happened. Had he realized that it was impossible to overcome his plight? Whipper howled wildly as he shot a burning glare at me, his eyes alarmingly bloodshot. I laughed out loud at his despair and bared a winning smile as I reminded him, application, not abuse, right? Your words exactly. Chapter, 45 As he watched the unexpected turn of events unfolding before him, Mayer frowned. Then, after coming to a late understanding of what had happened, his face crumpled even more. June Carantia. I am telling you now, if you ever get up to this sort of self-injuring again. He chastised. I don't have a hobby of harming myself, all right? Don't worry about it too much. I cut him off, exaggeratedly shaking my intact left arm. Of course, it wasn't like I didn't feel any pain from the cut. If I had gone through the same experience at the start of the first playthrough I would have bawled my head off. However, I did go through quite a bit since then so this much was nothing. Compared to losing an arm, it wasn't even worth batting an eye over. Besides, it was unlikely that Mayer was making such a fuss because he was truly worried about me. It'd be troublesome if the woman he went to great lengths to appoint as vice-captain died without even making any achievements, no? As Mayer scrutinized me with his golden eyes, I put on an innocent face and played dumb. I wonder if you do truly have such a hobby. It seems I must revise my assessment of you, he mused. Wait. Revise what? And I thought you were clever and rational turns out you are an utter fool. But didn't I make the most rational judgment possible? By cutting yourself needlessly? Honestly, I had no retort for that. I was driven by my desire for revenge on Whippera for twisting my original plans, while also resenting having my reputation bombed as a fellow support mage. 
In short, everything was the result of my painstaking contemplation of how to put Whipra into despair. With no explanation to give him, I could only let out an awkward, tentative laugh. Meanwhile, the other members of the Blue Flames snapped to their senses and dropped their weapons, the metal rattling noisily against the ground. Realizing that Whipra's secret move had turned out to be useless and that it was pointless resisting, they knelt on their heads, one after another. WEV done nothing wrong. We just did as our team leader ordered. The leader's command in a dungeon is absolute, isn't it? Your Excellency, please. They yelled in their defense. Trying to save your skins. You rats. Whippera shrieked in bitter resentment from the betrayal, but he too was left without a choice. His only option was to bow his head alongside his team members and beg for mercy. Mayer lifted a sword from among the weapons dropped by the blue flames. There was a chill in his eyes that was discrepant to their golden color, so intense that the demon realm probably felt warmer in comparison. A leader's order is to be obeyed without question he whispered. But a captain's command in a corps is law. He approached the kneeling men, his every step making them inch backward on their bottoms what? Am I to take it that you are all willing to accept the command to take the lives of others, but you refuse to accept the command to pay for your sins? He snorted at their lack of pride on top of their lack of morality. Well, choosing which orders to follow, is it? Could there be an excuse any more ridiculous than this? Please, sir, have mercy. Mayer paid no regard to their begging and turned to me instead, tapping his broad shoulder with the flat of his sword. What will you do, June Carantia? You decide, are they to be punished here, or tried for their sins outside? I cleared my throat with a cough and began, while I do think it'd be nice to take this opportunity to publicize their sins and establish discipline in the dark nights I trailed off. The men's emotions were laid bare as their faces alternatingly showed despair and hope, death and life. I chose to trash their hope. But as that may result in planting distrust among our men, I think it's better to deal with the matter silently. The implied verdict was to seal their mouths with death. Those who got my meaning turned pale regardless, one of them still cried desperately for redemption, thinking there was still a way out. T the boss monster is still there. If why you give us J just one more chance, your excellency. Boss monster. I laughed out loud, unable to hold myself back. Did these people really think we needed their help to take down the boss of a dungeon of this level? Mayor sighed. To think these fools who lack the slightest objectivity regarding dungeons and the core are part of the dark nights I am embarrassed that you had to see this. He lamented with a tone full of shame. Don't worry. Unlike you, Captain, I'm not going to revise any assessments. That is a relief to hear, Mayer said and went to stand before Whipra, who trembled as his captain's shadow fell over him. The dark knight's sword rose and yet the renegade still denied reality, stammering his last words. I I am I am God's chosen one. The blade of judgment fell, devoid of hesitation or mercy. Chapter, 46 We dealt with the rest and left their bodies behind. Before we engaged in battle with the boss monster, I asked Mayor, shall I cast some spells for you? I do not believe you need to take the trouble but perhaps you should do it to gain contribution. I agreed. I couldn't let a chance to get piggyback like this go, especially considering that my level wasn't that high yet. Mighty strength. I cast a simple attack boost spell on Mayer. Unlike healing magic which had a fixed healing value in this world support magic was mostly based on relative value. In other words, the higher the stats of the spell target, the greater the boosting value. And in Mayer's case. The air around him shimmered fleetingly as his stats increased. It was nothing but a 10% attack boost, yet that 10% alone far exceeded my offensive capability. Perhaps it was his first time receiving support magic as Mayer seemed amazed by the overflowing power he felt. Exactly how much has my power increased? He muttered. 10% for now. It's an ordinary attack boosting spell. I explained. I can cast up to three stacks at once. Shall I? With three stacks, the bonus would be 33%. I was probably the only one capable of doing this much, a fact which I was slightly proud of. However, Mayer shook his head in refusal. 
No. I feel tipsy. He was repeatedly clenching his hands and every time he did so, it felt as if he was pulverizing the very air inside his palms did Whipra say he could double his original ability. I nodded. It's possible to do that much, but there are great restrictions. In his case, life was the cost and the target of support was limited to himself as well. As far as I was concerned, it was a truly useless spell despite its high efficacy. What use was there in increasing my power? Zero would always result in zero, regardless of the multiplier. Hearing my answer, Mayer murmured, I see I can somewhat understand why Whipper would have gone so far. Is that so? The power he gained must have truly felt like his own. And power can be more addictive than drugs it would not have been easy shaking off its allure. A bitter smile hung on Meyer's lips. Perhaps he empathized with the desperation to grow stronger no matter what. However he added, face hardening as he tightly gripped his bloodstained sword. His actions were unforgivable. When you sin, you must pay the price for it, he uttered in a tone similar to the swearing of an oath. As it was meaningless to waste any more time, we entered the final area of the dungeon the boss's chamber. Mayer defeated the boss monster with such ease that I felt awkward for using support magic on him. It was my first time seeing him in action, yet I didn't get to see much before the monster croaked. It ended so fast that I had taken more time casting the support spell for Mayer before the battle. While I was still dumbstruck by the outcome, the exit portal opened. If Mayer hadn't pulled me out, I might have stood there zoning out and would have ended up trapped in the dungeon. The gate closed not long after we passed through. It turned out that the sword Mayer had picked up couldn't withstand his strength, it began to crack apart. What a fearsome man. I'm glad it only broke after you defeated the monster. You almost ended up fighting barehanded, I commented in a half-joking tone. Honestly, though, I was sure Mayer could have gone barehanded and won just fine. Somebody approached us then. Your Excellency. It was August, who had been waiting for us. Did anything happen of note? Mayer asked. No, sir. But seeing that only the two of you have come out, that must mean. Indeed. It was as we expected. August, who knew about the situation to some extent, lowered his head mournfully and made the sign of the cross. Who could have imagined they would use the blessing of Saint Marianne to do evil it is a tragedy. For a moment, I thought he felt sad at the deaths of the blue flames, but it turned out he was more concerned over the misuse of power. I had briefly forgotten that the religion in this world placed more importance on responsibility for the blessing of God magic than life. Nevertheless, it was disconcerting to see a priest reacting in a manner that suggested he didn't give a fart about the importance of life. As I was lost in uncomfortable thoughts, Mayer abruptly pulled me into his arms and dragged me closer to August, saying, in any case, you came just in time. Reverend August, heal the vice-captain at once. She was kicked and stabbed all over, I tell you. I immediately protested, but I'm not hurt anywhere. Ignore what she says. Mayer retorted curtly. I didn't know what sort of face he was making as I had my back to him, but I could tell by his voice alone that he wasn't happy. I grumbled inwardly. It wasn't like overhealing a healthy person would boost their energy or anything. It was just a waste of holy power. Did August have nothing but power to spare? The look on the priest's face as he healed me suggested he shared my thoughts, but as there was no way around it under Meyer's strict watch, the meaningless treatment continued during which Mayer continued to nag incessantly. We have big things to achieve, you and I, together. How could you abuse your body like this already? Yes, okay. I nodded noncommittally. Your body no longer belongs solely to yourself. You must feel more responsibility and... All right, of course. Chapter, 47 after dealing with the Blue Flames and their leader, Whipra, Mayer gathered the elites of the Dark Knights to discuss the incident. Only three of them were available, though, Axion, August, and the Tanker Rober. The other two were out on duty with their respective teams to clear dungeons. Rober listened to a brief recount of the incident with a grave expression. Who knew Whipra would do such a thing she murmured. A shield keeper in her early thirties with very attractive dark skin, Rober was the third tallest among the elites. Considering how giant Mayer and August were, 
her physique was nothing short of formidable, even more so when compared to the standards of an ordinary person like me. Even Axion, who was shorter than her, was quite tall but slim. I felt like the odd one out in the conference room, like a dwarf in a country of giants. No wonder, muttered Axion. I thought it was strange how Whipra had been showing such dramatic improvement in skill lately. Why would St. Marianne grant such talent to such a man? He clucked his tongue unhappily. The mere mention of the saint riled up August, who had been apathetic so far. I am certain St. Marianne has it all thought out, he snapped. If God granted manna according to one's personality, do you think you could have possessed the same power you do now, Brother Axion? And thus, the two began bickering back and forth. Well, of course. I think I'm well deserving of it. It's an outstanding talent worthy of my fantastic character, don't you think? Axion bragged. That very attitude of yours the inability to feel gratitude to Mariani's the problem. Axion aside, it was odd to see August, a man of few words, acting like that. Despite my confusion, the others seemed used to it. Men, I tell you. They only know how to make noise all the time. Rober exclaimed, annoyed. Why don't you both fight it out, instead? Prove your conviction with your fist, yeah. Big sis, you telling me to fight that zombie? St. Marianne rejects needless violence. Robert clucked her tongue, sneering. All talk and no action. I thought Robert's reproach would knock some sense into them, but no it only spurred them further. I do not know why a person as devout as His Excellency would place faith in someone like you, brother. The priest stared at the mage as he continued, while you do indeed possess powerful mana, there are limits to what you can achieve if you do not appreciate what you are given. His Excellency has faith in me because I'm strong. Fill a party based on piety, however, and next thing you know, you'll have nothing but corpses left. For a brief moment, I tried to imagine a party of seven composed of nothing but priests. If balanced right, and considering how the Felspawn were of the dark element, it could perhaps be the strongest composition in many ways. That might be worth trying, too I muttered to myself subconsciously. Axion jumped up in shock. Hang on now are you serious, June? Really? No jokes. Well I hesitated. If there were seven priests of Reverend August's caliber, the advantage in element would make them undefeatable. With a physique like August's, plus a little bit of training, there'd be no problems in either offense or defense. Since a priest's specialty was healing, there'd be no worries in the survival department either. Imagining seven of August made Axion twist his face. There's no way there'd be six more priests like him, he blurted. But there might be at least one. Hmm it's something to think about. It didn't seem like a bad idea to have another priest whose main strength wasn't healing. Rober, who had been listening with her arms crossed, raised a brow as she remarked, You talk like you can make a second August. It'd be difficult, but not impossible. Well, I'll say is support magic something that capable? You've heard of how drastically Whipra's skills have improved recently. It's possible to become stronger even faster, I answered calmly. I had a skill called rich experience that increased acquired experience. For those who needed every dungeon and battle experience they could get, it was an invaluable skill. After all, experience could only be gained by defeating monsters in dungeons. When I mentioned growing stronger faster, Axion's face turned bright. I knew you were a gem, but June, please include me in the special unit as well. I'm pretty useful, aren't I? He boasted, clinging to me and singing all sorts of praises, which wasn't strange coming from him. It was in his nature to place importance on talent and power. Chapter, 48 I shooed him away like chasing off a pesky fly and said, Axion. If you're trying to join the special unit for your personal growth, I'd like to tell you that it's utterly pointless. Why? Because going to dungeons that'll help you improve is impossible for me at my current level. I'd probably die before you even gained a level, I think. And I doubt going around low-level dungeons will help you any either. Axion's shoulders dropped and he pouted, crestfallen, putting his intellectual face to waste. Will you please level up quickly, then? He grumbled like a child. How can the vice-captain not even be level 50? I'll catch up in no time, don't worry. 
Are you playing cat and mouse with me? Despite his complaints, Axion looked happy at the prospect of me leveling up quickly and going on dungeons alongside him. That was my secret purpose in creating the special unit, to begin with. While I also aimed to develop outstanding core members, improving my reputation and securing a place within the Dark Knights in the process, my most pressing concern was raising my level. Of course, it would be fine to let Mayor carry me, but the downside was the same as with Axion, high-level dungeons suitable for them were too dangerous for me, and going around low-level dungeons was a waste of time for them. In any case, at this rate, we'd continue to discuss the special unit. Although it didn't matter what we spoke about, it wasn't the most important topic at hand so I tried changing the subject. However, Mayer took the initiative to break the silence he had maintained thus far and abruptly declared, then it will be announced that the crimes of Wipra and his men were committed out of jealousy at seeing their juniors climbing the ranks. Murdering talented rookies something along those lines. It's not far off from the truth. Whipper's status as a support mage would be kept among us since making that known to others would only cause unnecessary prejudice. Plus, it'd be an additional hindrance to me. Thus, under everyone's agreement, the Blue Flames incident was concluded. It was late after the meeting ended when Mayer summoned me alone to his office. In the dimly lit room, he lifted an unopened bottle of wine and asked, how about having a glass as a commendation for a job well done? I immediately answered without giving it much thought. I like drinking. One glass won't be enough. Nothing that belonged to Mayer was inexpensive. Needless to say, his wine was no different and I wasn't stupid to miss an opportunity to taste expensive liquor. Usually, drinking with a superior of the opposite sex so late at night would pose a problem, but the situation changed when the superior in question was Mayor Knox. The man was famous for having no interest in such monkey business. Hordes of women had attempted to seduce the famed Grand Duke, also titled Dark Knight. I could hardly count the ones I knew the names and faces of, even with all my fingers and toes. Of course, all those women suffered a bitter rejection, which was why the rumors of me and Mayer being lovers or whatnot made even less sense. The only potential risks in drinking with him were that it might worsen the rumors or I could get drunk enough to say what I shouldn't. If I unconsciously revealed that this world was actually a game world and that Mayer was the core of the demon lord. But surely that wouldn't happen, right? I was quite capable of holding my liquor, having never gotten drunk, and June's body now mine also had a high tolerance for spirits. I didn't know whether alcohol tolerance was a trait of the soul, or if it was something June and I shared, but it was fortunate that I didn't need to abstain or hold back from drinking. We started by having a glass of wine each, and then another until we drained a bottle in no time and Mayer took out a new one. It was just as expensive and delicious as I had anticipated. We downed glass after glass for a long while, and eventually, Mayer began to open his tightly closed lips. Whippera I did not know he was that kind of man in the past. The drink must have gotten to him as his murmuring voice was more relaxed than usual, although his complexion was perfectly fine. I would have thought him a rock-hard drinker immune to liquor if he hadn't started talking. I wet my lips with wine and replied, it's not surprising that you didn't know. He was a man who cared for his comrades, back then, he murmured. The whippera I knew was that kind of man. This answered my question of why he had invited me for a drink he wanted to share his feelings with the aid of alcohol. I could understand why he could only invite me he couldn't talk about the first playthrough and so on with others, after all. Still, I was surprised. Mayer was ruthless in cutting down Whippera and the blue flames. He was so merciless that I thought he wasn't at all bothered by the incident. Thinking back on it, he hadn't looked good throughout the entire meeting. I had naturally assumed he was matching the atmosphere, according to the gravity of the matter, but it showed then that he was brooding over it more deeply than I thought. I could only down more wine, somewhat lost for words at finding this unexpectedly compassionate side to Mayer. Chapter, 49 Up to this moment, I had thought of Mayer as the strongest man in the world a dungeon-closing machine. Then, suddenly, he seemed much more human. Who would have imagined Mayer to be a bad drunk? In my mind, he had always been a weapon made flesh, possessing a strong mind and body since birth. However, seeing him like this made me realize that he, too, was but a man and, for some reason, pity welled up from a corner of my heart. 
who wouldn't feel this way when the strongest of mankind was showing his weak side, and only to you. From another perspective, this situation was hilarious. Who was I to be sympathizing with a man who could send me off to the afterlife with a single twist of my neck? It was like a rat showing consideration for a tiger and the absurdity of the mental image made me chortle. Don't mind it too much, I murmured. How can I not? He shot back, staring at me expressionlessly and his feverish golden eyes glinted as if asking me for an answer. I circled the rim of my glass with a fingertip and pursed my lips, pensive. Was I imagining things? The fragrance of the red wine was sweet, yet it reminded me of the countless pools of blood I had stepped through in the past. Honestly, dungeons are too harsh for ordinary people to endure, no. I don't know what Whipper was like in the beginning, but it doesn't surprise me that he went insane, I commented. Of the core members that failed to cope with the continuous venturing in and out of dungeons, many changed just like Whipper did. It was easy to end up devaluing life since even with the low mortality rate, they had to constantly dance on a thin line between life and death. Friends and comrades dying unintentionally in dungeons was something I took a long time to get used to as well. Perhaps by reminding myself that I was in a game world, I had been barely hanging in there, using self-delusion as a defense mechanism. Treating people, entering dungeons, killing both monsters and humans, all with the sense of playing a game and thinking about it, wasn't I a risk factor as well? I had to be careful the most important thing was to not cross the line. The devil's whisper would always reach the ears of humans, but not everyone would listen. Of course, I meant that it's strange, not that it's right, I continued speaking with a firmer tone. You said it yourself, Captain, what Whippera did was unforgivable, and I agree with you. Not everyone chooses the easy way of sacrificing others. To have made such a choice I paused. Although my mind was still clear, the wine was getting to me, stiffening my tongue. He made such a choice because he was a weak man with no conviction. In the end, he ended up how he did because he wasn't strong enough. I had no idea how Whipper's life had ended in the first playthrough, but I highly doubted he had a happy ending. Power gained in the manner he did was bound to betray its owner in a crucial moment. I stared at Meyer's large, calloused, and scarred fists placed on the table. Those tightly clenched hands of his were trying to hold on to too many things, and perhaps that was what moved my heart. I couldn't stop myself from reaching out to pat those scarred hands that were far bigger than mine and comfort him. Your Excellency doesn't need to mind the circumstances of those who fail to be strong. Forget it. Once everything was over, when the demon lord was slain and Mayor became emperor, he would need to care for his people and therefore know how to look after the weak, but that time was far off. For the moment, he had neither the time nor the energy to spare for that as he had to focus on growing stronger, more than anybody else. Mayer wordlessly stared at my hand covering his for some time until he suddenly broke the silence. If. He used his other hand to cover mine and the rush of warmth I felt from his strong grip was bewildering. However, something else shook me even more, I glimpsed, for the first time ever, the anxiety hidden deep within Mayer Knox. If I am not the strong man you believe me to be he suddenly muttered. If I am not the man who can live up to your expectations what would you do? What? Surely you would be disappointed. Mayer bowed his head, chuckling. His golden eyes flared for an instant, like a beast sniffing out the weakness of its prey. You chose me for being strong. Perhaps the disappointment will make you return to Fabian's side. Chapter, 50 my sluggish mind was shocked awake as if doused with cold water. I had been wondering what he was going to say but in the end, he was just trying to see if I still had lingering feelings for Fabian. Thinking about it, Mayer and I were close enough business-wise, but not so intimate as to show his weakness like this. What a cunning man. At first, I thought he was simply a bad drunk, but he could have orchestrated this situation to probe my thoughts. Not to mention, I had drunk a lot of wine as well. Clearly, he had planned to make me fess up my thoughts with the aid of intoxication, to see whether I would betray him or not. I regretted feeling sorry for this man for even a moment. A drink for a job well done, my foot. But regardless of how betrayed I felt, I was once Fabian's dog so I could understand why Mayer would try to fathom my thoughts. Putting my feelings aside, as far as appearances went, I couldn't have seemed more loyal to that traitor. 
I might have seemed like a blind fanatic even up to the moment I joined the Dark Knights it was understandable that the Duke was having difficulties trusting me. Furthermore, he was hiding the crucial fact about him being the core of the Demon Lord. Seeing as how it wasn't a secret that could be shared with just anybody, he could only be careful about choosing who to keep by his side. Since I had proven how useful I could be, he had to be measuring how much trust he could place with that being the case, I had to work even harder in gaining his trust. After all, I could only plan future strategies if he revealed his possession of mana to me. Clearing up my thoughts, I sighed, a frown on my face. As you always say, Captain, I began, raising my voice in annoyance, my lies show on my face so I'm just going to be straight with you. Are you making fun of me right now? Taken aback by my anger, Meyer's eyes widened, but that didn't stop me from running my mouth. Disappointed? Going back to Fabian? Are you branding me as a person without honor because I switched flags once? That is not what I think, I. Then you wouldn't have even asked that question in the first place. Is it because I was Fabian's dog? Because dogs don't change owners. June, he muttered. Did I ever mention this? I hated being called that way. He stared at me, silent, and I continued, I only did my best as a member of the Corps and yet, for some reason, they got the wrong idea. Mayer fell silent, as I knew he would. In moments like these, it was effective to play innocent or get overly angry. In his usual state of mind, Mayer would have noticed something was up. But I presumed the alcohol was kicking and he only sat there sweating in confusion at my unexpected outburst as he apologized, I am truly sorry that I said such things when we first met. Unlike you, Captain, I have a large heart, so apology accepted. His befuddled silence prompted me to go on talking. So then, why did you ask such a thing out of nowhere? Did you do something, by any chance? Sacrificed your men like Whippera or something? Is that why you were trying to beat me to the punch? He hesitated. That is not it. Then it's fine. Fine. Of course, you're the one who proposed that I join the Corps. But in the end, I thought things through before accepting your offer. I chose you, Captain, because you met my conditions, I explained somewhat indifferently, leaning back against my chair as much as I could. One of my hands was still being held by Mayor. We're both on the same boat already. You need to defeat the Demon Lord no matter what, Captain. It's no use even if you complain. If it turns out that you aren't as strong as I thought I met Meyer's eyes and continued, in a clear voice, I just need to make you stronger. Mayer stared at me blankly, wonder in his eyes. You. Me. Why. You think I can't. I asked with a taunting grin. I knew his physical specs in and out so that didn't matter, but the problem lay in his mentality. To begin with, I chose Mayer despite knowing that he would turn into the Demon Lord. Since I was already assuming the worst to happen, there wasn't much Mayer could do to put me at a loss. I just always do my best as a member of the Corps, and doing my best means perfectly supporting you, Captain. I continued to explain. So don't worry even if you suddenly say you don't want to fight the Demon Lord, I'll send you to his castle even if I need to kick your ass over there. What else do you think I'm suffering here for? Mayer still looked disbelieving regardless of my composed attitude. The man was fidgeting with my poor hand so much that I felt they were getting worn out. Still, I let him do as he liked and had some wine to wet my throat that was dry from talking so much. Sipping at my glass, I glanced sideways at Mayer, whose face had turned much gentler than before. Feeding me alcohol to probe my thoughts talk about shocking. I wouldn't ever be drinking with him again. Then again, the liquor in my mouth was far too sweet, and Meyer's handsome face was a fine appetizer to go with it so maybe just one more time. I was changing my mind like flipping a coin. If I could drink bottles of this standard of liquor, I could bear with some questioning any time. Chapter, 51 Of course, that didn't mean I was going to forgive everything. Still feeling some resentment, I yanked my hand out of Meyer's grip and gruffly said, You promised me you'd make the name of June Carantia go down in history. Yes, I did. You weren't lying, were you? I squinted at him. No, I was not. 
This weak act you're putting up doesn't make you sound persuasive, I grumbled, initially pretending to be angry but I ended up feeling somewhat irritated for real. As if realizing that all his troubling thoughts were in vain, Mayer chuckled. Hey you must be the definition of a strong person, what with that unchanging attitude of yours. You speak as if you're familiar with how I was back in the first playthrough. Of course I am. Why else would I have come to rescue you so suddenly? My eyes have been on you for a long time. Whenever Mayer mentioned these memories, I trembled inside, my past attempted assassinations prickling my conscience. Thankfully, his words had nothing to do with that. By chance, I heard Fabian's expedition court discussing which dungeon to raid. I do not quite remember which performance report meeting it was, but just to be clear, I was not spying. Your people were simply talking too loudly. A faraway look appeared on Meyer's eyes as he reminisced. They seemed to be having trouble deciding between two dungeons and were adamant on choosing the one you said was impossible for everyone to raid. I remembered that. Usually, I tended to stay back in meetings and such where one had to be vocal, but sometimes, when the Corps had been about to pass over a special dungeon with good loot, I hadn't remained quiet. You were steadfast regardless of how others ignored you for being a support mage and it left a deep impression on me, he added. And indeed, they had completely disregarded the supporter who hadn't even fought a monster properly before the thought of Mayer witnessing my moment of shame made me flush in embarrassment, feeling awkward. In the end, my opinion wasn't accepted, I mumbled. Well, it matters not. We are in the second playthrough, anyway, he said. Back then, I had wanted to try working with you who would have guessed we would be together like this now. No wonder I must have been marked by him way back then. Speaking of which, the dungeon I had recommended I was sure the Dark Knights had cleared it. At the time, I had thought it was merely a coincidence, but could it be that they had listened to my words? It made sense why he had paid attention to me after all, the dungeon had been full of treasure. The Duke must have thought that I was either very lucky or had information everyone else didn't. Which was why he recruited me in the second playthrough life was truly unpredictable, like the flapping of a butterfly's wings causing a hurricane on the other side of the planet. Besides you also remember the first playthrough and that makes you very reliable. I am most happy that you became my vice-captain. Was he trying to probe me under the guise of drunkenness? I raised a brow and pointed out, I never dreamed that your good treatment of a vice-captain included bearing with the noble captain's drunken behavior. Ha <laughs> ha. Next time, please don't do something like this, okay? All right, all right. Mayer raised both hands in surrender at my grouching before straightening his face. From now on, I will be trusting you completely. What a Liari still hadn't mentioned that he had demonic power. Still, I felt that he would let me know the truth at some point so I decided to be content with sharing a secret with him. I will do everything in my capability to give you what you desire, he vowed. So long as I can kill the demon lord I can even give you the emperor's crown. He had to be kidding. The captain of the expedition corps that slew the demon lord was supposed to become the emperor. If he passed the crown to me, there would be a huge opposition, and it wasn't like that was so easy to achieve in the first place. However, Mayer didn't look like he was joking he seemed to have zero interest in the throne. Then, all of a sudden, I recalled something Axion had said to me before. At times, His Excellency gives the impression that closing dungeons is his only purpose in living. Honestly, it's to the point where I'm curious about his plans after the Demon Lord dies and everything is over, he had said, back in the mess hall. The Flame Mage had seen right through Mayer the man was willing to burn his entire being to kill the Demon Lord, even though he would later crumble into white ashes. To their captain, wealth, glory, and unmatched power were all secondary objectives. His primary mission was to take down the Lord of Evil. The wine's making you say all kinds of nonsense. I won't care even if you regret this later when you're sober, I replied, feeling bitter from the thoughts bouncing in my head. I will not regret. I sighed at Meyer's stubborn and fretful reaction. Before I knew it, we were deep into the night and I didn't know if it was the time or the wine, but I was feeling drowsy. I got up to leave and discreetly took the remaining bottle of liquor, intending to enjoy it by myself later. I'll be taking my leave now, I announced, excusing myself. Chapter, 52 I will see you off, Mayer answered and also got up, 
but the alcohol in him made him sway. Perhaps it was due to his large size, but even the slightest stagger came off as threatening. If he ended up falling over me yikes. Already feeling smothered, I desperately tried to dissuade him from seeing me off. It's fine, it's fine. By the looks of it, I should be the one escorting you to bed, Captain. I suggest you hurry and go rest in your room. Just to the door, then. He insisted and I couldn't stop him. With Myers' every unsteady step spiking my anxiety, the room felt unnecessarily wide. After a moment that seemed like an eternity, we reached the door and I sighed in relief. Rest well, Captain. I enjoyed the wine, I said, turning toward him. After all you drank, you take another bottle with you. Have you not had enough? Couldn't you have just let it pass? I grumbled. Honestly, did he have to point it out? Sometimes, it was better to turn a blind eye to things. He leaned against the doorframe to steady himself, allowing me to finally have some peace of mind. You sure are a strong drinker today it was my defeat. I got completely strung along, he remarked. You reap what you sow. Meyer's eyes curled in mirth for a moment as he laughed at the warning hidden in my words. I had to admit, though, he was really tall up close. I had never noticed it before because we usually kept a distance, but his head was so far up that it was difficult for me to make eye contact, even though he was leaning at an angle. As an odd silence enveloped us, I observed his coarse cheeks and shadowed eyes. His breaths were touching my forehead and I realized a bit too late that the fragrance coming from his mouth smelled the same as my wine. For some reason, that made my heart race had I not drunk enough. I promised myself to have another glass when I got to my room. Right then, Myers must black mane hung over me, tickling my forehead. I unconsciously reached out to touch it, only intending on pushing those loose strands behind his ear. Suddenly, Mayer caught my hand before I could do so as if he didn't want me to touch him. He was, objectively speaking, overreacting. I stood there blinking dumbly, failing to grasp the situation. Mayer registered his actions a few seconds later and quietly let go of my hand. It felt a little sore despite being held so shortly. I am sorry. I overreacted. Not at all. That was a bit inappropriate of me. I laughed it off awkwardly. Had I been in his shoes, I would have felt uncomfortable. Even a superior touching a subordinate's hair would come across as ridiculing how perplexing would it be the other way around. I had indeed crossed the line. Convinced that I was drunk after all, I decided to have no more wine after getting back to my room and bid farewell in a fluster. Then have a good night. The same to you. He looked like he wanted to say something else, but in the end, he didn't. Even as I hurried down the hallway, I could feel his gaze on me and, for a splitting second, I was almost overcome by the urge to turn around. I wanted to see what his face looked like, but I shook it off and kept walking, not looking back. Chapter, 53 On the next day, word about the shocking incident involving the blue flame spread among the dark nights. Everyone was shaken by the tragedy wrought by those they had believed to be comrades. Mayer, in particular, wore a grim look never before seen on his face. It's my first time seeing the captain look so furious someone commented. Maybe there's something more serious that we're unaware of. Best we keep on our tosseted suck to lose favor at a time like this. Many people gathered together, gossiping, cautious of Mayer. In my case, because I knew the truth of the matter, the only feeling I had was incredulity as I was aware the Duke was nursing a hangover. Judging by how unsteadily Mayer had been walking the night before, he had indeed drunk quite a lot. Sitting in the mess hall, I disinterestedly pushed my food around while listening to the chatter. Once I finished my meal, I immediately headed to my office, determined to finish the list of special unit members. Suddenly, someone called out toward me. June. I turned around and saw Axion striding over, red hair fluttering about. I heard you had a drink with His Excellency after the meeting yesterday. Yes, I did have a glass. I downed more than what one would call a glass, but I chose to gloss over that detail. His Excellency really seems to trust you, he said, sounding impressed. We just had some liquor. That's the thing. He suddenly exclaimed. What? 
His Excellency doesn't drink with anyone in private, Axion explained, staring at me. He either drinks with everyone at a banquet or he drinks alone. Aha. So that's why he indulged himself so much yesterday, I muttered to myself. I could guess where Meyer's habit of silently downing glass after glass had come from. I'm seriously impressed. The mage continued. You must have felt lost, suddenly being appointed as vice captain despite having no dungeon experience. And yet, next thing we know, you managed to purge corruption within the core. Did His Excellency know you were such a capable person from the beginning? Can't say. I'm curious about the full extent of your ability. You were hiding your skills when we first met, weren't you? This man was oddly insightful and I had to admit he had a keen sense. I began walking away as I replied, it's no use even if you praise me. I'm not taking you into the special unit. What, why? Axion flared up. You're taking Reverend August. No wonder he had hinted the other day about how he wanted to enter dungeons with me joining my unit had been the goal all along. The captain gave me Reverend August, I didn't choose. Besides, you have way too much offensive power. I'll hold myself back. He immediately promised. You're in charge of a team now. How about you take good care of your red wolves? I'm good at multitasking, being such an able man. To my annoyance, Axion was very persistent. It dawned on me that this might be his biggest talent, instead of his mana or the like. I gave him a casual shrug before walking away briskly. Axion followed me, undaunted, and asked curiously, by the way, his excellency is suffering from a hangover, yet you're just fine. I guess you didn't drink much. I was sure I had drunk more than Mayer, but if I was honest then I'd come off as a conceited rookie so I gave an evasive answer. Well I just drank in moderation. Wait up, what's with that reaction? You sound like somebody who can hold their liquor. Ha! <laughs> Robin then appeared out of nowhere and joined the conversation. What's this about somebody holding their liquor? A lot of people were suddenly talking to me today. I had always gone around by myself like a loner, and yet it was a new feeling. Looks like our vice captain knows how to drink, eh? Rober hung an arm the width of my thighs across my shoulder, yanking me over to her. Now that's nice to hear. Let's have a drink together later, and get acquainted some more while we're at it. She made a gesture that mimicked gulping from a bottle, looking livelier than I had ever seen her before. Axion frowned at her and came to my free side to whisper in my ear. Careful, June. Rober doesn't drink liquor, she bathes in it. And she may very well do the same thing to you. Chapter, 54 His whispering was completely heard by Rober, however. Ha! Huh. That's just how a great warrior of Raggedon drinks. She said, her hearty roar of laughter ringing in my ears. I hadn't had time to talk to Rober previously thanks to August and Axion's quibbling and I didn't expect to have the chance to do so like this. She was crude, but she wasn't a bad person. I nodded without objection. I like bathing in liquor too. Ah, uh, you know how to live life. I always felt frustrated being around this finicky, red-haired miser, and a certain blonde priest who doesn't know how to have fun. It was only then I understood Rober's abrupt friendly approach. Drinking buddies were important, after all. Thinking about it some more, there was no harm in getting closer to the elites whenever possible so I gladly accepted. You did say later, but when I think about it, today wouldn't be bad either. Are you up for it? I did have some work to do, but it could be put off a little. You bet I am. Wait, June. You drank with His Excellency yesterday, yet you're going at it again now? Axion interjected. There's yesterday's drinking, and then there's today's drinking, I replied. Rober nodded. I love the sound of that. Come, let us women strike up a friendship. Ha hang on now. I'll go with you too. August arrived only after he finished his morning prayer, but by then we were already long into the drinking party. The priest looked around the office where bottles were rolling around the floor, bewildered. What are you all doing in broad daylight? He muttered. I laughed awkwardly. To be frank, I was drinking during work hours so I had to tread carefully. Rober, on the other hand, felt no such guilt standing proud and tall, 
she laughed cheerfully and shook a bottle of liquor as she joked, Oh, Sir Priest. How about a glass yourself? There's no command of St. Marianne that forbids drinking now, is there? To polish the talent granted unto me in gratitude to God without a moment of indolence of that is my duty. To drink in broad daylight is to sin against God's mercy, he replied. So stiff. Despite Rober's grumbling, August's stance remained firm and so the party was forcefully stopped there. Axion and Rober left, leaving me alone with the priest. Feeling uncomfortable, I opened the window to let in some air since I could still vaguely smell alcohol lingering in the room. August clicked his tongue and began, It is troublesome to be swayed around by Sister Rober. You are our vice-captain, are you not? You must take control, sister. Are you acknowledging me as vice-captain? I asked in surprise. It was the first time August had mentioned my rank. With a heavy sigh, he said, judging by the competence you have shown so far, there is no reason to not acknowledge you. And if truth be told, it is no affair of mine whether to accept you or not. His words were the truth, but I couldn't stop myself from glancing at him in curiosity. Although his face was as stiff as ever, I had the feeling that his expression had softened. It's reassuring to hear you say that, I said. August made the sign of the cross as he added, the men's opinion of you will be reversed soon. You are someone who polishes the gift granted by St. Mary Ann without judging it by human standards. That is why I pray for Mary Ann's blessing to be with you. It finally dawned on me why I felt he had been so curt and purposefully kept his distance on our first meeting. Not because I was a support mage, but because he had been wary of me being someone riddled with inferiority and dissatisfaction due to my job class. Or worse, being a slacker who overly trusted the status of spellcaster the former case was Whipra, while the latter could be someone like Axion, who wasn't a slacker but was full of himself all the time. August was more religious than I had thought, and it surprised me that such a man could get along well with Mayer, who didn't seem that devout. So even if Sister Rober suggests something like drinking in broad daylight in the future, please refuse. If you keep playing along with her, you will end up having liquor replace the blood in your veins. As August seemed to have the wrong idea, I made an honest confession. Just saying, but I was the one who suggested we drink. Even if I kept up a good image with lies, it'd only backfire harder when the truth came out. August wrinkled his brow as he asked, Did Sister Robert tell you to say that? What? With a solemn expression, he continued, You need not defend her with such a lie. I know everything. It really was my fault, but August was not buying it at all. Feeling sorry for Robert, I swore to pay her back later. I helplessly passed over the matter with a laugh, feeling my conscience prick at having Robert wrongly blamed. Ding ding. The bell of the monastery telling the hour rang, and just in good time too. I looked out the window at the monastery spire as I changed the subject. Come to think of it, when I first came to Noctentoria Castle, I thought it felt like a monastery. I wondered why, but now I see it's because I can always hear hymns being sung. The dukedom of Noctentoria has been unsparingly supportive of religion since past generations. They have always given abundant donations as well. His Excellency, the current Grand Duke, has inherited the will of his predecessors and is a devout servant of our goddess and that is why I chose to be with the Dark Knights. Chapter, 55 August's faith and holy power were so massive, he was considered for becoming the youngest cardinal in the goddess's order. Because of his good physical strength, many desired him by their side. All this made me wonder why he had joined the Dark Knights since August didn't value absolute power or wealth, while every man and their brother longed to rally under the Duke's flag. But it turned out that Meyer's piety scored higher in the priest's heart. As I finally solved one mystery, another popped up in exchange. I didn't expect Mayor Knox to be a faithful believer to the extent of gaining respect from August. The future demon lord a faithful servant of the goddess. Those two elements did not mix well at all. I assume the captain frequently prays in the monastery as well. I asked. I know he always visits before setting off on an expedition. I advise you to do the same, vice-captain. I had never been one to believe in religion, to begin with, and so my thoughts about a game world goddess needn't be said. 
Regardless if the deity of this world granted the supernatural abilities known as magic and holy power, no faith welled up in me. The story changed if Mayer, the highest authority within the Dark Knights, and Augusta Corps member of the Corps were devout believers. I had to summon faith even if I had none so I put on a mask of piety and nodded at his suggestion. All right. I'll be sure to go with you sometime. I'm sorry, Rober, I said after explaining how August had ended up mistaking her as the mastermind behind the drinking party. It would have been inconvenient if she had misunderstood the situation later. Fortunately, she was largely unconcerned about it. Well, I would have made the suggestion if you hadn't so it doesn't matter much, she said, patting my shoulder with a hearty laugh. But. With a giggle, she continued, a person's usual behavior matters. What's to be done if that hard-headed priest didn't believe you when you said the truth? He'd probably think I blackmailed you had you kept on insisting. In a voice filled with remorse at how magnanimous Rober was, I said, I still feel sorry about it so let's have another drink later. My treat. Sounds good. Growing closer with Rober was a fair game. The genius talents of August and Axion made them the objects of admiration of the other core members, but they were difficult to get close to. Rober, on the other hand, was prone to normally hanging out with the regular members, which was why she had a good reputation. Thanks to sticking around a woman like her, the number of people who openly insulted me had decreased. Not to mention, word had begun to spread that I was the one who had solved the incident with the blue flames. Although taking credit for it wasn't my intention, I had no real reason to clear the facts not that it was a lie or anything. Everyone had revised their opinion of me from a useless girl that joined the Corps by luck to a somewhat useful, lucky girl. Of course, the label of Meyer's lover hadn't disappeared, but nobody went on about it in my face anymore. It was a welcome moniker compared to being treated like a dog at least I was considered a human being so I let the rumors go through one ear and out the other. Time passed, and the day of my initiation ceremony arrived. The vice captain uniform Mayer had tailored for me was unlike the common uniforms made of high quality material, it had more spiff to its epaulets and sleeves. The calf high boots were soft and light and the gloves fit just right. One could tell at first glance that it belonged to an officer. It was only after putting on this perfectly fitting uniform that I truly felt I had become the vice captain of the Dark Knights. The initiation and inauguration began, and every core member cried out the rallying call of the Dark Knights. Darkness cleaving swords, earth rumbling axes, sky piercing bows, and radiant spears. Eternal glory be to the heirs of heroes and shields of the Championto the Dark Knights. They showed discipline worthy of the prestige and history of the Dark Knights. Was it because Mayor Knox was with us? A thrilling tension was running through the air. After a brief proceeding, Mayor called my name. June Carantia. Come forward. I stepped onto the podium under the gazes of the knights, feeling that I wasn't cut out for all this but it was something I had to go through only once so I held back a sigh and took a deep breath. Hello, everyone, I began, raising my voice from the belly due to a lack of microphones. I'm the newly appointed vice captain of the Dark Knights. Chapter, 56 I slowly swept my gaze below the podium. Nobody's posture went slack because I was speaking they still maintained their disciplined forms, but I could see the challenging descent in their eyes. Rumors about me had already warped and spread the enemy I face was the prejudice within these people. I reminded myself of this and continued, I know everyone must be at a loss because I appeared out of nowhere and took the empty position of vice-captain. I'm sure there are many rumors about me spread regarding that. At the mention of rumors, the complexions of the men whitened they seemingly feared that I would dig into the source of those rumors and mete out punishments. Holding back a sneer, I wondered how much they had to hide as I went on. But I can dare say that those rumors came by because you all don't know me very well. I'm not one to particularly care for obsessing with or ferreting out the past. Whatever you have all said about me before, I'll forget about from this moment on. Small sounds of exhalation came from among the men involuntarily sighs of relief, no doubt. I chose that moment to jump on them. But it'll be different in the future. I don't mind whatever rumors that may spawn about me, but I will not forgive such hearsay interfering with my goal, nor do I think it should be forgiven. A strong gust of wind blew then, making the flag of our core flap violently, and my gray hair, 
the symbol of a support mage, fluttered along with it. It wasn't the time to mind the bothersome sensation, though. With flared eyes, I looked straight ahead, and without any hesitation or any reservation, I shouted, I have only one goal to bring victory to the Dark Knights in the battle to come against the Demon Lord. And to that end, I don't intend on sparing any means or methods. Suddenly, Mayer began clapping and the others tentatively followed suit until, eventually, thunderous applause filled the air as if I had given a masterful speech. Ha if I were to score my performance, I suppose I could give good points in having aimed for this sort of response from them. Going on about defeating the demon lord was Meyer's style, after all. My speech couldn't have failed as I knew best whom to butter up. I raised a hand, signaling for the unending applause to stop, and the sounds of clapping gradually died down. As part of my goal, I planned to establish a special unit. You all may know about this from the rumors, but the special unit is a high-efficiency growth team that will hold priority over all dungeons assigned to the Dark Knights, I said, breaking the renewed silence. The establishment of the special unit was already known, but holding dungeon priority was news to everyone. Unsurprisingly, the crowd was stirred, but I paid no mind to that and continued, only those with talent and potential and those deemed essential to the core will be selected for the special unit. You can refuse the invitation, but consider carefully before doing so there will be no second chances. Before, the men would have expressed aversion, thinking that the special unit wasn't even worth careful consideration. Now, though, everyone seemed confused. The right to dungeon priority aside, it was obvious that the special unit would be given more support and power than expected, so they must have realized it wasn't a good idea to simply refuse. The special unit member composition will be strictly decided by myself as the vice captain. Those who are nominated to join will receive individual notices, I added. Those that wanted to join but had no confidence in their skills began to murmur among themselves, suspecting my objectivity in discernment. They spent so much time underrating and mocking the special unit as something no one wanted to be part of, yet now that it seemed worth something they talked of impartiality. They were a pack of sly cretins who wagged their tongues if it was to their advantage with more ease than flipping a hand. I calmly ignored their dissent their voices would be forgotten anyway once the special unit was established. By then, they'd flipped their attitudes again to curry favor with me. I needn't bother with them. I, June Carantia, will do my best to eliminate harm, obtain everything of aid for the Dark Knights, and lead us to greater prosperity. Eternal glory be to the heirs of heroes and shields of the Championto of the Dark Knights. I had declared my stance, and all that remained was to march onward. I looked to the future with determination in my eyes. Chapter, 57 The special unit was assembled, with the most striking among them being the young boy jumping up and down with one hand up. The aforementioned bow user, Sevi Ventus, scampered over and cried out, Vice Captain. Had he a tail, it would have been spinning in circles at that moment. The boy looked at me and laughed shyly, his pretty face gushing. I was so happy when you recruited me to the special unit that I couldn't even sleep well last night. Although I usually kept a courteous distance from others, I couldn't help but treat this fourteen-year-old more casually. You have to sleep to grow. Do you like tall people, Vice Captain? Then I'll make sure to sleep early from now on. Am I right? There's a good boy, I replied, wondering if the boy was always this boisterous. It felt like he was much friendlier to me now than when we first met. I'll do my best to live up to your expectations, Vice Captain. After all, you're my lifesaver, Sevi said, gazing at me with resolute eyes. The details of the Blue Flames incident were highly confidential however, because he was involved, Sevi knew the truth. And so, ever since he found out about it, he had shown infinite trust toward me, which was somewhat perplexing. Did Mayer leave too strong of an impression when he transformed into Sevi? Perhaps the sight of the captain stopping Whipra in the boy's form was too memorable I could see the man's image overlap the boy's figure vividly. When Sevi let out a shy laugh, I couldn't help but imagine the captain doing the same and goosebumps appeared all over my skin. Despite how disconcerted I felt, that didn't mean I would exclude him from the special unit. Latent mages could hardly be considered common and Sevi was the most promising member of the special unit so far. Therefore, I had no choice but to get used to it. Patting Sevi on the head, 
I had him take a seat before casting a glance around the conference room where the special unit was gathered. Right next to the head of the table sat August, with a woman clad in vestments stealing glances at him. That was Julieta Klawa, an acolyte. I had almost overlooked her because as a member of the church and not of the Dark Knights, her name didn't appear in the party window. Still, inspired by Axion's idea of having seven priests in a party, I thought it would be good to add one more priest. And so I checked out Noctentoria Monastery, where I ended up discovering a hidden treasury a woman possessing potential far superior to any I had ever seen among the corps. That was when I forced Julieta to join the Dark Knights. With the pride of the order, Brother August around Julieta mumbled, eyes darting back and forth cautiously. I don't get why I was chosen to be here when I haven't even managed to become a priest yet besides, I cause trouble every day due to her lacking holy power, Julieta's hair was more straw-colored than golden. Her lack of spirit wasn't a surprise as, apparently, she was often scolded in the monastery. Shutting her eyes tightly, Julieta bowed and shouted, I'll take Brother August as my role model and work hard to improve my healing skills. I'll do my best. Come now, sister, your healing doesn't need improvement. That isn't what you need to learn from Reverend August, I said. Pardon? Julieta shot me a blank look. Staring at her with a serious expression, I explained. What you need to learn from him is toughness. See those muscles? I pointed at August. That's what you need to follow. Instead of praying, I want you to take up a mace. What? Julieta jumped to her feet and stared at August's sturdy muscles. The priest's brow visibly twitched at the sudden situation, his face displaying his current feelings very clearly, what bull is this? However, as a man of the clergy, he couldn't bring himself to say such words out loud. Julieta, on the other hand, was appalled by the mental image of her body with August's brawn. Why you must be joking. You're just teasing me, aren't you, sister? I'm speaking very honestly, sister. I'm certain that a mace will suit you very well. Are you sure about it being a mace? Not lace. Did I hear you right? Julieta insisted. How useful could lace be in a dungeon? I chuckled. Yes, you heard me right, I'm talking about that heavy, thick, brutal mace. I put on a serious yet sincere expression to convey the truthfulness of my statement. Yes, Julieta possessed outstanding potential as a melee attacker. All the troubles she caused in the monastery were related to this, damaging furniture, ripping habits while washing them, causing brick walls to suddenly crumble those were the only sort of accidents she caused. All this time, that overflowing power of hers had been waiting for the moment to shine it had been waiting for me. I calmed Julieta with a bright grin. Now, now. I'll eventually explain everything regarding the individual direction of growth for everyone, separately and in detail. Chapter, 58 Julieta had no choice but to sit back down. Looks like just about everyone has gathered. I gazed around the conference room with a satisfied smile, even though it still had many vacant seats. Is this everyone? Asked Sevi as he glanced around the room. His elbows were almost lined up with his shoulders, a consequence of sitting at a table tailored for people like the captain who were absurdly tall. Even I found the table big. Adding the purchase of a new set of tables and chairs to my mental checklist, I continued, I intend on choosing one or two more members in the upcoming recruit examination. Until then Sevi and Sister Julieta will proceed with the early stages of training. Once every member is accounted for, we'll begin exploring dungeons. At this, both newbies gulped nervously and I had to suppress a laugh over their cuteness. I plan on having the special unit consist of three existing core members and four rookies. The idea is to have the existing members provide minimal support while focusing on the growth of the new ones, I explained. I dare say you'll all have to push yourselves a little harder than you think necessary once we're in the dungeons. August then raised a hand and as soon as I nodded in permission, he asked, who will be chosen from among the existing members. Reverend August, me, and for the last member, I think an experienced melee attacker would be good. Oh, I have someone in mind, of course. That person couldn't attend today due to some circumstances. Do you, Vice Captain, also count as an existing member? I suppose that as far as everyone was concerned, I was a rookie too. 
With my low level and little known experience, it couldn't be helped. Nevertheless, at times of such doubt, there was a magic word that could solve everything so I calmly answered, naturally. That's how I made my report to the captain as well. He didn't say much. It wasn't surprising that anything was acceptable in the dark night so long as one had Mayor Knox's approval. August seemed like he had a bunch of things he wanted to say, but in the end, he kept his thoughts to himself. And so, the short-term growth special unit was formed and I began instructing the rookies. I started with Sevi, who seemed skeptical about his abilities despite his unfaltering belief in me. He gazed at his hand in confusion and asked, I have a talent for magic. You'll awaken as a mage in no time if you do as I say, I assured him. Of course, you won't be able to use magic in dungeons right away. You need to spend a long period getting used to it. I'll do anything to become a mage. I can complete any training, no matter how difficult it is. I could even stand in a fire if you tell me to. As he didn't have the potential for fire magic in the first place, I hastily pulled in the reins on the boy who was bursting with too much motivation. No, I won't be asking such dangerous training of you. Meanwhile, August gazed at us with twitching brows. He seemed doubtful as to whether Sevi truly had latent magical powers, and it was understandable. The ordinary humans of this world possessed magic resistance in other words, they were incapable of sensing mana. An extreme few, however, were exceptionally sensitive to certain elements of mana, and this minority were those who had the makings of an elemental mage. It was, in a way, like an allergic reaction. The way an ordinary person acquired magical powers was similar to how one would get an allergy. Continuous exposure to an element one was sensitive to resulted in the production of antibodies against that element, triggering an immune response. That immune response was what enabled the accumulation of mana and casting of magic. Unfortunately, just like with allergies, there was a problem to this it was terribly difficult to tell which of the many elements an individual was sensitive to. One could try exposing oneself to the correct element. But there was no way of knowing which was correct there were many stories so many that it was hard to specify one of people approaching fire to have a shot at becoming a flame mage only to end up burning to death. But all of that had nothing to do with me since I had a way of checking a person's latent magic element. I took the fired up, motivated Sevi to another place so he could begin training. H hang on, vice captain. He stammered. You said there'd be no dangerous training. And there won't be, I promise you. Not dangerous at all. I'll tie you up nice and tight, I replied soothingly. Then I took Sevi to the top of the castle spire, the highest place in Noctentoria Castle. Chapter, 59 With a mountain at our backs, the wind was even fiercer than usual, an ideal location to acquire the wind element. A blast of air whipped past my cheeks as if nature was screaming at my ears. My body swayed against my will, but I paid it no mind and continued to tightly bind Sevi to the spire. Because he was smaller than me, he could be blown away if I didn't bind him firmly. Even I was unsteady on my feet. Sevi peeked down the spire and immediately raised his head in fright, eyes shut. I'll TTR try, try to endure. He cried out with an audible tremor in his voice. Attaboy. I nodded at him. TTH then. H how long do I H have to stay like this? Till sunset today. I smiled. Don't worry, I'll free you before dinner. Oh oh okay Sevi nodded obediently, sniffling. For a moment, I wondered if these conditions were too harsh for a child, but I soon recovered my conviction. I had to take that very child into a dungeon it was better to bring him up with an iron hand as it would increase his chances of survival. Pretending to leave him behind, I hid by the side to keep an eye on him. It didn't take long for the crying to stop, replaced by yells of self-encouragement. I can do it, I can do it. I'm gonna be a mage. I'm gonna grow stronger. I sighed in relief at Sevi's steadfast attitude. Then August, who had been observing from a distance, approached me. It appears that you are certain that Brother Sevi will awaken to the wind element, sister. I wouldn't make him do something like that without assurance, I said and August stared at me in silence. I gave him an ambiguous smile, tapping the side of my eyes as I added, I have good eyes, you see. In the past, I would have never shown my capability in such a way, 
but I've since then realized it was pointless to hide it. Meyer's acknowledgement alone wasn't enough to sustain me leading the others as a support mage. I needed presence not something vague, but something special, outstanding. Either way, perhaps I was being too unrealistic August still seemed unconvinced. Then, sister, do you mean to say that you are capable of knowing every blessing granted by St. Marianne? He inquired. I nodded. With a condition, yes. I could confirm the statuses of any Dark Knights members through the party window, but for non-members, I had to check in person. Even so, this ability was far too overpowered to be called a condition. August made the sign of the cross as he sent me an amazed look. As expected all is according to St. Marianne's design. Who would have known such an ability hid within a support mage? The parameters and status windows were actually a feature of the system and not of support magic, but I didn't see the need to reveal the details. It was still power within God's domain, after all, so August was likely to bother me if he ever learned the truth. Well I laughed and decided to answer in a way I knew he would like. It must be St. Marianne's mercy of not letting me starve to death just because of what I am. As a humble servant of the goddess, I am moved to tears that you value her mercy, sister. His attitude was somewhat surprising why was he so trusting when Sevi had yet to awaken to wind magic. I had predicted that he'd acknowledge me only after I showed results but I supposed that since things were going well, then that was good and didn't give that more thought. Reverend August, could I ask you to look after Sevi for a bit? I'll be back shortly after checking up on Julieta. As you will. I left the boy under August's care and went over to Julieta. It was about time for the buff I gave her to expire. Compared to Sevi, the acolyte was much easier to deal with. All I had to do was give her a mace and make her hit a dummy. Of course, I didn't just make her do it, I also cast a support spell on her named Path to Weapon Mastery that helped the target quickly grow familiar with weapons. Increases the speed at which the specified target's weapon proficiency rises by 10%. The spell stacked up to three times as well. Higher proficiency in a weapon made it easier to wield, while the buildup of proficiency in advance allowed for the best level efficiency. Unfortunately, weapon proficiency and spell rank only increased outside of dungeons, but levels could be raised by using rich experience and going on raids anyway. As Julieta went ham at a dummy, whacking away, I watched in satisfaction. With how red her face looked, I could tell she was embarrassed at having an audience, but she must have still worked hard without resting. Her proficiency had largely increased. The heck? Isn't that a nun's habit? A passerby asked. Why is a nun here smacking a dummy? I hear she's with the special unit, another replied. What? Seriously? An acolyte should be praying in a prayer room to hone their holy power. What's she beating up a dummy for? That special unit, are they really okay? I can never understand the thing support mages do. Some core members muttered among themselves, glancing at Julieta as they passed by. They didn't dare to talk loud enough to be heard by her, however the veritable mountain of wrecked dummies by the side restrained their tongues. Great power made for smoother sailing indeed and on that thought, I smiled happily and cast an additional buff for Julieta. Chapter, 60 The ceremony for the recruits that I had been waiting for was happening at last. Although my presence wasn't obligatory, I still had to participate, being the vice-captain and all that. Still, I was relieved enough for not needing to give a speech this time so I put on my uniform and headed for the castle lobby. Despite moving with haste, I was distracted enough that I managed to arrive later than Mayor, my superior. Today, instead of his uniform, the captain wore a set of pitch-black armor that was also the symbolic trademark of the Dark Knights. Perhaps that was why he always wore it during official occasions. I scrambled over to Mayor and bowed in apology. I'm sorry for being late. Long time no see, June Carantia. You have been absent for quite a while thanks to the recruits, I can finally have a look at that elusive face of yours, he replied in a pointed tone. He didn't seem genuinely angry though, which showed that he was half sullen and half joking. The best thing to do at this point was to ignore and overlook this, but Mayer was my superior. I snuck behind him and gave my excuse. I'm sorry, I was a little busy working with the special unit. It is not something you need to apologize for. 
So I hear you have been spending your days with two of your unit members. Even so, could you not have given a direct report regarding the progress of their training? It is so difficult to meet you really, you only ever come looking for me when there is some business to talk about. Ha <laughs> how could I waste your time like that when I know you're quite busy yourself, Captain? Did I not say it is fine for you to visit me any time? He replied. We walked through the lobby as we chatted and I noticed the funny looks people gave us. It was like they were seeing something bizarre, like a horse walking on two feet and talking then I realized that chatting like this with any ordinary superior would come off as being quite favored, and Mayer was anything but ordinary. The captain was a strong, strict man who was the object of everyone's admiration. He never joked, giving off the impression of perfection, which was enough to give anyone a sense of distance. Mayer wasn't the type to easily permit others to grow closer, to begin with. He was a flawless iron man who had never so much as complained before, yet a moment ago he had grumbled fretfully. No one among those who had heard his grumble could believe what they just heard. The rumors of me being Meyer's lover would probably intensify, but I seemed to be the only one bothered about this. The man in question continued to walk onward without showing the slightest hint of concern. Seconds later, though, he suddenly turned back to ask, Why are you walking so far behind? You should keep right by my side. You are my vice captain, are you not? I was deliberately keeping a distance from him to prevent the rumors from snowballing even further. However, before I could come up with an excuse, the captain reached out and pulled me toward him with his large paw. I could already see the gossiping worsening. I understood that Mayer had acted out of frustration without giving it much thought, but the result was as I had expected, our surroundings becoming noisier with people even more confused. I swore to myself that no matter what rumors occurred between me and Mayer in the future, I would accept it all with humble composure. It wasn't until we left the lobby and reached the speech podium that Mayer let go of my hand. To my knowledge, his sudden behavior wasn't out of romantic interest like the others thought. That didn't mean it was out of intimacy or trust, though. I was convinced he was still just as suspicious of me as he was when we drank together and he showed his feelings. This man was merely pretending to trust me. Perhaps he was even aware that I didn't believe in his trust. This was all just a show. A show that was no different from how he deliberately took me around the castle when I arrived here. After all, Mayer had to solidify my position as vice captain to smoothen the road to defeating the demon lord. But I could not help grumbling inwardly because he was acting so out of character, he incessantly created weird misunderstandings. Given that Mayer had never looked after somebody so kindly in his life, it was only natural that everyone was overreacting so much. My guess was that he had never cared about who followed behind him until now. While I was busy grumbling about Meyer's excessive political act, the recruit ceremony began. Chapter, 61 All the people I had expected to pass the recruitment test were here, including Nova Ferrum. Among the rookies, he stood out in particular. I had worried whether I would have to wait long for him to join us, but fortunately, he also participated in the test. That was good, because I was thinking of taking care of him anyway. The concerning part was that Nova was the only one among the rookies worth picking for the special unit. My original plan had accounted for picking two recruits. Although Nova had taken one spot, filling the other was the problem there was no one better than him, or even at least a level lower in terms of competence. Normally, a team consisted of seven members due to the entry limit of a dungeon. The limit of people who could enter a dungeon could vary depending on the size and difficulty, but the minimum was seven. As someone in a position of leadership, I was driven by the need to fill out all the spots. I briefly brooded over whether I should take one more rookie and fill the seventh spot or try my hand with six people and save on precious experience. It didn't take me long to figure it out. Life was a challenge. Although clearing dungeons with six people would be a bit tight, I decided to trust the talents I had chosen. After all, we had August even if we fought to the death, we wouldn't die. That priest's presence certainly made me inclined to manhandle the special unit. Decision cemented, I visited Mayer after the new recruitment ceremony was over. I have a request to make. I knew it. You never come to me unless it is on business, he teased. He could have stopped the friendly act since there was no one around to see, yet he still persisted. 
Perhaps he intended on fooling even me, and the truly scary thing was that I really might be fooled at this rate the special treatment of a power holder was as sweet as liquor and just as intoxicating. I shook my head, chanting inwardly that I should get a hold of myself. My relationship with the captain was already great as it was, boss and subordinate, collaborators to the greater good. Becoming closer than this would only end up cutting away at my flesh. If I crossed the line, I would only get my hopes up and I knew how pointless that was. There was no need to think very far as to why being cast aside by Fabian was proof. Strongly binding my will, I neither confirmed nor denied Meyer's statement and cut his jesting off. I'll be taking Nova into the special unit. Nova. He frowned. I handed over Nova Ferrum's transfer application form and personnel evaluation paper that I had already prepared. Of course, I knew the captain would remember Nora even without these documents since the latter was a talent that had joined his elite team during the first playthrough. Nova would certainly grow strong enough on his own, but he would do so much faster with my help. There was more than one reason for Mayer not to refuse my request, yet he sported an odd look that made me wonder if he was dissatisfied. I cautiously repeated, yes, Nova Ferrum. Is there a problem? He remained silent, so I continued. Is there a problem I don't know about? Perhaps you already have a use for him? No, I do not. His reply was curt but he still didn't comment on what was making him so displeased. Alarmed, I tried to guess his feelings, he could be disgruntled that I was snagging the next generation's ace for myself. Nova was the super rookie of the recent batch of recruits anyone could see his outstanding talent. Taking him into my unit and making him stronger wouldn't have a very dramatic effect on his strength. Was the captain mistaking my intentions as trying to take it easy? I rushed to give him an excuse. Sure, Nova is talented and diligent, so he'd bring good results even if left alone. But with a little help, he'll be able to level up a little faster and... I abruptly stopped speaking. Somehow, my talking only served to deepen the crease between Meyer's brows. After a moment of silence, a sigh slipped from his lips and he said, Right. Then do as you will. Despite his words, his face told me to do the opposite. I couldn't fathom why he was so disapproving of Nova, but before I could ask, he suddenly asked, you must have been quite close with Nova in the first playthrough, yes? Did you and Nova not often stick together back then as well? Chapter, 62 The unexpected line of questioning had me so bewildered, I lost my mental barriers. How, no, why in the heck did he know about that? My meetings with Nova in the past were carried out with utter caution and feigned coincidences, or so I had thought. I had leaked information from Meyer's assassination so I couldn't afford to be found out by the Dark Knights. Regardless of my intentions, I was ultimately handing over dungeon information, so I couldn't be found out by Fabian Corps either. Fortunately, Nova had kept it secret as per my request, but it seemed everything was useless before Meyer. Then again, he did look up to his captain. Even if I was like a sister to him, he wouldn't remain completely silent should Mayer ask for the source of the information he was giving. Didn't this mean that Mayer had known everything about me trying to assassinate him through Nova? The mere thought sent goosebumps all over my skin. I debated whether to just be open and ask but I couldn't bring myself to do that I feared what his response might be. If he didn't know about the assassination attempt, I'd just be asking for trouble. If he had known all along, I'd be in trouble anyway. My heart raced wildly, giving me the delusion that it would bolt out of my throat. Meanwhile, the cause of my stress continued speaking with a serious face. There is nothing bad about being close. But do not forget to maintain objectivity, June Carantia. Pardon. I stared at him, confused. I am advising you since you insist on taking Nova. Was I imagining things or was he trying to warn me against being too friendly with Nova? Honestly, I do not wish for you to take Nova into your unit, he added with a sigh. It would be troubling if you were to break. Break? His words were too sudden. I laughed, feeling a mixture of confusion and disbelief, but Meyer's face was solemn. If Nova were to die because of a decision made by myself or you what then? But that would never for a moment, I was rendered speechless. It was something I had never considered before. Smiling bitterly, Mayer continued, no one can be certain of what will happen inside a dungeon. 
Pausing, he intertwined his long, knuckled fingers tightly. I have been keeping silent since there was no one close with you in the first playthrough until now, but this seems to be the right time to tell you. Draw a line between you and everyone else this naturally includes Nova, Sevi, that acolyte, and August. The members of the core are only parts that exist for the sake of overthrowing the demon lord. I was greatly shocked by his words, and my heart raced for a different reason now. Thank you for your concern, but I won't break because of something like that, I replied with an awkward laugh. While it's not something to compare with you, Captain, but I've got quite the experience in expeditions myself. I'm fully capable of enduring loss. Better not to suffer than to endure. Experiencing misfortune at twice does not make it any good. There is no getting used to it. You only grow ever worn, ever torn. Their deaths will hit you harder than you think, he said, sighing. It is different from the first playthrough. You will be buried by your brooding. If they lived longer in the first playthrough, you'll wonder if it was your fault that they died like this in the second. You speak like someone who's been through it already. Instead of replying, Mayer only grinned at me. He showed his usual confidence and dignified bearing, but I felt like I glimpsed the grim past he had experienced beneath that mask. It was only then I realized why there was such a disparity in Meyer's reputation in the first and second playthrough. Back then, Mayer was a majestic superior and hero, someone who knew how to mingle in moderation, someone who could afford to be considerate of others whatever he was like inside. That was the sort of person Mayer was, according to what I learned through Nova and other people. In the present, however looking at how shocked people got whenever he took care of something for me, it was obvious that he had deliberately distanced himself from the core members. As a result, while he was still the strongest man who possessed that hard-to-approach air of dignity, he had also become something of a freak that was hard to grow close to. It was understandable. I knew the final future of this world, but unlike me, he must have felt like he was being swept along by a furious storm. Not to mention, my position was strictly speaking a bystander, whereas he was a key figure in the story. The weight he was burdened with was surely much heavier than what I was shouldering incomparably so. I had started the second playthrough just before meeting Mayer, but he must have started much earlier than that. I could guess what had happened during that time without even asking. Chapter, 63 I stared at Mayer, his golden eyes wavering like the swaying candlelight on the walls. I sensed that the man was considerably anxious as if he was being chased by something. Although he appeared composed on the outside, he still couldn't prevent glimpses of his emotions from appearing. He could be advising me out of camaraderie as a fellow time leaper, intending to prevent me from going through the same pain as he had. However, it was also possible that he thought of me as one of those components he mentioned earlier, therefore he couldn't afford to have me break. The mere notion made me chortle. Even when speaking of parts, some were valuable and some could be replaced any time. I knew that to Mayer, I was a valuable part that would help in dungeon raids, but in the end, I was still just a part. While this knowledge made me uncomfortable, my heart felt clearer now that I was sure of his thoughts. It was better than being a useless cog to be thrown away. Don't worry, I replied lightly. I'm far stronger than you think, Captain. I won't break easily. But I feel I should ask you, you are keeping a proper line with me, right? Mayer blinked slowly. Me? With you? Didn't you say you can never be sure of anything that'll happen inside a dungeon? I asked with a smile. That has nothing to do with you. I have no intention of letting you die, he retorted. That is why I assigned August to you, to begin with. You are. I cut him off. A necessary talent to slay the demon lord. I know. My tongue itched, but I refrained from switching the word talent to part. Meanwhile, even though he wanted to refute what I just said, Mayer only managed to move his lips silently as if at a loss for words. Do you remember what I said on the day I was appointed vice-captain? I continued. My goal is to lead the Dark Knights to victory in the battle against the demon lord. Naturally. I stared Mayer in the eye. I was serious. I really won't spare the means or the methods. If I was thinking of gathering close acquaintances and taking the easy, safe way, I wouldn't have made a special unit in the first place. Although I was grateful that he regarded me highly, 
that didn't mean I wanted to be treated like a fragile flower in a greenhouse. This was something I had to firmly go over for the sake of the future. And I'm rear line support, to begin with. I'm used to helplessly watching expedition members die. Even if people are worn out by the deaths of others, they'll still have their convictions in their hearts. The conviction to live on in this world, no matter how dirty and wretched it may be. Surprised, Mayer stared at me wide-eyed. Perhaps I was the first person to ever talk back to him like this, and the thought was somewhat pleasing. What is your conviction, Captain? I asked. To slay the demon lord. Yes. So long as you have that conviction, we can still live on, worn out or not. Live on worn out or not Mayor quietly echoed my words before sighing deeply. He rubbed at his face, self-mocking laughter slipping through his large hands. I have been speaking presumptuously. It appears you are stronger in mind than I am. Weak stamina doesn't equal weak mentality. Besides, a support mage needs a winning spirit to get by. It makes me far more generous to myself than you, Captain. I think it'd be best if you learned how to be a little more lenient with yourself. It was obvious from his attitude that he was too strict with himself. He was trying to become an iron man by taking every burden by himself and not showing his suffering to anyone else. I thought that to himself, even he was just another part of the grand scheme, a cogwheel fueled by rage and the will to defeat the demon lord. I wondered why Mayer hated the demon lord so much. Considering the wicked acts committed by the demon lord, yes, it was natural to feel fury. But Meyer's obsessive hatred seemed to derive from something a little more personal. However, I couldn't bring myself to ask that far. Maybe if I had a chance later on, I'd try. For now, feeling somewhat bitter, I silently patted Meyer's hand as that was the most I could do for the present. The captain gazed at my hand for a long time. He simply remained still, not pushing away or taking hold of my hand. It wasn't long before Nova was assigned to the special unit. With this, I had August, Sevi, Julieta, and Nova. The special unit was fully assembled except for one regular member I wanted to take with us. Nova looked just like a model student, and that happened to be exactly his nature, the diligent type, a good listener. He gave a polite greeting with a bow. It's an honor to have been chosen for the special unit. I look forward to working together, Vice Captain. His big eyes shone brightly, reminding me of the time I first met him. Is there a seat for me? Yes. Yes. Make yourself comfortable. Ha, huh, looks like you're from Fabian Corps. They seem to be doing well these days. As you can see, I'm from the Dark Knights. That's amazing for someone your age. Ah, uh, shucks, it's not that amazing. Nova looked much younger and naive in the present. Stuck in reminiscence, I ended up staring at him a bit too long. A uh, V-Vice Captain. Nova became restless, his face reddening from my fixed stare. I blurted out an excuse. Oh, sorry. You reminded me of someone I know. It must be someone really similar to me. Maybe your younger sibling. Yeah. Truth be told, Nova wasn't similar at all to my half-brother Eugen, but there was no need to go on the details. I glossed over it with a nod, but once I did, Nova's expression immediately became bright and he immediately began gushing. No wonder. You're really similar to my big sister too. I got a real shock when I first saw you, Vice Captain. He seemed unusually excited today. Was it because this was his first team assignment? Now, now, how about we introduce ourselves? Rookie, you start. Hello, I'm Nova Ferrum. I'm 18 years old, and I specialize in shields and axes. I applied as a defender. I'm lacking in many aspects, so I hope for lots of guidance from now on. His self-introduction was indeed becoming of a model student, lively and spirited. Chapter, 64 Next up was Julieta, who had joined the Dark Knights right before Nova. It showed that she couldn't help her nature despite her destructive mace skills, as she cautiously began, I'm Julieta Klawa. I'm 21 I used to be an acolyte but thanks to the vice captain choosing me, I joined the Dark Knights and have been undergoing melee training since a few weeks ago. I don't know what help I'll serve, but I'll do my best. 
I'm Sevi Ventus. It's been a year since I've joined the Corps. I may be young, but you can trust my skills. I originally joined as an archer, but I've recently awakened as a wind mage. Sevi's confidence was understandable as he had awakened his magical potential in mere weeks. Now that he had unlocked his mana, Sevi's hair was slowly turning green starting from the tips and it would turn completely green once his mana strengthened. The training he went through must have been hard to endure, but he bore through it all silently without complaint. I patted the boy on the head, proud of him, and he smiled happily. For some reason then, though, he gave the side eye to Nova. Was the rascal already vying to become second in command? Sevi was young but clever. Considering how he had benefited the most from sticking by me, whether it be gaining his newfound power or having his life saved, it wasn't hard to understand why he didn't want to lose my favor. The desire for victory and competitive spirit were good foundations for growth deeming it a good thing, I patted Sevi on the head a couple more times. Volume. One end. Now that the recruits had finished, it was August's turn as a regular member to introduce himself. With the four same solemn face as always, he began speaking in a low tone akin to someone confessing. I am August Divinitas, the highest priest of the Dark Knights. My role is to keep your lives intact, brothers and sisters. There will be no deaths in my presence as such, I hope everyone will commit themselves to the training with no worry. The atmosphere turned chilly within an instant. Today was everyone's first meeting. How could he talk like that? making it obvious that they would roll in the dirt to death. Although they wouldn't be dying. Unsurprisingly, the faces of the three rookies stiffened. I was certain none of those joining the Dark Knights lacked the resolve to go through hard training, but in the end, they were children. Sure, the carrot and stick method was more efficient than giving a scare in getting them used to training, just like slow cooking a frog in a pot. But now that they were so nervous already I sighed. Was he intentionally messing with my plans, or was he just clueless? By the look on his face, it was clearly the latter. I hastily introduced myself to fan the atmosphere. Is it my turn now? I'm June Carantia, the vice-captain of the Dark Knights. I had always kept a respectful manner of speech with everyone except for young Seva but now I was officially the vice-captain and had a team of my own. It was necessary to stop doing that, if only for the sake of efficiency. I cleared my throat and continued in a firm voice, as you all know, I'm a support mage, the one who'll be making you all strong. From now on, everyone will grow stronger at an unimaginable speed and join the elite ranks of the Dark Knights. They all gulped at the mention of elite ranks. It was admittedly best to dangle an actual reward before their very eyes. The target period to making that happen is six months at the most. Holy! Julieta and Nova gasped in disbelief. From what I know, it takes three years getting promoted to the second core alone, Sevi commented and nodded as if it was totally possible. In Sevi's mind, I was an amazing person who turned him into a mage with but several weeks of training. The truth was that the time of his awakening had been close at the time and I had only given a tiny bit of help but no one knew that. I nodded with a face as solemn as August's the priest seemed to notice that I was mimicking him as his forehead gained another wrinkle. I'll do my best. Work us to the point of not dying, please. I don't like de dying, but I'll try hard. Nova, Sevi, and even the timid Julieta showed determination in their eyes. Was it because they were kids in their teens? There was a naive and straightforward side to their reactions. Maybe that was why Meyer's words cut even deeper into my heart. Their deaths will hit you harder than you think, he had said, sighing. It is different from the first playthrough. Honestly, I had bluffed in front of Mayer. I talked as if I was experienced, I had never had a core member die because of my decision. I had never been handed such responsibility before, in the first place. All I did was stay by the sides of people at their last breath. It was natural for Mayer to be serious regarding the deaths of comrades as he was a man who carried a sense of responsibility. Nevertheless, I still didn't think that he had the right idea. Drawing lines didn't solve anything by itself. If one was to take responsibility, then they better do it right. I took a deep breath, in and out. The lives of these people were already in my hands therefore, I just had to keep them from dying. 
I had to make them so strong that they wouldn't die from most things. Turn them into men and women worthy of being the last seven heroes to join the final raid. Chapter, 65 With Sevi, Julieta, and Nova added to my plate, I was busy every day. If anything, Sevi's awakening as a mage was a relief. He no longer needed to go back and forth between the training grounds and the castle spire. The boy was ready to learn spells. Meanwhile, Julieta could move on to sparring and I thought it would be fine to pit her against Nova. I constantly pondered on ways to develop the special unit, even while I moved through corridors. Because of that, I sometimes ended up going the wrong way, such as now. I clicked my tongue, annoyed. Darn I got on the wrong floor. I considered going back the way I came and drew a rough mental sketch of the castle structure. I deemed it faster to keep going straight and down the stairs. I suppose I'll memorize the castle structure while I'm at it, I murmured jokingly as I began moving. That was me taking Noctentoria Castle too lightly and it showed soon enough. According to my thoughts, I should have come across a staircase, but I was going somewhere completely different. Is it because I'm in the main castle? The structure is twisted like a maze. It must have been designed to prevent assassination attempts. Considering how hard a time I was having as a pathfinder, its complexity wasn't hard to guess at. At this point, I had wandered enough yet I stubbornly refused to go back. I came this far, I might as well keep going to the end. Voices of people came from outside the windows, yet the inside of the building was quiet as the dead. The sunlight shining through the windows illuminated exactly half of the hallways. I walked the border between darkness and light, heart thumping with adventure. As I walked through the corridors, I didn't come across a single person. It was truly odd, considering how many servants and dark knights worked in the castle. Had I set foot in a place I should not have. But if such a place existed, Mayor, the butler, or even Mary would have warned me. I paused for a moment, numerous thoughts flitting through my mind. That was when I saw a slightly open door before me. Believing it to be the exit, I opened it in delight. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a room that was completely closed on all sides. There was a small window high up, through which a sliver of light dimly lit the place. I looked around with a frown. The lack of proper sunlight made the room dark, and I assumed it was intentional to preserve the paintings hung on the wall. Apparently, it wasn't enough to satisfy the owner of this room there was a curtain over those paintings. My eyes were drawn to the largest painting in the center. The end of it was visible because the curtain wasn't properly hung. What kind of painting was it to be so strictly cared for? I felt as if I had discovered a hidden treasure chest at the end of a long adventure. Curiosity welled in my chest. For a brief moment, I struggled with my conscience, but I thought, wouldn't it be fine to take just a peek? I quietly flipped the curtain and it's a portrait, I murmured out loud. It was a picture of a handsome man with silver-gray hair in a uniform, a lady with light brown hair, and a young boy with black hair who looked about five years old. Based on hair color alone, they didn't look like a family, but the face of the boy resembled the other two a lot. And the face of the silver-gray-haired man was familiar. He looked just like Mayor Knox. In hindsight, I should have expected a portrait of the Knox family in Noctentoria Castle. This man was likely the previous Grand Duke, Meyer's father. Then the dark-haired boy had to be Mayor Knox. I stared at the boy in the painting, marveling at this unexpected meeting with a young Mayor Knox. He looked so stern at such a young age what a heavy aura. With a giggle, I shifted my gaze up. The moment my eyes reached the previous Grand Duke and Duchess, I gaped. Staring blankly at the painting, dazed, I realized something. Neither of the two had black hair, but young Meyer's face resembled them. His hair color was genetically impossible, and that left only one answer. Meyer's black hair was due to his mana. It was evident that the mana of the demon lord he possessed had turned his hair black. I didn't notice that all black was one of the common hair colors. Who's there? A hostile, elderly voice called out from behind me. I panicked and turned around, letting go of the curtain. Butler Vince stood by the door, glaring until he recognized me. Vice Captain. His face eased up a bit, but he didn't let his guard down. This room is off limits, Vice Captain. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I didn't mean to come here. I just got lost. The excuse slipped off my tongue like someone who was caught doing something bad. My heart raced I had broken the taboo of seeing something I shouldn't have. Butler Vince walked over wearing an unreadable expression. I timidly stood still as he smoothed down the curtain over the portrait and murmured, I went away for a moment in the middle of cleaning the dust and did not expect a visitor to come by during that time. My lack of caution is to fault. I, I didn't know this place was off limits. I should have informed you beforehand, but this old man guessed His Excellency would have mentioned it. He did not tell you anything, I presume. The butler gently inquired. Then perhaps His Excellency hoped for you to come here someday. I didn't think the captain wanted me to face the truth so quickly, though. I let out a sigh, feeling perplexed, and Vince glanced at me. It appears you have seen the portrait. Yes, I admit it. And it also seems you have realized His Excellency's secret, he continued and I nodded again, more cautiously this time. I wasn't foolish enough to not know that I had seen something I shouldn't. Blinking his wrinkled eyes as if he couldn't understand my reaction, Vince added, Do you not feel afraid? Huh? Of what? I couldn't help but ask. What reason was there to feel afraid? Was Mayor going to get angry that I entered an off-limits area? Of His Excellency's hair that is to say, the identity of his manna. Chapter, 66 Only then did I realize how this world perceived demonic power. Just as faith in Saint Marianne awakened the holy element and opened the path to priesthood, demonic power was only bestowed to demon kin. In other words, it was proof of being tainted by the demon lord. It wouldn't be strange to be struck with fear when you discovered that the captain you trusted and followed possessed demonic power. However, I already knew about that. What shocked me was learning that the captain's hair wasn't originally black. I had believed that Mayer would never understand the feeling of being judged by hair color, but I was wrong. To think that his hair was the mark, the brand of the demon lord that he carried since birth I sighed and shook my head. Because there's no reason to be afraid. Is that so? Yes. The captain is someone very important to me. Someone that couldn't be replaced by anyone else. There's no way something like that would make me fear him. I explained to Vince in a strong tone to alleviate his concern. When the butler grew wide-eyed, I realized that my words were extremely suggestive. I made it sound as if Mayer was my precious, uh, special no, I was talking in terms of ability. What I meant was, uh, I hurriedly tried to correct myself, but it was too late. I was afraid. Vince began speaking hesitantly as if beginning a confession. I couldn't bring myself to cut him off to try and make an excuse. No, all of Noctentoria Castle feared His Excellency. All except for my wife. Your wife. She was His Excellency's nanny. Even the Duke's mother, the former Grand Duchess, avoided him. My wife had lost our child at the time and so she came to rear him. Was this okay for me to hear? I felt it was far too private for me to know. Deciding that I had nosed in deeply enough, I shook my head rigidly and said, I don't know if it's okay for me to know this. If it is you, Vice Captain, I think it will be fine. It is something you must know. The butler insisted. I'm not so sure about that. Will the Captain truly want me to know the truth? The past was perhaps Meyer's sole weakness. Not to mention, he had yet to reveal to me that he possessed demonic power. This had to be his sore spot so it was right to approach the matter with utmost caution. Vince seemed to think otherwise, though, as he desperately clung to the subject. I am sure His Excellency will be averse to you learning about this. He is, after all, a man of strong pride who refuses to show weakness. However, I still want you to know, Vice Captain. Why? Because you are the only one His Excellency trusts and relies on. Well, that's my mouth went dry. Trusted and relied on. That was all just pretense. I fought the urge to tell Vince that he was firmly mistaken. Unaware of my feelings, the butler continued, His Excellency shared a glass of drink with you alone, did he not? He is not one to let people get so close. Mayor Knox, you rock of a man. Just how much were you distancing yourself from others? How could I have become the most dependable person just because I drank some wine together with you? 
Shouldn't this be the moment where I'm begged to keep a secret? Never did I hear of being begged to know a secret. Besides, you are the only one who thinks of the Duke the way you do. Despite finding out that His Excellency has the same power as the demons, you do not mind in the least. Your strong conviction and faith give you the right to know about his past. Vince explained. That was something he had completely misunderstood. I didn't mind at all because I already knew, but I could not tell him this. I made one wrong statement and ended up being mistaken as Mayor Knox's loyal follower. For a minute, I reminded myself over and over of the saying weigh your words before speaking. While I was biting my lips, distressed by this bewildering situation, Vince let out a deep, remorseful sigh. I am old now and do not know when I will leave this world. And yet, I am the only one left who knows what His Excellency went through. I am certain that the Duke will never speak about it and shall continue to live while harboring that pain alone do you not think it too sorrowful? I ask of you, Vice Captain. Could you please take over this old man's memory? Again, I don't know if someone who suddenly joined the Dark Knights several months ago should receive that precious memory. I tried to persuade Vince the best I could. The captain and I could fall apart later, and I could use the past you tell me to threaten him. You never know what'll happen. What is it that makes you believe in me? That would simply mean that I was mistaken in my old age. But, in my experience, those who would act as you suggested are usually prone to prying in on secrets. Vince stared at me and his gaze seemed to ask if I really would do such a thing. Besides, there would be nothing better to threaten him with than the fact that the captain possesses demonic power, which you already know about. I gave up. Since he wanted to tell me so much then okay. Outdone by Vince's stubbornness, I sighed and held up my hands in defeat. All right, but it's not my fault if His Excellency gets angry later. This old man will take full responsibility, Vince promised, nodding resolutely. He then took a moment to steady his breath and began recounting the past with a faraway look in his eyes. Chapter, 67 Mayor Knox was black-haired from birth. Between the silvery-gray locks of the Duke and the light brown waves of the Duchess, it was an impossible hair color to give birth to. No one in the family tree had black hair either. The Grand Duke Knox and the people close to him were confused by the unprecedented situation. Isn't it possible that the Grand Duchess was unfaithful? She is not the kind of person to do such a thing. Moreover, the young master perfectly resembles His Excellency. That is preposterous speculation. Then that means his hair color has changed there's only one answer then. The young master must have been born with awakened manna. The Grand Duke, who had been listening to his vassals discuss, asked gravely, then you are saying that my heir is a mage? The vassal who had explained nodded heavily. Yes. However only Felspawn have black mana. Felspawn. Are you suggesting that the air is a monster? That is impossible. The Felspawn have disappeared since the Sacred War. This must be a curse of the demon lord. Heresy. Noise filled the Grand Duke's office as unease set in and spread like wildfire. After a long while, Grand Duke Knox made a decision. We will confine the child and hold a period of observation. No one is to speak of this sinister matter. And thus, the newborn mayor was confined to the castle spire. His mother, the Grand Duchess, grew to loathe mayor for drawing doubt to her chastity. She felt chilled by the thought of having birthed a suspected monster. After sending her child to the spire, she never went to meet him. As a result, the majority of Noctentoria's residents believed that the Grand Duchess' child was stillborn and that Mayer was an illegitimate child. A bastard would hardly be viewed well upon, even if he was of the Grand Duke's blood. If it wasn't for Meyer's nanny Yonada, he would have been left to indifferent neglect Ion. While everyone else shunned the child, Yonada raised him as if he were the child that she had lost. Mayor Knox lived in confinement for nearly ten years. If anything, he was fortunate that he was the sole child of the Grand Duke. Because of it, he could receive an heir's education. Growing up in an enclosed space, Mayer absorbed all the knowledge given to him and produced superior results. Literature, politics, arithmetic. But all his efforts were in vain. Grand Duke Knox suspected whether Meyer's outstanding achievements derived from the sinister abilities of Felspawn and was unwilling to give him due credit. 
And that wasn't all. Fearing that demonic energies would leak outside despite having locked Mayer in the castle spire, Grand Duke Knox donated a large sum to the church and built a huge monastery in his province. Then, he gathered priests and acolytes to fill his lands with the grace of St. Marianne. Yet that wasn't enough. He made Mayer pray six hours a day without fail, believing it would purify the demonic power in him. When no one desired to get involved with the young heir, his nanny Yanata alone gave him great praise and caressed his hair, consoling him. Everyone's acting like that because they don't know what a kind person you are, young master, but they'll find out later for sure. Young Mayor nodded and replied, I don't care, so long as you're by my side, Nan. When I become Grand Duke later, I'll definitely repay this favor. Favor? I'm the one who should be repaying you. You don't know just how happy I am to spend time like this together, young master. But even those small, fleeting moments of peace disappeared when Mayor turned Tenyanata died from an infectious disease. The vassals who knew the truth about Mayor whispered that her death was his fault. It's all because she touched that accursed hair. Yanata must have been cursed as well. Yanata's husband, Vince, climbed up the castle spire after his wife's funeral. Even as she lay on her deathbed, Yanata worried for Mayor. Look after him look after the young master, honey, she had implored him and Vince wasn't capable of refusing his wife's last words. Thus, the butler reached the top of the castle spire only to find young Mayor sitting expressionlessly, cutting his hair without hesitation. What are you doing, young master? Vince cried out, rushing to stop the child. The boy's hair already sported a jagged cut, his scalp grazed by the scissor blades and welling with blood. Why? Mayor asked in confusion. Why? You are bleeding. You must not do something like this. You must cherish your... Vince trailed off then, at a loss. He didn't know how to calm Mayor down. The boy stared at the butler, who saw himself reflected in the boy's golden eyes and felt as if he was being seen through. Mayor asked again in an unmistakably clear voice. Why? Even though Yanata died, cursed because of my hair. Chapter, 68 No. That is wrong. Vince shouted. The butler didn't think Yanata died because of Mayor. His wife was merely unlucky. Even so, he couldn't bring himself to reach for Meyer's hair. The best he could do was to hastily take the scissors away from the boy and look after his injuries. Through all this, he avoided physical contact. Mayer appeared to understand Vince's feelings as he didn't say a thing. Since then, Vince had carried on his wife's will and took care of the boy but that was all. The butler could neither replace Yanata nor was he shameless enough to try. Eventually, Mayer completely closed off his heart. From that point onward, the boy disliked coming in contact with anyone. He especially feared anyone touching his hair. Time passed until he turned thirteen. On a day like any other, a strange dimensional distortion occurred in the dukedom of Knox. It was the first dungeon, which began to spit out monsters. The abrupt phenomenon took everyone by surprise. The Dark Knights spared no effort to defeat the monsters that escaped the dungeon. And yet, there were severe civilian casualties. The dungeon was a sign of the demon lord's arrival unto the world, a sign of the second sacred war in a thousand years. Grand Duke Knox believed with all his being that it was all because of Mayer. No sooner had he received a report of the dungeon opening, he had climbed the castle spire in a craze. You accursed thing! He howled to his son. You summoned the demon lord. I should have killed you as soon as you were born. Your Excellency the Grand Duke. You mustn't. Vince tried to stop the Grand Duke, but the other man was faster. He drew his sword and swung down toward Mayer but at that moment, mana burst from the boy's body. The threat to his safety and unstable mind lead to his magic powers going berserk. Garg. Meyer's mana was dark, sinister, and violent. The demonic power consumed Grand Duke Knox, desiccating his body at a tremendous speed. The sight of him bereft of vitality was like death itself. The boy was appalled by what he saw happen before his very eyes. Although he had only met the Grand Duke a few times since birth, the man was still his father. Mayer stared in a daze, shocked at his parents' attempted murder and the man's death because of him. 
What? The Grand Duke. The Grand Duchess staggered, on the verge of fainting, at the news of the Grand Duke's death. In a frenzy, she blamed everything on Mayer. A son killing his father. What a monster. Clearly, he is behind the dungeon opening. Throw him inside of it. He opened it, so he should be the one to close it. Dear Grand Duchess, I beg you to calm down. The young master is the only heir of the Knox family. Vince pleaded for mercy, trembling, but the Grand Duchess wanted none of it. Overcome by disgust and hatred for Mayer, she shrieked, him, the heir of Knox. That is a minion of the demon lord. Men. Cast that vile fell spawn into the dungeon. The vassals aware of Meyer's secret insisted on following the Grand Duchess order. However, some rose to take the boy's side the loyal blade of the Knox family, the Dark Knights. They cried out that they couldn't drive the sole heir of Knox to his death. Your Grace, please calm down. How could the young master have killed His Excellency? He has never even held a sword properly before. He cannot possibly be the murderer. Do the Dark Knights intend on supporting that vile killer? Where on earth have your loyalty and honor gone to? The Grand Duchess screamed at them, incensed. The monsters from the dungeon gate are wandering the castle. His Excellency's death was nothing but an unfortunate accident brought by them. The Dark Knights were unaware of the demonic power in their young master. They believed that the Grand Duchess was using her husband's death to get rid of the illegitimate child, Mayor, for being an eyesore. Because of this, the castle of Noctentoria was overturned in confusion. Amidst that chaos, Mayor stood up. Vince rather hoped for the boy to cry and beg, to win some sympathy at the least but the boy's penetrating golden eyes weren't like those of a young thirteen-year-old. They contained an understanding of all the fetters and sins he was bound to and charged with. I shall obey the command of the Grand Duchess, young Mayor Knox said. His voice that had only entered puberty sounded like scraping iron. Young Master. Vince cried out in sorrow, but Mayor had already made up his mind. With no hesitation, he rushed straight toward the dungeon. No one believed that he would come back out alive, not even Vince, but the boy proved them all wrong. Just as the Dark Knights were about to enter the dungeon to close it, the entry gate warped. Mayer, covered in blood, escaped from it seconds later. Not long after his appearance, the entrance closed, and the closure of a dungeon was proof of a hero. Chapter, 69 The people of Knox and the Dark Knights were thrilled. To them, Mayor Knox was no longer an illegitimate child of the Grand Duke. He was a ray of hope in the darkness that had suddenly unfolded upon them. The Dark Knights greet the 50th Grand Duke of Knox. May endless glory shine upon the champion's successor. As the people praised Mayer and bowed before him, public opinion was completely turned around. Him, the 50th Grand Duke of Knox. Ha, ha, ha. The Grand Duchess laughed in disbelief at the news of Mayer returning alive and well. Your Grace, please give permission. Ha 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 ha. The Grand Duchess lost her mind. Judged to be incapable of rational thought, she was soon confined to a room. And so Mayer became Grand Duke Knox. Succeeding the family title at a young age, his first order was to deal with the vassals who were under his late father. There was little protest from the others as reason was on his side they had forced Mayer into the dungeon. Thus, the boy got rid of every single person who knew of the secret behind his hair except for Vince. The Grand Duchess cries of Mayer being a monster were dismissed as nonsense born from the grief of losing her husband. Incarcerated under the guise of recuperation, she became ill. Within a few years, she passed away. Mayer ceaselessly closed dungeons ever since his succession as if it was the only way to attain recognition. As the number of dungeon gates closed by Mayer increased, the secret of his birth and suspicion of his father's murder faded. Gradually, those were replaced by voices of praise. Fifteen years passed, and Mayer had become a madman who would burn everything to close dungeons. He had escaped from the castle spire he was confined to in his childhood, but he was still held captive by the dungeons. Vince's recounting ended, and silence fell in the dim room. I hadn't wanted to find out about Mayor Knox's childhood in this way. No, I wished I was kept in the dark for my entire life, 
all the more so because of how miserable his past was. I recalled how, on the day Mayer and I drank wine together, he had overreacted about his hair. Was it not that he disliked me touching, but that he still believed his hair to inflict a curse? What ridiculous nonsense! Hair color was only influenced by mana and didn't possess any power by itself. Getting cursed for touching his hair was unfeasible. There was no way Mayer didn't know this. Then again knowing didn't make it any easier to believe. I wet my dry lips. Meyer's unimaginable past was far too heavy for me to bear alone. At the same time, it was much too tragic for me to ignore. I could finally understand somewhat why Mayer was so obsessed with closing dungeons. I would have been the same in his shoes. Who could imagine such a life? The only way to gain recognition was a journey to get rid of what had plunged one's life into the pit of despair. How could I not be captivated? Vince was silent for a long while before he pointed at the portrait. Do you know how this portrait came to be? Upon closer inspection, it was strange. The former Grand Duke and Grand Duchess wouldn't have had a portrait painted together with Mayer, whom they were so averse to. Vince gave a bitter smile as he caressed the curtain and continued, no matter how much the previous lord and lady rejected his excellency, the Grand Duke carries the blood of Knox. His existence couldn't be erased, which was why he needed to have a portrait as a nobleman however, they did not want to stay in the same space as his excellency. What bull was that? My feelings had apparently shown on my face as the butler laughed as if he too thought it absurd. That is why the previous lord and lady had their portrait painted. Then, they later had his excellency's image added on top. I frowned, unable to comprehend what meaning there was to this empty formality. Who the heck had a family portrait painted like this? Even in the 21st century, people would dress up to have their family picture taken in a photo studio. They didn't photoshop it together. Shame on them. But this wasn't enough to speak for all the low discrimination of the late Grand Duke and Grand Duchess. An inconceivable truth had remained to be told. Even then, they did not wish to show His Excellency in front of the painter, Vince went on. They gave a childhood portrait of the previous Grand Duke for the painter to refer to and ordered only the hair color changed. I'm amazed that the captain is still leaving this portrait intact. I would have burned it long ago. Chapter, 70 Vince nodded in agreement. Few would understand why Mayer would leave something like this behind. But I think that His Excellency feels this portrait is his original sin. He seems to believe it to be the symbol of an impurity that can never be washed away, to begin with, he explained. That made it even worse. I failed to keep my expression from twisting as Vince continued. He had it placed in a restricted area and, very occasionally, comes to see it. This old man can only guess this to be His Excellency's penance. I didn't know what Mayor Knox had to repent for. I felt sick inside and I couldn't keep the sarcasm from my voice. I never knew the captain also had talent in self-injury, I murmured. Perhaps this side of you is why the captain keeps you close. Why was it about me all of a sudden? I stared at Vince with knitted brows, but he didn't mind my pointed gaze. A faraway look took over the old butler's cloudy brown eyes as if looking back into the past. Everyone either feared, hated, or revered the young master. Nobody treated him like an ordinary person. He was not able to even receive the love of a parent that others do and that is why His Excellency built a wall around himself. But you are the only exception, Vice Captain. I wondered about that. The reason I looked like I was treating Mayor Knox normally was that I knew the worst possible future. Compared to that, this revelation of his wasn't anything much. To me, Mayor Knox was akin to a nuclear bomb. He was a necessary and powerful card, the misuse of which could bring a result that was just as deadly. Now though I had to admit, he was a somewhat pitiful nuke. Suddenly, Vince cried out, please. He sounded desperate. Had he caught on to my wavering feelings? The old man's small shoulders hunched in on themselves as he bowed, showing hair that had faded with age. If only out of compassion for His Excellency's past, I ask of you, please. Continue to stand by his side. Well so long as he doesn't abandon me, I'll keep serving him until the moment we defeat the Demon Lord. Don't worry too much, I replied in a jesting tone. 
Vince's stiff face refused to ease up and he expressed concern for Mayer again. When this old man leaves this world, his excellency will truly end up alone no. It cannot be said that I ever looked after him in the first place. It would not be an exaggeration to say he has been alone all this time. He may be moving forward now, fueled by his powerful conviction and his goal, but it would not be strange for him to fall apart at any moment, like a boat lost in the vast ocean. The butler wished for me to show Mayor favor and hospitality, but he was asking the wrong person. Me. Look out for Mayor Knox. I wasn't in a position to feel pity for Meyer's past, and even if I did, that would be like a mouse worrying for a tiger. I put on a troubled smile as I tried to persuade him. I understand your worries, but the captain's conviction isn't something so easily broken. If only for the sake of slaying the demon lord, he won't. What I fear most is what will happen after he fulfills his conviction. I felt dazed at what the butler pointed out. Mayer would do his best to survive, close dungeons, and move forward until the demon lord was defeated. But what about after? What would he do then? It wasn't difficult to imagine that Meyer's lack of attachment to life would lead to him completely expending himself in the battle against the demon lord, like a moth to a flame. I could see the man falling together with the demon lord. It was clear that Vince's recount of Meyer's past and his weakness was to explain just what little the man had and how easily he could throw his life away and it worked. I had come to understand that Mayor Knox was very likely to burn himself out. Could you please promise me this, Vice Captain? After His Excellency battles the Demon Lord. Vince took a deep breath as if pained by the very thought of what could happen, his aged eyes trembling. Would you take His Excellency out from that dungeon, no matter what end he meets? His words were ambiguous. I thought about the endings Mayor Knox could meet. Perhaps he would lose all four of his limbs, or become a felspawn from loss of mana control or even die, leaving nothing but a corpse. I could see in Vince's eyes that he had considered all those possibilities. Whether Mayer became a cripple, a monster, or a corpse, the butler didn't want to leave him forever in the prison called a dungeon and I could empathize with that. Vince was entrusting me with the role of the labyrinth's thread that would guide Mayer back to this world. This thread was thin, fragile, and could break at any moment. Nevertheless, it was the only one the butler found, and he was grateful for it. I nodded, deciding to accept the role of that fragile spider's thread. Okay. I swear I'll come back with the captain, even if I have to drag him by the collar. Only then did Vince breathe a sigh of relief and smile widely. It was my first time seeing a curve on the old man's lips. It reminded me of my father, the one I had before becoming June. On the day I learned about Meyer's past, I fell behind during work due to being absent-minded all day. Uh, vice-captain? Oh, sorry. Did the support spell end? I'll cast it again. Not that I was curious about something. I get that when facing large fell spawn, you should mainly aim for their ankles or hamstrings, but what do I do when there's a swarm of small monsters? Julieta asked timidly. I hadn't even noticed she was asking a question as I was completely zoning out. I sighed, feeling frustrated with myself, as I shook my head. I'm really sorry. I must be out of it. After somehow managing to get through training, I returned to my room with heavy footsteps, feeling suffocated. I was feeling more uncomfortable now than when I was listening to Vince talk about Meyer's past. The memory refused to get out of my head. I tried to think of positive things to change my mood. I had been wondering how to start a conversation about Meyer's demonic power, anyway. Vince would report what happened today to the captain, and he would know that I had found out his secret. One way or another, we would end up discussing his demonic power. That was good. Then I'd wait until Mayer spoke about it first. Wait until he settled his anger and regained his rational mind. I had no intention of going to him first to confront his boiling ire. And the moment I was waiting for arrived before long. Vice Captain, His Excellency is looking for you. The time wasn't too late with the sun still high up. It was much too early to be telling secrets, but I guessed Mayer chose this time on purpose. Talking secrets at night while drinking would only make it easier to get emotional, after all. And thus, I went straight over to Mayer. 
For some reason today, the collar of my vice captain uniform felt tight. As I arrived at the captain's office, I nervously wondered how Mayer would begin the talk. My worries were in vain, though, as the captain threw a fastball. I heard Vince chattered about my past to you. I stiffened, his swift jab giving me no time to manage my expression. It seemed he didn't want to get over the situation smoothly. Of course, it was a sensitive subject, but Mayer was taking it far harder than I had anticipated. The dark shadows underneath his eyes were telling of his emotions. Still, his self-control was apparent from the way he didn't raise his voice. Instead, he enunciated each word quietly. I responded with a heavy nod instead of giving an excuse. Yes. So what do you think? Pardon? I frowned at the unexpected question, while Mayer cackled. His mirth was void of composure, sounding somewhat anxious. In a self-mocking tone, he muttered, Well, you must have felt something. Pity, fear, or anger from being deceived by me. Pity, I could feel. Fear too. But what did he mean by anger from being deceived? I didn't have a clue. You must have joined the Dark Knights because you deemed it possible that I could slay the Demon Lord. But now you know that the foundation of my power is demonic it would not be wrong to say you were deceived. Aha! That. This had to be why he looked somewhat anxious instead of being angry that I had learned his secret. Anxious that I might leave. Chapter, 71 he worried I might leave, which would decrease the probability of defeating the demon lord. I couldn't help but feel moved every time Mayer appraised me so highly. What was the answer he wanted? No matter how I rolled the cogs in my head, it seemed difficult to fool him. Even more so because he was serious about this matter. That being the case, I decided to be truthful. Well I don't particularly think that I've been deceived, and I'm not afraid either. I do feel some pity, however, which is only natural and expected of a human being so let's pass over that. For a moment, I wondered if I was being overly frank, but the words were already out of my mouth. I thought I may as well keep on going. If I had to say something, I guess it's that I'm pleased. Pleased? Are you making fun of me now? For the first time, Mayer raised his voice, thinking that I was being sarcastic. He glared at me with intense eyes, gritting his teeth. Facing his bared hostility for the first time made my skin prickle. My legs almost gave out on me, but I clenched my jaw and endured as I had to put on my best mask of composure. I met his furious, twisted face and explained, yes. Thanks to learning that your excellency possesses demonic power, I've come up with a more effective plan to take down the demon lord. How could I not be pleased? What a piece of work you are mayor laughed, incredulous, his lips twitching with a sneer. If your intent was to mollify me, I would like to tell you it was very effective. I could see the glee that he couldn't hide beneath his sardonic tone my words were right to his liking. The fury in his eyes died down and I could finally feel some slight relief. It was still too early to relax, however, as Mayer leaned toward me with a glint in his eyes. So you are saying you wish to work for me despite knowing that I possess demonic power? I told you. Thanks to your power, Captain, I've thought up a better plan for defeating the Demon Lord. Mayer blinked in surprise. He seemed to have thought I was spouting empty words. His brows twitched in suspicion, showing complete disbelief. You are telling me to believe that? Is there any reason not to? None, Mayer sighed. He sunk back on his chair and cast a bitter look across his desk, looking mentally exhausted. Fine then. Let us hear how my power will be effective in defeating the demon lord. Not a hint of trust could be found in his voice. Perhaps he feared getting his hopes up for nothing. I didn't think I could convince him with a couple of words. Mouth dry from nervousness, I had to wet my lips before speaking. Your mana will most likely not affect the demon lord, captain, due to having the same dark element. To put it more precisely, this was because Meyer's power originated from the Demon Lord. I didn't feel the need to explain this, though, since it was something I knew as a player of this game. Fair enough, he acquiesced. But I have no intention of using mana in the battle against the Demon Lord, to begin with. I am a swordsman, after all. But it's difficult to kill the Demon Lord with swordsmanship alone. 
physical attacks don't work well. You may as well consider it impossible. Mayer fell silent. He must have known this all along, yet his eyes were afire with emotion. Perhaps he had been subconsciously denying this fact. Mayer Knox was the strongest swordsman, but the demon lord was the ultimate evil. Strength alone wouldn't be enough to slay him. After a long moment of quiet, Mayer nodded and said, I am sure you are right since you have faced the demon lord in person. Yes. So you have to somehow learn a magical means of attack, Captain. Did you not say my mana is ineffective against the demon lord? I have an element conversion spell. Element conversion? He echoed. Yes. It's a spell that inverts the element of mana. It can change your dark element mana to the holy element. Are you joking? Mayer asked in astonishment. His reaction was understandable. Changing somebody's mana element? It was plausible, yes, when thinking from the perspective of a gamer. When going by the logic of this world instead, it was unbelievable. I was certain he had never even dreamed of such a possibility. I don't joke about my abilities, I replied confidently. I cannot believe you, to tell the truth. Ordinary support mages aren't capable of casting the spell. I'm probably the only one who can. And it was true. I was a specialist in support magic. Specialists naturally possessed great ability in their respective fields. Element conversion magic wasn't easy to use, though. Even in the first playthrough, I only managed to obtain the spell after reaching level 60. Mayer appeared exhilarated at my capability, his golden eyes shining bright as he remarked, Choosing you was the biggest fortune of my life. Chapter, 72 I thought so too. If Mayer hadn't decided to have me join the Dark Knights, he would have had no choice but to become the second demon lord. If it were me in the past, I wouldn't have cared for how he ended up. But now, having spent time with Mayer and coming to know of his past even, I didn't feel comfortable with the thought. If I hadn't take Meyer's side, I'd never have discovered his hidden past. I smiled wryly to myself. The worst had yet to happen, and wouldn't happen in the future to come. Yet the possibility of it alone created a sense of debt. I swallowed back those complicated feelings and comforted Mayer. So don't keep testing me. Don't think strange thoughts either. I understand. And listen well to what I say. I hear you. Now that he had confirmed that I had no intention of abandoning him, Mayer nodded obediently. His attitude was as docile as sheep but when I recalled the murderous pressure he cast on me when I entered his office, it only came off as detestable. Mayer pondered over my words for a minute, then frowned as if he had found a problem. By the way, if you are to use that element conversion spell, yes, you need to get used to using your demonic power, Captain. He didn't respond, so I added, do you feel hesitant? Mayer couldn't bring himself to nod or shake his head. He merely gazed down at his hands clasped together on his desk, revealing his feelings of anxiety. He confessed, frankly, I still feel surprised that you do not mind my demonic power in the least. I don't know about the regular members, but I'm sure the elites of our Dark Knights won't care much either. I wonder about that. Mayer trailed off, tone doubtful, then continued speaking in a bitter murmur. Normally, those with demonic power are viewed with cold eyes of repulsion. The elites of the Dark Knights will be no different. His eyes grew clouded as if recalling the past. He was most likely thinking of the time before dungeons appeared, back when he was suffering persecution. I hold no expectation that they will treat me as they did before, without any change, once they learn of my secret. I would be more than grateful if they merely kept the secret safe. I see you're skeptical about the trust of your comrades, I pointed out. I am not prone to being suspicious, but as far as demonic power is concerned, yes, I cannot help it. Even my parents rejected me. He said, and I couldn't argue against that statement. You are the only one who was entirely unaffected, he added. Mayer gazed at me in silence, his golden eyes filled with what looked like a passionate obsession. Until now, he had been very accommodating of my needs. Or, to be exact, he blatantly favored me over others. I thought this was not only because I was useful, but also because of the memories I had of the first playthrough. 
Only Mayer and I could share and relate to those. Thanks to this, I could become somebody inside Meyer's circle. Even so, there was a wall between us that was impassably thick and high. With today's conversation, I felt even that wall had weakened a little. Even if they do keep the secret, the chances of it leaking increases along with the number of people who know. That would be troublesome. Mayer talked as if he had never considered the possibility of me telling his secret to others. Spy of the Demon Lord, traitor of mankind all the Dark Knights will be treated as if we plan on joining hands with the Demon Lord and selling over the Empire. Perhaps things would be different after slaying the Demon Lord. Unfortunately, before we even fight him, nothing good will come of spreading such rumors. Therefore, it is better that fewer are aware. I agree with that, I nodded. Mayer frowned, seeming to find my reaction unexpected. So I mean to say, I think it will be difficult to use demonic power in a dungeon I am entering with others of the core. If I am to practice the use of this power I would have to enter a dungeon alone. He explained his thoughts. That won't do. It's too dangerous. I opposed his idea. I could understand his concern, but he was being ridiculous. I just have to choose an appropriate dungeon. One that I can clear by myself. What I'm worried about is your demonic power going out of control, Captain. If that happens in a dungeon with you by yourself, there'll be no one to help you. Worst case scenario, the dungeon gate will close and you'll be thrown into the demon realm, just like that. Then I will be able to meet the demon lord sooner. Mayor grinned broadly, making my face sour in equal proportion. This man had a death wish. Chapter, 73 I felt like I could understand what the butler Vince was concerned about. Clearly, what little survival instinct Mayor Knox still had diminished even further when it concerned the demon lord. I gave him a wide smile as I pointed out, have a good fight then, without me there to cast element conversion for you. You did hear that physical attacks don't work, right? I am sorry. I was jesting, Mayor apologized, noticing my ire. There was no reason to not accept his apology. Who was I to tell him what to do when he insisted on abusing himself? It was a wonder why it bothered me so much. I sighed and added, never joke like that again, please. It's unsettling, even when I do know you're not being serious. It is not a bad feeling to have you worry for me. He smiled. I wish you did feel a little bad, so you'd never say something like that again. Meyer's gaze was oddly warm despite my grumbling. He seemed to enjoy arguing like this. Did he have nothing else to enjoy? How emotionally deprived, really. Still, I couldn't bring myself to reproach him for that. He tapped his desk a couple of times, a habit that occurred whenever he was deep in thought. After a moment of silence, he asked, then how must I grow accustomed to using demonic power? Nobody can stop you if you go berserk, so I plan on making steady progress. Outside Dungeons if something were to go wrong outside dungeons would that not be dangerous? Meyer's face hardened, recalling the traumatic incident of losing control of his mana and killing the previous Grand Duke of Knox. I'll handle things so don't worry. You will be handling things. By that you mean. Of course you'll be practicing with me. It'll be dangerous by yourself, Captain. Meyer stared at me, wide-eyed. He barely held back from shouting in protest but he still couldn't stop himself from shooting to his feet. Realizing he was agitated, the captain slowly sat back down and tried his best to maintain composure as he asked, so you mean you and I, alone? Mayer continued hesitantly, in my opinion that also seems dangerous. I could understand his never-ending worries since, my capability aside, the matter was of great importance. I puffed out my chest and spoke with my head held high and voice confident. Don't worry too much. I'll do well so there'll be no problems to our surroundings. What I am concerned about is you, not our surroundings. If you were to end up dying. Mayer failed to contain his emotions and burst out yelling. I could only blink dumbly as I never considered that he was worrying for my life. Sure, I'd die in an instant if Mayer went completely berserk. But how could I claim to hold his leash without any guarantee? I laughed as I pointed out, you seem to think that I won't be able to stop you, Captain. Mayer answered with silence. Apparently, 
he thought speaking the truth would hurt my pride. Honestly, that would have been the case if it wasn't coming from Mayor Knox. I would have actually been more suspicious if he believed in me too. It's okay because I have divine devotion. Do you remember? It's the spell I cast on Whipra, I reminded him. I had no intention of using that spell on Mayor, of course. I'd have no mind to spare in using additional magic since I had to put my all to controlling his demonic power. But it was fine as long as Mayer didn't know so I gently persuaded him. Even so Meyer's face was still full of concern, but I persisted regardless. It's not like you can go telling someone else about your demonic power, no. You don't want that, Captain. That is true, but I would be troubled more if something were to happen to you. Trust in me. I told you that I'd make you stronger, Captain. Saying something like this to the strongest man of humanity was utter arrogance. It didn't matter, though, as I was a support mage. I was the weakest being out there, possessing not a single offensive spell. Yet, that was precisely why I was capable of tempering the strongest being into something even greater. This was the essence of why I liked June, and that hadn't changed even after becoming her. It was my pride and my dignity. I held my head tall as I stared at Mayer, but he still looked conflicted despite my words. Seeing how unsure he was, I realized I had to do something about it. This kind of situation was also within my expectations. Well since we're on the subject, how about we do it now? Right now? Here. Mayer was startled. Chapter, 74 Seeing the perplexion on his face, I became even more convinced that I shouldn't stand down on this. As the saying went, hit the iron while it's hot. This god-awfully boring scenario of persuading him would repeat itself if I held it off for later. I thought I may as well do it now. My eyes lit with determination as I said, yes. Right now. Here. In the end, Mayer lost against my firm stance. I expressed with my body that I wouldn't be budging a step until he accepted, and that made him sigh. So what must I do? Mm I looked about the office. Meyer's office resembled its owner's personality to A.T. Overbearing, stiff, and flawless it was faithful to the purpose of being an office without the tiniest hint of leisure to be found. It was too uncomfortable. I needed somewhere more relaxing. Reopening a mana circuit that had been closed for years was more painful and taxing than one would think. Considering the large amount of mana Mayer possessed, it would be even more painful. Navigating the sea was naturally harder than navigating a small stream. A single mistake would lead to his demonic power erupting everywhere like a collapsed dam. That was how the loss of mana control happened. Do you have anything scheduled after today? I asked. Nothing in particular. That's a relief since this'll take a bit long. How long? I'm not sure I think we'll have to proceed with the practice to tell. You've already lost control of your mana once, Captain, so it'll be easy for it to happen a second time. Since we have to take a more careful approach, it'll have to take a long time. Meyer's face twisted at the mention of losing control for the second time. It does not matter how long it takes, so take extra care. With his permission, I decided to be a bit bolder. All right. Then can I use your bedroom, Captain? Why the bedroom? Mayer showed a bit of reluctance. I supposed it was normal to dislike someone intruding on one's personal space all of a sudden. But it would be more comfortable going to his bedroom. I persuaded Mayer, won't it be more relaxing to lie on a bed instead of the floor? Must I lie down? You'll end up lying down even if you don't want to. I shrugged. And you might end up fainting from the pain I won't be able to do anything if you keel over like that, which is why I'm suggesting we start with you lying down. He still looked uncertain despite my explanation. Well, if he didn't want that if you don't like having to show your bedroom, you can come to mine instead. I didn't change my blanket after waking up today, but I trusted Mary to have taken care of that much. Mayer, though, shook his head, seeming to find my suggestion absurd. That is not what I meant, I he was lost for words for a long while before quietly muttering with a sigh, no wonder you were overly accepting of having a drink with me last time you truly, surprisingly lack a sense of danger at times. Pardon. It is nothing. I didn't hear him quite right, 
but Mayer merely shook his head and passed by me to take the lead, saying, the bedroom is this way. I didn't know what came over him, but I couldn't miss this opportunity. Although I did speak audaciously, that didn't mean I had no worries. If somebody were to spot Mayer going in and out of my bedroom, the rumors of me being his lover would be set in stone. I swiftly followed after him. Meyer's bedroom was identical to his office. Another place with an overbearing, stiff, and flawless atmosphere. Even his bedroom looked far from a place of relaxation and rest. Still, the bed was nice and huge. I assumed it was because he was such a big person. Mayer went in first to sit on the bed, which shook wildly due to his weight. He undid a couple of buttons on his collar as he asked, so what must I do now? He was sitting, and I was standing, yet our gazes were exactly level. The man was seriously big. I needed to prepare thoroughly as it was difficult for me to control the body of another. I instructed, lie down first. Mayer tentatively laid down on the bed. I didn't know whether it was because he wasn't used to laying down in front of somebody, or because he was uncomfortable with the situation. He wore an awkward, unwilling look on his face as he turned his head toward me. Chapter, 75 Wait a minute. I'll take out some holy water in advance first, and I trailed off and went to gather all the holy water in Meyer's room. It was a recovery potion of sorts, a necessity for any expedition member. In their case, a considerable amount was required. Not for healing, however it was to balance out the concentration of demonic and holy energy. Once I was done preparing, I approached Mayer, feeling like a doctor about to operate. This was my surgery, to perform I pulled a chair next to the bed and observed my patient with solemn determination. His manner was very still, and understandably so, it had been lying dormant for fifteen years. Good. I grasped Meyer's hand, so large that two of mine barely covered it, and began to gently transfer mana into his body. He stared at me working for a moment before remarking, you seem accustomed to this somehow. I told you to trust in me. I'm not new at this. Not new. I've unlocked the mana of quite a few people. For some reason, Mayer looked dissatisfied at those words. I was convinced then that he didn't believe me. Perhaps I needed to give him a concrete example this had to be why precedents were important in business. I smoothed out Sevi's mana path too. Surely you didn't expect that I'd volunteer for something this important without any experience. I said, giving him a more specific example from my experiences to reassure him. He didn't reply, so I continued. All you need to do, Captain, is to sit tight and trust. Mayer kept his silence. Judging by how his face wasn't easing up, he still seemed distrustful, but what of it? My mana had already entered his body and it was too late to stop. For an instant, his forehead twitched and he gripped my hands harder. He must have felt my mana moving into him the man sure did have good senses. Mayer exhaled deeply and slowly asked, that did you always proceed in a bedroom like this with the others? Incredulous, I asked, does that matter right now? His question was far too trivial and pointless in the current situation. Mayer shut his mouth, his eyes shaking. He was unable to speak the reason, or perhaps he was unaware of it himself. For him, it was the first time a woman had entered his bedroom, so I guessed he would mind about it. Could he be nervous, wondering whether I was up to no good? The man was almost a monk practicing chastity, was he not? I sighed. Mental stability was the first priority when it came to opening a mana circuit. To prove I had no strange ulterior motives at all, I talked to him in a somewhat tough voice. Captain. I'm only borrowing this place out of necessity. And that is why you waltz into the bedroom of other men like this? There were women too. That is not the point. Mayer raised his torso, appearing upset for some reason. His unusual behavior took me aback. Thinking that I should lay him down again first, I pressed down on his shoulders to put him back on the bed. Mayer obediently laid down again, but he kept his head raised to stare at me, clearly keen on saying more. You really are a piece of work. Are you nagging me now? I asked in disbelief. It was no wonder I was feeling nostalgic he was acting like my parents when they scolded me for breaking curfew. Mayer flinched at the word nagging and followed up his words in a somewhat placating tone. 
I do not mean to nag. I am worried. While I am aware you are acting out of goodwill, are you not making it easy to cause misunderstandings? So long as you don't misunderstand, Captain. Why me? Because you're the reason I'm staying in the dark nights. It'd be terrible if you get some misunderstanding and start avoiding me. As for the others, well it doesn't matter what they think, I answered disinterestedly. I was getting loads of misunderstandings from others already anyway. People always got the wrong idea about me when I was with Fabian too. Are you sure there was really nothing between you two? I scowled. What bull are you talking about? I was only explaining to ease any worries Mayer might have, yet he was jumping to conclusions again. I had to make things clear. I'm taking this opportunity to tell you that we're not in that kind of relationship between a man and woman. We're only comrades who join to defeat the demon lord. I won't misunderstand you acting unusual sometimes so I ask you, Captain, to not mind my actions too much. Chapter, 76 Judging by his silence, this was enough to tell him I had no funny ideas. A rather fine explanation or so I thought until Meyer's manna grew wilder than before. Anyone could tell he was displeased. Seeing him so hard to appease made me sigh. I then realized there was one big proposition that hadn't been addressed yet. Also, although I don't know what you're thinking, the people I open mana circuits for are normally around Sevi's age. Sevi's age? He echoed. You think it's common to unlock mana for grown-ups like you, Captain? Only then did Meyer's face ease up a little. I added in a grumbling tone, besides, adults don't entrust themselves to support mages like me. They prefer wind or ice mages. I hear they're good at catching the flow of magic or something. In the sense that mana is formed of lines, lightning mages are favored too. But of all the mages I have seen, you are the best when it comes to handling magic. I think the same. Any mage could open a mana circuit. Yet, since I could figure out the progress numerically, I was capable of a little more precise control. This was why I could affirm myself as the only one in Noctentoria Castle who could manage Meyer's explosive mana. Using Axion as an example, despite being the best mage of Noctentoria, he was far from precise. Truth be told, as someone overflowing with magical power, he likely did not need to bother honing his control skills. As we talked, my mana steadily widened his circuit, spreading throughout his body until it finally reached his core. It was time to start picking at his mana and pull it out through the circuits I had unblocked. It was the most difficult task. I murmured to Mayer, now, enough with the chatter it's going to be a bit hard on you. I can endure. I hope so. I grinned and pulled at Meyer's mana according to the pulse of his heartbeat, little by little. It wasn't an easy feat, somewhat like carrying a huge water tank on one shoulder. I had to control the flow of trickling water while withstanding its weight. It was like sculpting a tiny object while focusing on one's fingertips. The slightest mistake would end everything. It was a long, nerve-wracking moment where I forgot to even breathe. Cold sweat ran down my forehead. I wasn't the only one under stress. If I was the person carrying the water tank, Mayer was the tank itself. His body was burdened in equal proportion to his powerful and abundant mana. It wasn't a good feeling to experience one's blood vessels expanding and contracting indefinitely on their own. It was a different pain from feeling suffocated and short of breath. Even he wouldn't find it easy to endure. Mayer let out a low groan and, as time passed, his body began to twitch and twist. He looked strangled as he tried to clutch at his heart, but I hastily stopped him. You mustn't. Meyer's hand cut through the air to grab my shoulder instead. His grip was so strong that I felt a wrenching pain, akin to being squeezed by a presser. He pulled me and pinned me to the bed, and my vision turned over. Cag. I hurriedly checked if my hands were still joined with his as it would have been terrible if I had let go. Not only would my efforts so far have been vain, but his disordered mana would also lose its way and run amok. Thankfully, our hands were still linked and my mana maintained its connection as well. I sighed in relief. Ha, ha Mayer gasped for breath above me, his face twisted in pain. Golden eyes glazed over while his torso shook from his wild respiration. The hot breath touching my lips infected me with his fever. Darn. 
I couldn't afford to lose my head too. I did everything to keep hold of my rationality, but seconds later his body fell over mine. I couldn't prevent a grunt from coming out. At least he wasn't wearing armor. Meyer's condition was too serious to blame him for his carelessness. He buried his face in the bed with clenched teeth, sweating bullets. Didn't I tell him it'd be hard? I clicked my tongue and tried to get out from beneath him, but I couldn't make his 100 kilograms body budge no matter what I did. In the end, I had no choice but to ask him to move, even though he wasn't in his right mind. Uh, Captain? Cuff his clenched teeth ground against each other in an audible, ferocious manner. It was clear that he was swallowing back his pain and wasn't in a state to communicate. Chapter, 77 While I was expecting Mayer to feel pain to some extent, I didn't think he'd lose his senses like this. Was he intoxicated by the mana circulating in him after such long dormancy? Or was his mana recoiling because it was a product of demonic power? The latter case was more probable. Things were getting bad I had to feed him holy water and neutralize the demonic power inside his body. But, because he had dragged me onto the bed, I couldn't reach the holy water anymore. In the end, I had to wiggle my way out from beneath Mayor Knox. Captain, could you lie down this way? Yes, good boy. Mm -hmm. Good, this way don't let go of my hand now. I soothed the groggy mayor into Movingit was startling to find myself treating him like a child. To my luck, he didn't seem to be hearing my words properly. I didn't know whether it was a coincidence or if his mind was clear enough to understand me, but mayor turned to the side. Barely squeezing my torso out, I managed to snag a bottle of holy water. I had to stretch my arm as much as I could since my lower body was still being smothered by the captain. I opened the bottle and held it to Meyer's mouth. Here, captain. It'll feel a little better if you drink holy water. However, Meyer was barely capable of drinking. In fact, he couldn't even raise his head properly. Holy water trickled down from the corners of his mouth. With a click of my tongue, I propped his head up with difficulty. Every part of this man's body was heavy, even his head. It would have been perfect if I could open his mouth with one hand and pour in the potion with the other. Unfortunately, I had to keep one hand in contact with him to continue the mana exchange. I tried to feed him with one hand by leaning his head against my chest, but it wasn't easy. After doing this for a while, all I achieved was wasting holy water. It was obvious he hadn't drunk much from how his feverish eyes looked glazed and unfocused. This was my first time seeing Mayer so vulnerable, like the time when we drank wine together. The man was surprisingly unwary and I didn't know if this was because he truly trusted me. The thought of being the only one to see this side of the strongest man in the world was strangely moving. No. This is exactly the time I need to get a grip this guy's a patient, this guy's a patient I muttered to myself as if trying to self-hypnotize. I had to stop my idle thoughts about Mayer and be as rational as possible. The process of fixing Meyer's mana was extremely delicate. Even the slightest distraction would spell trouble. Ugh, seriously. I didn't want to do this. I scrunched my face into a grimace. If Meyer knew what I planned to do, he would have been more shocked and disgusted than me. Since he had lost his senses, he had no right to reject this. Wouldn't it have been nice if he had drunk it himself? With a sigh, I took a mouthful of holy water. There was one way in a situation like this. As Mayer gasped for breath, I put my lips against his and slowly poured in holy water to minimize the backlash. Our breaths entangled as the liquid flowed into his throat. Ugh. It did feel a bit wrong as it looked as if I was forcing a kiss on an unconscious person. But then I felt better once I started thinking of it as resuscitation. Surely he wouldn't come asking later why I did something like this, right? It might be better if he didn't remember. Worst case scenario, the holy water and demonic power would collide and backfire, but keeping a balance was my specialty. As was always the case with those who lacked mana capacity, I had a pride-worthy control over my mana, which came from living a frugal life. Once again, I took another mouthful of holy water and passed it over. The discomforting method aside, the water definitely did its job. Then, suddenly, Mayer pulled my head toward him. MPH. I garbled. 
If before he was taking holy water as a baby bird feeding, now he was like a beast with its fangs in a goat's throat. W8. I tried to push Mayer away in bewilderment, but as expected, I couldn't make him budge. I couldn't handle his weight when he was slack, so how could I stop him when he put his mind to it? Mayer still looked dazed and out of his mind. And yet, he seemed to have instinctively realized that the holy water I was giving would give him comfort. He desperately clung to me to ease his suffering. MPH Humph. It was nothing like CPR anymore. Although his actions derived from pure desperation, I was too shaken inside to dismiss it as such. I could smell iron from the man who was clinging to me. The sharp tang of armor, blade, and blood was so keen that it was chilling. Perhaps that was why I managed to barely keep a grip on myself, even as I was on the verge of losing it to the heat of the moment. What tear-deserving sense of responsibility I had, not shaking his hand off through it all. Time passed and, with the ingestion of holy water, Meyer's rough breathing gradually subsided. His grip on me, so tight as if hanging on to a lifeline, likewise eased. Chapter, 78 Ha finally, his lips fell away from mine and I was able to take a big breath in. I felt so foolish for declaring that we weren't in a romantic relationship a while ago. I could still feel the heat of Meyer's lips pressed against mine, like a burning mark. Mana, Meyer's mana, I muttered, hastily checking on Mayer. His demonic power was naturally spreading throughout his body. Ever since his first loss of control, it had been tightly sealed, but now it was as if it had always been there from the start. Being able to finish the treatment without him going berserk was already a success. I could finally let go of the tension in my heart. Of course, there was an unexpected accident in the process, but that wasn't very important. To be more precise, it was within the range of what I could forget. Or rather, gloss over. Mayer stared at me, his eyes still unfocused. He likely didn't remember that we kissed. If that was the case, what happened today could be forgotten as a perfect crime. Good. Let's just think of it as having kissed a dog, I mused out loud. A dog's tongue could slip into one's mouth when kissing it, couldn't it? Done hypnotizing myself into thinking it was no big deal, I chortled. When I looked out the window of the bedroom, I got surprised. The sun was setting before I knew it. Had it been about three hours? It was a relief to have finished before it grew completely dark. Although I did have to keep watching over Mayer, I felt it was fine to let go of his hand. That was exactly what I did after several long hours of holding. We had been so desperate that our hands were covered in a cold sweat. From whose hand it came from, I bet neither of us knew. There was even a mark on my hand in the shape of Meyer's hand, a symbol of how much pain he had suffered. This was going to bruise, along with my shoulders. Wherever Mayer had clutched me, it ached. I didn't need to take off my clothes to know that my shoulder was bruised black and blue. I thought I may as well drink some holy water and checked if there was any remaining but I had used up all of it while trying to feed Mayer. Every bottle I checked was empty. I grabbed the last bottle I could find and tilted it, but only a single drop came out. The holy water Mayer dribbled would have been more than enough to heal my bruise. I clicked my tongue in discontent. Still, it was no big problem since I could ask August to heal me later. Until then, it wouldn't be particularly hard to endure the pain. A bruise was nothing. In any case, Mayer fell right asleep, unable to handle the fatigue. Perhaps he had fainted outright. Yeah, it'd be less painful to stay knocked out. I gazed at the sleeping mayor. His hair, usually smoothed back, had fallen over the thick lashes covering his golden eyes in a disheveled mess. In that instant, I found myself reaching out a hand to smooth his hair back, and his dark hair ran past my fingertips. This is nothing to be bothered over I muttered. Mayor Knox was still constricted by the ridiculous jinx of his hair cursing people from his childhood. I could vividly recall the moment he shook off my hand from touching his hair. I had casually passed over the bewildered remorse on his face at the time. To be honest, it wasn't a matter I needed to be so concerned over. Regardless of Mayor Knox's past, the issue of his demonic power and element conversion was solved. Thus, my goal was achieved. All I had to do was to encourage Mayor into training, defeat the demon lord and bring him back to keep my promise with Vince. 
we'd save the world and everything would be just perfect. But, for some reason, even though everything was going as I wished, my heart was shaking and I couldn't figure out why. I had thought I'd feel better as long as Meyer's demonic power was solved, but the result was the exact opposite. I ended up growing more concerned, more entangled. It wasn't only because of the kiss, it was something from a little earlier than that. Yes, from the moment I came to know more about Mayer. Understanding someone was like giving them one's heart in equal proportion. As a gamer who played from Fabian's perspective, I felt a deep intimacy toward Fabian before we even met. That was because I knew so much about him, knew how and why he would make his decisions. Now I have come to understand Mayer. I couldn't help but compare the man's actions to the information I had about him. Would it have been better if I didn't know about him? No. It was different from my time with Fabian. Things wouldn't go the way they did then. I stood with my back against the setting sunlight and, for a long time, gazed at Mayer from the side. I remained still until the light faded into shadows. That dying light was like seeing my future. Chapter, 79 How are you feeling? I asked Mayer, who was slowly getting up. He suddenly looked my way, startled. Had he not expected me to still be here? In a low, hoarse voice, he asked, you stayed. I had to watch until you stabilized, all right. It was almost dawn. Considering how we had started in broad daylight, I guessed it had taken almost twelve hours. I was able to face him more rationally than I thought. Maybe it was thanks to running a mental simulation on how I would treat Mayer while he was out cold. How do you feel? Not bad. I feel refreshed, in fact, he said. Getting up from the chair near the bed, I walked over to survey Meyer's mana circuit. I felt his hand stiffen for a second when I grabbed it, but I pretended not to notice. It's fine if you don't feel bad. Looks like the mana has properly melted in. You can feel it, right? Mayer clenched and opened his hands a few times. I deliberately draw out a thin thread of mana for him, but it seemed enough for Mayer as a deep smile appeared on his lips. I owe you. I'll keep it on your tab. Now, it's late so I think I'll be going now. I attempted to leave at once, but just as I was about to turn away, Mayer grabbed my arm. Unlike the time he had clung to me in desperation while twisting in pain, his grip was cautious. I looked at him, puzzled. Is there anything else? I Mayer hesitated, unable to continue. Oddly enough, he seemed embarrassed. It couldn't be that he remembered our lips touching, right? Despite my efforts to suppress it, my heart began to race again as if set on fire. Mayer failed to find the words to say for a long while. Did I happen to do anything wrong to you? Wrong? I echoed, confused. It is shameful to say, but I do not remember anything that happened in the middle. Fortunately, Mayer seemed to have no memory of what happened. That was so reassuring that I secretly let out a big sigh of relief. Yet, somehow, Mayer seemed to take my brief silence of relief as affirmation. His complexion worsened. Was I violent, or? No, there was nothing like that. Don't worry about it. I wasn't being completely honest, of course, but I figured it was best to give him a white lie. Mayer would probably panic and start banging his head against a stone wall if I revealed it. I was the one who pressed my lips against his, to begin with. Mayer didn't seem to trust my words though, as he persisted in asking me if he did anything wrong. He seemed very suspicious of what he could have done during the blank period in his memory. It was obvious things would become tiring if he ever spotted the bruise on my hand. He would say something about how he had been against doing it with only the two of us from the start and so on the very thought of it was frustrating. I pulled down my sleeve to hide the bruise and put my hand behind my back as I said, in any case, rest well. We'll have to expand the circuit again once your mana settles. Again. Mayer frowned, and I supposed he had reason to feel bothered. For example, it was annoying to have to go to the dentist many times, what with how painful it was. The pain that came with unblocking a mana circuit could only be worse I understood his reaction. Once your circuit has settled enough and is capable of drawing enough mana to cast spells, you'll be able to do it yourself, Captain. For the time being, however, I have to continue helping. 
What a burden I am being, he murmured. Not at all. Then I will be going now. Ah, uh, yes. I have been keeping you too long. As soon as Mayer let go of my arm, I gave an awkward smile and almost fled from his bedroom. I was lucky to not have come across any servants on the way. Woe is me, needing to scarp her back unnoticed after all that hardship but what could be done about it. The matter wasn't something to go public with. If there was no helping it, then it was better to get used to it. I let out a small sigh. I must have been very tired as I woke up later than usual the next day. If it wasn't for Mary, I would have woken up in the middle of the day. Vice Captain, you must wake up what happened to your hand. Mary was startled at the sight of my bruise. Rubbing my eyes after waking up, I eyed my throbbing hand and saw it was black and blue. My shoulder looked just as bad too, and I had seen that one coming. But that was not all I was bruised on every spot that I made contact with Mayer as if I had some rock accident. You didn't happen to fall out the window yesterday, did you? I mumbled an excuse, mm I do think I hit the bedpost hard while asleep. I did feel a bit of throbbing while I was falling asleep, but I didn't expect it to be this terrible. I wondered how Mayer managed his daily life, like shaking hands with someone. Was he always controlling his strength? That alone struck me as having an uncomfortable life. Considering how my current situation was a product of him forgetting to control his strength while unconscious, I could see why Mayer felt so unsettled at the idea of being alone with me. Shall I call for Reverend August? The professional Mary came up with a speedy and sensible solution. I felt it a bit embarrassing to call the priest into my bedroom, though. Better that I go find August instead. No, I'll just act. I tried to get up, but a piercing pain shot through my body as if I'd been in a car accident. I didn't know how I knew what that felt like, but that didn't matter right now. Tears welled in my eyes before I knew it and, in the end, I had no choice but to make a request of Mary. Please do that for me, then. Mary left with quick steps and before long, she was back with August in tow. Truly quick. Meanwhile, I had forced my trembling arms to put on my clothes, barely managing to avoid greeting August from the bed. Cold sweat covered my body due to the sharp pain, but that was easy enough to hide. I adopted a placid smile and met August in the office. Good morning, Reverend. The sun is already high in the sky, August pointed out, looking displeased. I understood his mood. As a high-ranking priest, to come and go for a personal matter was a stretch of authority, even if the one asking was the vice-captain. You did not attend the morning meeting either. It's not enough you woke up in the middle of the day, you are calling me to your private roulette. What in the world happened? As August was firing off words, he happened to catch sight of my hand. He strode over with creased brows. I explained lamely, I bumped against the bedposts while sleeping. August fixed his narrowed eyes on me, the disbelief in them very obvious. You must have a violent sleep posture. If you were to sleep in a dungeon, not a single monster would dare to even come close. I think I discovered another talent in me. I passed over the sarcasm in his voice. August sighed then touched my bruised hand and chanted a spell. Healing touch. Light spread from his palm and enveloped my bruise. Soon enough, it disappeared taking my injury along with it. I held out another part of me that was hurt as I expressed pure admiration. Wow. Works like a charm every time I see it. Oh, here too. August silently healed me. And here as well, I added, pointing at another spot. Is there any part of you that is fine? My face, I suppose. I smiled, but the atmosphere only turned colder. August scowled before smoothing his expression as he healed my body. Despite the numerous injuries, it didn't take long to treat them all. After fixing me up in mere moments, he advised me. From now on, I recommend that you sleep with your limbs bound, he said stiffly, tone almost cold. Overkill was the state of your body a minute ago, sister. August clicked his tongue and I could feel his evaluation of me drop a notch lower. That day, I had to listen to the priests nagging non-stop. My mouth itched to retaliate, but it wasn't like I could reveal what had happened with Mayer. I harbored dark thoughts as I endured August's lecturing. 
I vowed to make the captain pay for this day. Chapter, 80 After the episode with August, I regularly checked on Meyer's condition while training the special unit. Of course, I used reporting the unit's growth as an excuse. Since it took more time than I had expected to drill through Meyer's mana circuit the first time, I visited him late at night to avoid being seen on my way back. But when I got there. Pardon. I still have paperwork to deal with. It cannot be helped as I must finish it before tomorrow morning, Mayer said. Wait for me in the bedroom. Take a rest if you need it. I felt that he had perhaps gotten a little too used to it. But if there was one thing even Mayer couldn't grow accustomed to, it was the pain of drawing mana from the heart. He would groan during every session, twisting and curling his body, feeling like his blood vessels were burning. The process repeated until he lost consciousness. Ordinary mages didn't suffer so much, as far as I knew. I had no idea that demonic power could be this difficult. We must have spent thousands of gold in holy water poured to neutralize his dark energy. At least there was no need to pass it through mouth to mouth like the first time, but still. I sighed and stared at Mayer. Once again, he was pinning me down with delirious eyes, his golden irises clouded by pain. I didn't know how we ended up like this. Could it be that what had happened on the first day got misinterpreted by his subconscious? Whenever the pain intensified and Meyer's mind became hazy, he would try to kiss me like it was his only way to avoid the pain. There was no point in saying anything since he wasn't aware of what he was doing. Even if I tried to push him away, I couldn't match him in strength. As Meyer's face approached mine, our lips touched, transferring the heat of his breath to me. I sighed. HNN. We began kissing again for the umpteenth time. The act was meaningless, only serving to ease Meyer's suffering. I considered telling him about this at first but abandoned the thought before long. He could end up refusing to expand his mana circuit and arguing about it would be too bothersome. Better to let him have a few kisses instead it wouldn't be long before the circuit expansion finished, anyway. I decided to bury this matter in my heart. If only I didn't get so bruised in the process, though I was sick of listening to August's nagging every time he healed me. I felt like even the barest of touches with Mayer gave me bruises. It spoke volumes for how much he usually restrained himself. It was almost dawn by the time I finished widening the captain's mana circuit and left his bedroom. Then, as I crept back to my room, the worst self-doubt suddenly rose up within me. A feeling worse than when the unconscious Mayer was kissing me. What was I doing, really? Clang, clang. The sound of the monastery bell rang across the cold early morning air. People would be waking and moving soon. Hearing the bell rings pounding in my ears, I quickened my steps. Getting used to sneaking around was hard. But there was something I was getting used to, and that was the pain from the myriad of bruises left on my body. On the first time, I had had no choice but to call August to my room. But now I had reached the point where I would seek the priest myself to get treatment. Speaking of pain, I remembered bawling my eyes out the first time I was stabbed by a sword during the first playthrough. Nowadays the memory only made me chuckle. As I dragged my aching body toward August, I thought back to all the wounds of glory I had borne thus far. Pardon my persistent intrusions. I wore a cheeky smile as I entered the prayer room. August, who had just finished praying to St. Marianne, got to his feet and sighed. Today as well. I empathized with him. I was visiting August as many times as I was visiting Mayer. Ha! I fell out of the bed today, you see. Even I knew I was giving an absurd excuse, and I expected August to cast me a weary, scathing look. All I found in his grey eyes was stillness, though, as if he was trying to figure me out. What was up with him? As I started feeling suspicious, August changed the subject. Where are you injured today? I pushed my thoughts aside. Healing came first. My calf, my forearm, and I pointed to the various bruised spots on me. August's scowl worsened along with the number of injuries I confirmed. Chapter, 81 I bet he felt dissatisfied with me treating him like some personal therapist. But the holy power he used would recover in no time anyway, so why the reluctance? 
Still, despite my inner grumbling, I knew how much of a privilege it was to receive his healing whenever I wanted. In this world, you had to look for a priest to get treatment, not a doctor. But there weren't many priests capable of using holy power you had to go to their monasteries to meet them. Even nobles weren't exempt from this rule. The only priests that would act independently were those belonging to an expedition corps. Hence why whenever a corps went around looking for a dungeon, all the villagers they came across would swarm over, asking for treatment. As a consequence, the priests began to act high and mighty. Even back in the first playthrough, it was hard to ask April for some healing when I got hurt it wasn't like she would say anything to me. In fact, the woman would tend to my wounds kindly. The problem lay with the other people. They would criticize me, questioning what injuries I had to show as a support mage. And when the wound was serious and I showed them, they would look at me with even more contempt, wondering how a supporter like me ended up hurt. The same happened when my left arm was amputated. In comparison, August was a veritable angel. He always healed me, although not without giving me a hard time for falling off the bed. Not to mention, the man was a rare high priest. After my trip down memory lane, I realized I was taking him for granted. Now I felt like I could bear with all of August's lectures. I quietly braced myself for him to begin but today was different from usual. Normally, he would have started his sermon while fixing me up. Today, though, he was quiet as he focused on the healing, which didn't take long. The holy power from his hand passed through my body, and I felt as if an iron bar was removed from my shoulders. All done, he said. I knew I could count on you, Reverend August. Thank you. I praised the priest with a broad smile. It was a tad exaggerated, but I was trying to improve his mood, even in the slightest somehow, it didn't have much effect. August stared at me wordlessly, which I found quite uncomfortable. Since the treatment was over, I smiled awkwardly as I got up to leave MM then I'll be going to help with the special unit's training now. You rest for today, August. Sister. Yes. After calling me to a stop, he paused for a long while, as if hesitating. It was unlike the man's usual self he would always speak his thoughts without reserve. A minute later, August asked, does His Excellency treat you violently? Excuse me? I jumped with surprise at his sudden question as my mind was flooded with chaotic thoughts. I am aware of the rumors of you being His Excellency's lover, sister. He shows exceptional care for you, after all. H hang on now. What bull was he talking? Before giving my reply, I hastily looked around. To my relief, I found that the prayer room was empty save for me and August. But, unlike me, he wasn't afraid of other people hearing. I was worried along with the others at first, but sister, you work hard as a mage and as a vice-captain. I deemed the matter was not my business, and thus turned a blind eye until now. The thank you. But regardless of reason, violence against a lover to the degree of leaving such injuries? This is one thing I cannot look past, not even for His Excellency. August looked solemn. The priest was clearly misunderstanding something. Putting aside the mistaken fact of me being Meyer's lover, he seemed to think my injuries were caused by the captain. Well yes, they were caused by him, but... You must tell him yourself that this is not right, sister. If you are unable to speak out of fear for his retaliation, then I... Stop, hold up a bit. Why in the world do you think that? Why me, with the captain? I managed to come to my senses and interrupt. Perhaps thinking I was bewildered by his insight, August answered with a benevolent, priestly face that was rare of him. As I was setting out after giving prayer this morning, I witnessed you coming out of His Excellency's bedroom, sister. Oh frick! Chapter, 82 There was no way to avoid the misunderstanding if he saw that himself. I mumbled incoherently, tearing at my hair, and came up with an excuse. First off, what you're thinking right now is a misunderstanding. We're nothing like that, truly. Not at all. You say it is a misunderstanding, but that was not the only time I saw you coming out of there. This wasn't even the first time. Even if priests were prone to waking so early, how? Who'd have known August had long noticed while here I was, thinking I'd done a perfect job sneaking out. Realizing I had no excuses to give, 
I buried my face in my palms. I thought I had seen wrong at first, the priest continued. But I noticed that since the day I saw you come out of His Excellency's room as if running away, you would always come to me full of bruises. Well, the story itself was correct. I sighed deeply before explaining, it's not like His Excellency is acting violent. If he really tried to get rough, I probably wouldn't have even been able to look for you, Reverend August. Are you being serious? He should have controlled himself so nothing like this ever happened in the first place. It is natural for the strong to be considerate of the weak, and I believed His Excellency to be that kind of person, yet. It wasn't a controllable situation. First, I had to calm August's rising distrust and disgust toward Mayor Knox. It would be horrible to be mistaken for a piece of scum that abused his lover, wouldn't it? To start with, I'm not the captain's lover and he would treat someone not his lover so harshly. August flared up, not even letting me finish, and I could feel his appraisal of Mayor drop even lower. It didn't seem like I could get out of this situation with a vague excuse. No other choice, then I had to mix lies with truth. I sat opposite August and whispered, what I am going to tell you from now is an absolute top secret in the dark nights. Affected by my solemn attitude, August nodded sternly. His Excellency has recently awakened to mana. Mana? His Excellency? The priest asked in a whisper, the look on his face changing abruptly. I nodded and added, to be accurate, I forcibly awoke his latent talent. I was there when you did it with Brother Sevi Ventus I still cannot help but be amazed. Who would have thought such a thing possible? August was easily convinced, perhaps because he had personally seen Sevi's case. And this was why a good precedent was important in business. Your ability is truly as good as St. Marianne's blessing, sister. But why is this being kept a secret? The awakening of His Excellency's mana would serve to raise your fame along with the Dark Knights, no? That was because Mayer had demonic power, but that wasn't something I could reveal to August. I squeezed my brain to the limit trying to come up with an excuse. I couldn't take too long or it would seem suspicious. Even now, His Excellency is the strongest, even though he has no mana. Right. He has achieved so much pure physical strength only no one would be a match if he gains mana in his arsenal. It will become a beacon of hope for the people. Do you think there'd only be hope? August frowned at my meaningful question. While he was trying to figure out what I was saying, I set my brain to work even harder. I had to spin a lie as coherently as possible. Everyone in the world will be shaken by how His Excellency awoke his mana alone, yes. It's natural. We're talking about the Dark Knight, the strongest of humanity gaining mana. But not everyone will welcome it. For some, this news will spell despair, I began. You mean to say, sister? There will be those who stand up for the greater good, but not all expedition corps are like that. Some move by their desires. Like, say, people who believe they've got a chance to become emperor if things go well people who regard the captain's lack of mana as their only hope. So what do you think will happen if our secret is made known? Although I put on a placid face, my mouth was dry while my heart pounded with nervousness. They might give up on closing dungeons. Is this what you mean? August managed to complete my heat-of-the-moment excuse with his words. It fit like a piece of a puzzle. Excited, I continued explaining. They wouldn't completely give up, not with their reputation on the line. But they would surely end up demotivated, which would be troublesome. It'll take a long time for the captain to awaken his mana and be able to wield it in dungeons. Gates will continue to open in the meantime and if the speed at which they are closed slows even if His Excellency slays the Demon Lord in the end, the losses to the Empire would be severe. August concluded. Chapter, 83. It was a rather plausible story with complicated logic. Now that the frame was built, it was easier to keep going. The Dark Knights alone can't close all those dungeons. That's why I intend on hiding the truth about the Captain's mana the best I can. The current situation of competition between expedition corps is best for humanity. Is that why you kept it secret to the elite members including myself? I nodded. Because the fewer who know, the better. Even so, what you are doing is so easy to misunderstand. Fortunately, I was the one who noticed. 
that I agreed with. Had it been anyone other than August who saw me exit Meyer's bedroom, the rumors would have spiraled out of control. I let out a sigh. Honestly, Reverend August, I wouldn't have told you about this if you didn't mistake the captain for having a sadistic kink. I'm already being misunderstood as being in a relationship with him. Well, that's why I've been sneaking around, to give no more fodder for gossip. The last bit was true, at least, and I believed it would add sincerity to my statement. The suspicion on August's face gradually faded and he nodded. No choice but to understand since you say so. But I still cannot get rid of one question. How in the world did the bruises on your body come about, sister? Mm there's an enormous amount of mana slumbering inside his excellency. It's not easy to control, which is why he loses his senses sometimes. Loses his senses? Do you mean he goes insane? August looked at me in astonishment. I probably would have gotten a less intense reaction by stepping on a landmine and then calmly saying hello in the morning. The look on his face was screaming that I was practically taking selfies right next to a wild bear. This priest was definitely misunderstanding something again. I hurriedly corrected myself. He just gets delirious due to the pain of unblocking his mana circuit. Not going crazy. Only then did August seem relieved. You startled me there. The man sure did like jumping to conclusions. With a TSK, I added, if the captain went mad, I wouldn't have even been able to walk out of there. His bedroom would have become my grave. I understand. Then, just what does His Excellency do in his delirious state to give you such bruises? August asked. We just bumped into each other. But. You know how strong the captain is, and that isn't all he has. His body's so tough. I end up getting bruised with just a slight bump. I only got them trying to support him so he didn't collapse. I wasn't being completely truthful, but it wasn't entirely a lie either. I could never tell the truth in its entirety. What would I say? That mayor kisses me when his suffering reaches its peak. That I end up bruised all over once I'm done enduring him desperately clinging to me. Whatever I said would be misleading. I knew how my explanation would be received. Of course, August didn't seem convinced by my words. His lips twitched as if he was eager to refute, but I insisted that nothing else had happened. In the end, he had no choice but to stand down without asking any more questions. Having given up trying to grasp the truth, he sighed. But for you to be hurt like this every time does His Excellency know you are being injured? Of course he doesn't. I said he gets delirious. Still, you could tell him afterward, no. That I can't. Is it really necessary to add to the captain's worries? Sister. August frowned. There's not much left to do anyhow. Opening a mana circuit is a delicate task and the mental state has a significant impact too. I don't want to bother him for nothing, I explained, being adamant about this. I had tried so hard to hide these injuries and get away from Mayer. August's suggestion was practically telling me to turn those efforts into nothing. Despite my resistance, though, the priest was as persistent as he was faithful. Then at least tell him after you are done. You must. His Excellency must know of your noble sacrifice, sister. It's nothing so grand. Strictly speaking, I had sacrificed the innocence of my lips, but since I wasn't completely clean in this, I had decided to call it quits. Not wanting to call on unnecessary trouble, I smiled and added, I suppose you could call it suffering. My injuries are already healed, so would there be a need to reveal it to the captain? Finally realizing I was trying to bury the truth, August's face filled with shock. Chapter, 84 Then you intend on hiding everything? What do you stand to gain from this, sister? I don't think that's something a priest should say. Isn't it a recommended virtue for a religious person to not announce their sacrifice to others or something? I laughed despite myself as August questioned me in disbelief. The priest shook his head gravely. It is a sin to take sacrifice for granted. I didn't give an inch of ground and also shook my head. I'm not taking it for granted. I merely think it's better to keep this matter a secret. Mayer seemed plenty grateful to me already. I didn't know how much it would help by making him feel more indebted, 
hence why I felt it necessary to keep the secret. The captain was concerned enough about my safety as it was. After all, I was a necessary part to defeat the demon lord. He already flared up if I got the slightest injury if the man found out he had hurt me himself with him being rather sensitive and low in self-esteem, I couldn't imagine what he'd think and do in that case. In the end, it would only bring trouble. Mayor Knox couldn't be told of what I did, and nor did he need to. And August hadn't needed to know anything about this either. Anyway the captain mustn't know. Do you understand, Reverend? I told him firmly. However he hesitated. The same with the secret about the captain's manna. I would like for you to keep mum about today's conversation to him, and everyone else, of course. August fixed his grey eyes on me and silence fell around us. After a long moment, he sighed and nodded, seeing that I wasn't backing down in the least. I understand. I smiled. Thank you. I'll trust you on that then. It was a relief that I managed to solve this emergency. I didn't know what I was doing because of Mayor Knox, and I couldn't help but shake my head. Still, I comforted myself with the thought that being useful was better than being of no help at all. There was merit to August finding out what was going on, I could get immediate treatment without having to think up any more excuses. After expanding Meyer's mana circuit, I didn't head straight to my bedroom. Instead, I barely managed to drag my battered body over to a dark corner near the monastery. Oh, you were here already. It will not do to keep a patient waiting, after all. August cast a disapproving look at me, but he healed me without saying much. His holy power passed through my body, virtually returning me to the healthy state I was in before going to Mayer. I swung my arms around, feeling amazed. They were painless and fine. I'll be sleeping soundly thanks to you. Glad to hear. Hom then I'll be getting some sleep. See you later. Rest well. Before, I had always groaned in my sleep on days I met Mayer, but now I could sleep no different than usual. That alone felt like a good start to my day and my footsteps grew lighter by themselves. This was why sleep quality had such importance in life. But it wasn't all good things. Like how August noticed me going in and out of Meyer's bedroom, it was impossible to hide my secret meetings with the priest. Somebody must have found out as rumors began to spread of August and me secretly meeting each other. Now it's Reverend August after His Excellency. What part of her attracted them? Unbelievable. Word around is that someone saw it with their own eyes. They were holding a rendezvous in a secret part in the garden at dawn or something. Really? I didn't expect our meeting place to be the typical rendezvous spot near the garden for couples. And they say if you're unlucky, you'd break your nose falling backward I softly clicked my tongue. Priests weren't obligated to be chased or anything in this world, but that didn't mean that being part of such gossip was a good thing. It didn't take long for the rumors to reach the ears of the person in question. August looked dismayed at hearing about it. So, this is how rumors spread. How do you feel after experiencing it? Not very good. Right? I shrugged with a giggle. Cheer up. Axion says they'll go away if you ignore them, but in my experience, it's like a mark that's hard to get rid of. That alone will fuel the rumors. How can you be so calm, sister? Is that how I look? No, this is me having given up. Resigned. Chapter, 85 I was sneaking around at dawn because I didn't want to get involved with Mayer like that anymore. Now August was in the mix and it wasn't like the rumors with the captain had even ceased. I was in knee-deep trouble, all right. All the things I'd been fussing about now seemed absurd in comparison. Now that things came to this, I actually felt as if I could stay serene no matter what rumor was put on my name. I grinned as I jested, I'll be in your care then, Mr. Lover Number 2. Horrible August clicked his tongue quietly. If there was any relief in all this, it was that holding secret dawn meetings with the priest soon became unnecessary. Mayer began to take control of his mana circuit. He no longer lost his senses from the pain. No more kisses and harsh clinging. I continued to watch over Mayer as he controlled his mana circuit alone. He was making faster progress than I had expected. Day by day, he grew more proficient in bending mana to his will. 
After observing him many times and confirming that there was no danger of him going berserk, I told Mayer, at this point, I think you can train on your own. At last, you are free. I appreciate all you have done. There's still much to be done. You'll have to try putting mana to practical use. Will it not go out of control? Mayer asked anxiously, still seeming concerned. I answered confidently, your now wider mana circuit will greatly reduce the danger of that happening. Don't worry about it. If you say so. Trust oozed from Meyer's eyes. He had a lot of trust in me before as well, but it was clear I had gotten myself printed in his good books this time. I just had to hide that we had kissed, or else there would be more nonsense to deal with that would complicate things. All I had to do was button my lips since we wouldn't need to stay close so often anymore. And on that note, I raised my voice in a peaceful tone. But it's premature for you to enter a dungeon alone, Captain. I ask that you work on controlling your mana circuit only, for the time being. Until when? Until the next performance report meeting. The meeting? It will take quite a while then. I think I'll only manage to have my level up to standard by that time. Can we not go faster? Mayer showed a trace of impatience, his face rigid. I supposed it was natural to try using his newfound power, like feeling the urge to open a box of goods you'd just bought. But while I empathized with his feelings, now wasn't the time. More than anything, I wasn't ready. I hadn't expected him to stabilize his mana circuit so quickly. Sure, he would carry me through any dungeon we entered together, but I still needed to level up to some extent. I was no tougher than a hamster in a mid-level dungeon. No. It is my fault for keeping you these days. I was being too hasty. There's still some time until the Demon Lord dungeon will appear, after all. I'll try to level up the fastest I can. The special unit is expected to go into action soon too, so. The special unit? Mayor asked. Yes. They're almost ready. I'm telling you now before I send in the report. I had thought Mayer would be happy to hear this, but his expression was conflicted. It looked like there was something he wanted to say but couldn't bring himself to. Was he troubled about when he should reveal his mana to the others? It was possible. As a capable advisor, I decided to solve my superior's worry. Come to think of it, we'll have to eventually reveal your awakening of mana, Captain. To our elites, at least. The sensitive topic made Meyer's face stiffen instantly. He always showed me goodwill and I often acted presumptuously, but that didn't mean I wasn't concerned about offending him. I continued hurriedly, don't worry too much. I've thought up an excuse for you. An excuse? We can say that your excellency has manifested holy power. Chapter, 86 Meyer's dark eyebrow rose, a dubious expression appearing on his face. But at least he was willing to listen, so I wetted my lips before continuing. You can claim that it's a power specialized for attacks and that it can't heal. It's not like there isn't a precedent. Saint Marianne bestowed all kinds of mana to humanity. Those types of mana were called talents. Even if someone awoke to the same type of mana, they may not be able to use the same spells as another. Whipper and I were an example of this, both were support type mages, but we used different kinds of magic. In reality, this was only intended as a diversity for the game characters, but that was how this world worked. To begin with, Captain you're a devout believer, aren't you? It's not that uncommon for a believer without mana to awaken, after all I gauged Meyer's reaction as I kept explaining. Knowing that he was devout only for the sake of suppressing his power, talking about it felt very awkward. But there are no cases of humans with demonic power, so no one will ever think that you have it. Even if I claim to have manifested holy power, what of my hair color? The hair of anyone that awakens to holy power turns golden, no. Surprising as it may be, saying it's a rare case, can serve as an excuse a lot of the time, I pointed out. Yet, despite my answer, Mayer still seemed anxious. He looked extremely worried about others finding out the truth about his mana. This man had confidence in almost everything, power, ability, well the sole exception was trusting others. Because of his childhood, he built a wall around himself and became unable to trust anyone. 
he assumed others would be unable to believe in him as well and couldn't bring himself to trust them it was a vicious cycle. You can say that your holy power isn't strong enough to change your hair color. People will think it's something beyond their comprehension. You're currently the strongest, highest leveled person in existence, after all. And then, to put him more at ease, I added, what I mean is it doesn't matter what excuse you come up with. There's no need to give an explanation for every situation. People will fill in the blanks by themselves. At that, his expression became odd, a mix of happy and doubtful. A moment later, he let out a low laugh. You seemed very convincing now. I did not know you could lie so well. I've always been a good liar, I said and laughed at him inwardly. Heh, he'd be shocked if he knew how much I had hidden from him. Whether it be the kisses we'd shared, or the truth about me not being the original owner of this body it didn't matter how much he read in my expression, what mattered was that he didn't discover my secrets. Besides, if I was that bad at lying, everything would have been over the moment August had noticed what we had done. My tongue itched to boast of the great wit I had displayed when evading the priest's suspicions. But that would be stupid of me to do, so I held back firmly as I said, and your excellency will be the one who will lie. But I'm not particularly worried, though, since unlike me, you're an experienced liar. I am thankful for the trust. You're the only one who knows I can use elemental conversion. It's a technique I haven't used before even in the first playthrough, so even Fabian doesn't know. It wasn't like I was saving it for anything, I merely didn't have a use for it. Mayer seemed to think otherwise, however he looked slightly moved as if I had told him about some special move I'd been hiding all the while. Of course, there was no need to clear up that misunderstanding. No one will imagine that the element of your mana has changed. Trust me. The look in his golden eyes was like a sunset on a rainy day. He nodded, obedient, and I felt ecstatic. I felt like the first person in the world to tame a beast that no one could ever tame. Maybe that was why I started feeling deep pity towards this man who was a head, no, a head and a half taller than me. I felt as if I was the only one who could protect him. But the moment I realized what I was thinking, I shuddered. The one who deserved the most pity was me, having to look after this mess. Was I stupid or something? Seeing how I'd forgotten how I got bruised all over from bumping into him a few days ago, it seemed I didn't have a good memory. Either that or my survival instinct was lacking. Feeling embarrassed all of a sudden, I changed the topic. I've been asking Reverend August lately about unusual cases of people manifesting holy power. So even if we reveal that you've awakened, he'll be easily convinced. As long as August acknowledges it, there's no way the other elites will suspect. Chapter, 87 I wanted to make him relieved since I'd done this much groundwork, but judging from his face, Mayer was far from that. He had that ambiguous look like when I was talking about the special unit going into action. What was it? Wasn't he troubled over the problem of revealing his power to the core? Mayor Knox hesitated to speak for a long time, lips shut tightly, before speaking up. Speaking of which, it looks like you have grown quite close to August lately. Somehow, it sounded like I shouldn't be getting close to the priest. Not knowing the intent behind his question, I replied with an awkward laugh. Well, since we've been training the special unit together and I did receive a lot of help from him. I mean, closer as in personally. It was then that I finally realized his intent. The man had definitely caught wind of that gossip about me and August being together. But that didn't clear all the questions in my head, though. How had he come upon that rumor? Did he know of the scandalous talk about me and him before that? There was a mountain of things I wanted to ask, so I lined up the questions in my head and cautiously began firing them. Um, when you say personal, may I ask? How personal do you mean? Mayer kept silent, not giving me an answer, but the clear displeasure on his face was enough to tell me. Exasperation rose inside me. Even if he had heard such rumors, there was no need to be so displeased, right? Maybe there was some code of conduct in the core that I hadn't heard of. Like forbidding dating between expedition members considering how I had never heard about the off-limits zone before the room with Meyer's portrait there was a good chance I had failed to hear about that sort of rule. If so, then it was natural that Mayer was so irritated. It was a matter of disrupting discipline as the vice-captain, after all. 
Then again, why didn't he say anything when rumors were going around about us? I couldn't understand him. I don't know what you've heard, but the Reverend and I are just good comrades, I said with caution. You would hide the truth, even from me. It is fine, to be honest. He said so, but he didn't look fine in the least. His face was serious. Seeming shocked that I was hiding something from him, Mayer didn't hide the look of disappointment on his face. At that moment, I thought of how gobsmacked he'd look if he knew what I was actually hiding. I'm telling you the truth. I don't know what rumors you heard, Captain besides, if everything was as those gossips told, then you and I would be in that kind of relationship. I appealed to Meyer's empathy. He should have at least heard about the rumors about us. There was no way he didn't know, what with how noisy the corps was being. That turned out not to be the case, though, as Mayer asked with a frown, there are rumors about us. Did you not know? I asked in amazement. He nodded, clueless. But how could you not know about that? The men were being so noisy over it. It was that bad. The rumor about me and Reverend August can't even compare. There was a lot of commotion from the moment I joined the Dark Knights. Mayer clutched at his head with a groan at finding out this unexpected truth. You didn't expect such rumors after all the favoritism you showed. At this point, the man could be called shameless. I didn't hide the sarcasm in my voice as I said, you shouldn't have treated me with such favor. I believe doing so would be of help to you. It's not like it didn't help. No one bullied me outright, after all. It did help in that I was free of any childish bullying, such as tripping me over, not telling me assembly points, and so on. But help aside, those rumors aren't a positive thing. I was going to speak to you about it anyway. I felt like it's something that should be dealt with before we go to the performance report meeting. You talk like there is a reason to deal with it before then. Why? Are you afraid of Fabian getting the wrong idea? I had spoken without much thought, but Meyer's tone was sharp. I was taken aback by his aggressive words. What are you talking about? Why bring up Fabian again all of a sudden? Are you not trying to silence the rumors to prevent Fabian from misunderstanding our relationship? What bull are you it's a problem for you, Captain? Me? Mayor blinked dumbly. That innocent look on his face made him all the more detestable. Sure, those rumors won't have a positive effect on any relationship I'll have in the future, but honestly, it doesn't matter. It's not like I'll be romancing anyone right now. As he stared at me in silence, I continued. That's why I've been leaving it alone. I can bear with people talking behind my back. I let it be because it doesn't bother me. Do you understand? Chapter 88 But it sounds like it will become bothersome when we go to the performance report meeting. Of course. You're very popular, Captain. The Dark Knights didn't pick on me outright because they listened to your orders. However, it's a different story for the nobles that have their eyes set on you. The bullying of nobility was dark and persistent in another sense. Their harassment was more encompassing than that of commoners. In the past iteration, several mages from noble houses had held a grudge against me. They resented that I stuck around Fabian despite being a support mage. The mere thought of what they did to me was tiring. And, this time, we were talking about Dark Knight Mayor Knox. Moreover, it wasn't at the level of sticking around. If the misunderstanding about the relationship between us were to spread to high society yuff. I could see clear as day what would happen during the performance report meeting. Not knowing how much I had suffered back then, Mayor still seemed disbelieving. Is that really all there is to it? That's what I'm trying to say. You can act like an onlooker since you never get bullied outright, but it's a real bother for me, all right? I grumbled. Mayer seemed to find it so suspicious that I didn't care about Fabian in the least. The man would always go on about Fabian whenever something happened. While I understood why he minded, it was frustrating. It felt like he wasn't acknowledging me as one of his. I don't care if Fabian gets the wrong idea or not. What does it matter in the first place? To him, I'm just a former comrade a comrade that he abandoned himself. Besides, there's nothing between us this time. Whether I date you or not, Captain, it's none of Fabian's business. 
The heart of a man is not as straightforward as you put it. Do you know what that's called? Being shameless. And I have no intention of playing along with that. Mayer seemed bewildered. He avoided my eyes, apparently surprised that I was expressing such disgust. I presumed that you were fond of Fabian. Romantically, I mean. I stared at him in silence. Well, it'd be a lie to say I didn't like him at all Mayer sure was sharp. But nothing good would come from revealing the emotions Fabian and I had shared. Especially not to serial mistruster Mayor Knox. I sighed and discreetly changed the subject. Don't be ridiculous. In any case, the rumors about Reverend August are lies too, so don't bother too much about it, Captain. I was a little apprehensive as Mayor could read my expression so well. Although he didn't chase the matter about Fabian, he didn't ease up when it came to August. He immediately shook his head as he said, that is a different case. It wasn't different at all. I almost ended up raising my voice. With a forced smile, I asked gently, what's different? The gossip about us is bewildering, yes but as the people involved, we know that there is nothing between us. It's the same with Reverend August, I pointed out. No. I trust in Reverend August, but that is a separate matter. You are a good person. He may feel attracted. Excuse me. August and me. He was either overestimating me or insulting August. I gazed at Mayer, wondering about his sanity. He stared back squarely in silence without backing down in the least. In fact, so squarely that I got the feeling that I might have heard him wrong. He wore such a brazen face that I couldn't believe he had spouted such nonsense. But Meyer's subsequent words shattered my small hope. If such rumors are already circulating, it means that you too are being overly close. What I am saying is he may misunderstand your good intentions. He was driving me crazy. I didn't even know how to retort. Unable to believe what I was hearing, I could only manage to repeat what Mayer had said. So you're saying Reverend August might misunderstand my generosity? That is quite possible. He nodded. It still sounded absurd to me and I felt deep frustration. He was fine with rumors about me being involved with him, but not August. There should be a limit to being distrustful. If not, then why meet at that time and in such a dark place? He added. I say, there is definitely a need for you to be more careful. Chapter, 89 Who did he even think was the reason we met at that time and place? It was all because of him. My head heated up as I thought of the cause behind the rumors. All the hardship and effort I went through for Mayor Knox flashed through my mind. Even if he didn't remember, how could he act like such an ingrate? Angered, I shot brusquely, if you're so anxious, then how about you call Reverend August and we have a three-way talk? I bet your worries will be wiped clean when you see the contempt on his face. Though, of course, you'll end up losing all his trust in you. I put on an infuriating smirk. But the moment I saw Meyer's eyes light up, I realized I had made a mistake. Good idea. Yes. If I can get his assurance that he will not like you no matter how kindly you treat him. Ugh, seriously. Even my dad wouldn't be like this. I wasn't referring to June's unscrupulous father, of course. Disregarding my shuddering, Mayer nodded to himself as if there couldn't be a better idea, welcoming my suggestion. A definite answer no, it would be better to have it on paper. Written promises have always been a good way of sharing trust, after all. Have what on paper? Some sort of memorandum that we won't fall for each other. I said sarcastically. But sarcasm only worked on the same mayor responded to my words in all seriousness. Yes. Something like that. You're kidding me, right? I am serious. Do I seem like I am joking? No, I was asking because you did look serious. I was hoping you were jesting. I could feel my face turning rigid and serious, and only then did Mayer notice something was up with me. Is it such a bad idea? He asked, cautious. You're not asking despite being aware, are you? I shot back and he stared at me in silence. Usually, he was so good at reading my expressions. Why was he clueless at times like this? Observant only when he wants to. 
Mayer didn't say much despite my sharp, rude remark. Pity. Had he said something, I would have socked him a good one and then gone on strike with a fractured wrist. Mayer eyed me timidly. Was he cowed by my firm stance? I got the illusion of him having a drooping tail and ears. Since you are so against it, I shall put it on hold for now and I understand that you are innocent. But do not be too comfortable around Reverend August. You're the one who stuck him next to me in the first place, Captain, I grumbled. The sudden topic of the rumors about August thus ended with my desperate resistance. Who'd have expected the swerve in conversation when we were talking about Meyer's demonic power? I almost lost it there. Mayer still didn't seem to have put down his doubts about me and August, though. Even so, I was glad enough to have him give up on writing that memorandum or whatnot. Somehow, I had managed to hide my crucial secrets from him without arousing suspicion, which was why I was even more outraged. I sighed, relieved that Mayer only focused on my relationship with the priest. I felt a sense of betrayal that he couldn't trust August even after everything. It somehow resembled what had happened between Fabian and me. But upon closer thought, August didn't seem to be that trusting of Mayer either. Indeed, come to think of it, the priest suspected the captain of having a violent kink. Should I say that he looked at the situation objectively and rationally, or that he just didn't have high expectations for the personality of others? Whatever the case, since that conversation with Mayer, I kept as much distance from August as possible. About one meter. Seeing that I was openly keeping away from him instead of going away, August frowned and asked, Did something happen? Don't come close. I'll get rumors. The priest scrambled backward as soon as I spoke, and one meter turned to three meters. And Mayer said what about this man? His suspicions were ludicrous no matter how much I thought over them. I kept it a secret from August that the captain was suspicious about our relationship. It would be troublesome if the priest ended up leaving the dark nights out of disappointment. I wondered if Mayer even knew how genuinely I cared for the manpower of our corps. I grumbled to myself as I tended to my paperwork, keeping far away from August. As I was working, a shadow suddenly fell over me. It was Nova. Chapter, 90 Uh, Vice Captain. I paused my paperwork and looked up at Nova. Emichem, Nova. What's up? His model student face had a slight crease on the brows. Laughing in a troubled way, he asked, I can't figure out this part of my assignments. I glanced at the part Nova was indicating. Oh, it's about the distribution of monsters in a dungeon. Yes. Normally, weaker monsters gather at the start of a dungeon, which ensues in a group battle. Then you encounter stronger ones the further in you go, right? Is there any reason for this setup? It's so inefficient. Mm you can think of the inside of a dungeon as a kind of ecosystem. I should do some drawing to show you, I said and fumbled through my papers for some scrap I could use. As I was doing so, Sevi and Julia Tahoe had been peeking over here all this while scampered over. Ah, Vice Captain. Teach me too. Me three. Both of them were holding their assignments in their hands, the papers filled with words. However, those were unrelated to what I was talking about. I narrowed my eyes at them. Have you thought it over hard enough? You're not trying to get a free answer, are you? No way. Sevi shook his head wildly, but his reddened face made his lie obvious. Julieta, on the other hand, couldn't even manage to tell a fib. Was this how Mayer felt when he scrutinized me? The thought made me feel apologetic for some reason. I suppose this was what they call self-projection. I pretended to be fooled and explained, there is a common misconception that Felspawn might cooperate with each other. In truth, their relationship is one of kill or be killed. They have an ecosystem of their own. I drew a rather fine circle using my years of organizing math note skills. I drew another circle inside that one and continued. They all want their own territory, but there's a limit to the size of a dungeon. Then the territory of weak felspawn can only be small, yes. And if even that bit of land becomes hard to keep? They work together. Julieta answered cautiously, seeming awkward at giving her thoughts. I gave a large, exaggerated nod. Right. Because that's the only way to fight other strong felspawn. 
So that's why they form a horde, Nova muttered, nodding to himself. Sevi, who had been locked in thought, suddenly asked, if the Felspawn don't get along well, then could we use their ecology to make them fight each other? That's a good question. Being a mage didn't make you clever, but having a good head allowed one to use magic more efficiently. I gazed at Sevi, feeling proud of him. The boy was sure to become a good mage. It's quite possible. But not recommended. Is it because they could cooperate? That's a possibility, but the main problem is the lower amount of experience you'll get. Oh Sevi gaped as if he'd never thought of this point. In his case, it was expected he didn't know how important experience was. Dungeons had begun appearing when he was young. Experience can only be gained from dungeons, after all. You gotta make use of every precious opportunity, I lectured. Before dungeons opened, people lived with their given level without much change. It was possible for someone born at level 10 to work hard their entire life and reach level 20. It was impossible, however, for someone level 50 to reach level 60. It didn't matter, though. Whatever seconds people took to run 100 meters, however much you could use illuminating magic, whether you were level 10 or 50, there were no problems getting by in life until the dungeons opened, that is. Gates could not be closed with the level people were born with. At the rate things were going, humanity was at the cusp of annihilation. Leveling up was a way for humans to adapt to the distorted world, the only way for humans to surpass their limits. Experience is extremely important and precious. There are cases of people backstabbing others for it. You should know that well, Sevi. The boy nodded rigidly at the mention of the Blue Flames incident. Anyway we need to understand the distribution of monsters and their territorial habits to achieve the most we can in a dungeon with minimal losses. Dungeons are a limited resource. All three of them noted down my explanation. I could see each of their personalities from their handwriting. Smiling a little while seeing them bury their nose into their papers, I said sternly, now that I've given an explanation I should hand out an assignment, don't you guys think? More assignments. On top of what we have. I, I'm having trouble sleeping lately. Sevi and Julieta shuddered, against the suggestion. Model student Nova also didn't seem to welcome the idea he gave me an awkward smile. Chapter, 91. You need to get your theoretical knowledge straight as well to enter a dungeon. I stared at them pointedly. I, I know that, but still. It didn't matter how strong you were, you needed a certain degree of knowledge or death was certain in a dungeon. Then again, if you were at Meyer's level, there would be no need to worry about such. Your body would do all the work. Nothing could be said about the man's theory either. He was perfect when it came to dungeons, and the mere thought made me click my tongue softly. Half forced into doing more assignments, the kids trudged back to their places. They had lost the ability to refuse. August, who had been quietly listening through it all, quietly expressed admiration. To my knowledge, you have little experience in dungeons, Vice Captain. And yet, you seem to have a perfect understanding of them. This must be why the captain made me, a level 20 at the time, Vice Captain. Because he can use me right away, I remarked apathetically. I knew, of course, that my reply wasn't enough to answer his question. August looked like he was about to say more when, suddenly, noise came from outside the window. The sound of a horn signaling the return of an expedition party instantly grabbed everyone's attention. They were. It appears that Team Green Spirits has returned, August muttered softly. His expression was flat, but I had learned to read his face over the months we'd spent together. I could see the sorrow underneath it. Green Spirits was a squad that was dispatched to clear a mid-level dungeon before I came to Noctentoria Castle. It was one of the top squads even among the Dark Knights composed of second core members plus one elite member. Clearing a dungeon normally took up to a week or four days at the earliest. Large dungeons with higher difficulty would take longer, up to three months. Any longer and the expedition would be judged to have failed. It had already been several months since I came to this castle. In ordinary cases, their expedition would more than likely have failed, yet they continued to struggle. At last, we received a report that they had closed the dungeon. Only one person survived, the newest member of the Green Spirits. 
the sole survivor returned with the last words and remains of the dead. I put away the papers I was reading and said, let's end theory study here since a memorial service will be held soon. All of you, get ready. Everyone's faces darkened. In particular, Sevi didn't look well. He silently looked out of the window. August and Julieta whispered prayers, making the sign of the cross amidst the quiet. It was a time for mourning. The memorial service was held solemnly in the pouring rain. The dark knights donned in armor bowed their heads heavily before six black coffins. I listened to the rain patter against their armor as the smell of wet metal pierced my nostrils. To make things worse, the rain fell without ever seeming to stop. Water droplets streamed down the paled faces of the knights as if to wash away their tears. Unfortunately, there was something that even the sound of rain couldn't drown out. Why did you save me, squad leader? Why only me the sole survivor of the green spirits wept before the coffins of their comrade? Everything was being buried in the rain, but the bitter wail that pierced through it rang in the hearts of the dark nights. Reverend August murmured a prayer to appease the souls of those gone. Axion in any other day would have remarked coldly that the weak who died in a dungeon couldn't be helped. Yet today, he looked forward aimlessly, eyes glazed. Even Robert couldn't hide the sorrow on her face. Upon hearing of their mishap, she had praised the green spirits as having died an honorable death befitting of great warriors. The death of comrades, especially that of an elite, had a huge impact. I glanced at Mayer, who was standing farther in front than me. Outwardly, he was serene, seeming unaffected. The man was like well-tempered steel and wasn't shaken easily. I could feel that he was enduring through all the sorrow rather than putting on a mask to keep up appearances as the captain of an expedition corps. Or could it be that he had known the green spirits would end up like this? If so, then he could have avoided this outcome. What could the reason be for not doing so? The words he once said echoed in my ears. Draw a line between you and everyone else around you. The members of the corps are only parts that exist for the sake of overthrowing the demon lord. Was the death of the green spirits a necessary procedure to defeating the demon lord? Was that why Mayor Knox abandoned them without hesitation? My head became scrambled with thoughts. I could only guess at everything as I didn't know how the green spirits ended up in the first playthrough. The squad leader shouldn't have been sacrificed to save someone like me. This is all because I'm weak. If I were a little stronger. If I were just a little I'm sorry, squad leader. I'm sorry. The only survivor of the green spirits collapsed, wailing on top of a coffin, weeping endlessly. It made me feel complicated to see him demean himself as a fool who didn't even dare to die with his squad members. He seemed to feel he was shameless to have survived by himself. It was like seeing the edge of hell. I burned the scene into my eyes until the memorial service ended. Chapter, 92 The mental condition of the green spirit survivor was worse than expected. He began to inflict self-harm and, as time went on, began to see and hear things. The man couldn't go on being an expedition member, and he was completely devoid of the will to do so. Depression was contagious. Contaminated by melancholy, Noctentoria Castle was quieter than usual. June Carantia. Do you have time in the evening? Mayor asked. What? I do have time, but. Then why not share a drink with me? I am in the mood for some drinking tonight. I pondered Meyer's suggestion for a moment. Drinking with him meant I could have expensive alcohol I'd normally be unable to afford. On the other hand, a lot of things held me back, including the recent kissing. I wanted to avoid being alone with him whenever possible, but the power of expensive liquor was too great. In the end, the scales in my heart tilted toward it. Besides, I didn't feel I could bear with not drinking on a day like this. Could that be why Mayer was calling me over? As always, the captain was unable to bring himself to speak until he had downed a few shots. He rubbed a hand down his face and let out a sigh. The Green Spirit squad leader, Umbra was a good person. She was indecisive, but she knew how to call the shots when necessary. His eyes lost their focus for a brief moment as he thought of his comrade. He chewed over his own words while swirling his glass of liquor before chuckling all of a sudden. I think I said the same for Whippera, 
but I mean it for Umbra. I heard. That she sacrificed herself to save a new squad member I replied, recalling what I overheard about Umbra during the memorial service. Umbra had been one of the two elites under mayor I didn't get to meet as they were out on dungeon raids. I had never heard of her in the first playthrough. Is this a different conclusion from the first playthrough? I asked cautiously. It is similar. And that is what makes it harder to take. Mayer downed another glass. He didn't show any color on his face, but I could tell the drink was starting to get to him by the slight slur in his voice. It was a complete failure back then. There were no survivors. So I was the one to close that dungeon in the end. If you knew, then why didn't you go yourself? I could not. The dungeon opening times overlapped. He laughed, but the sound was bitter. I thought back to when the green spirits were dispatched and realized it was right before I met Mayer. Apprehensive, I asked, by opening times do you mean it was because of me? Not you, but me. I was the one who gave the order. So it is because of me. To meet me in the dungeon I was in right. Mayer filled his empty glass in silence, not answering. It turned out I was involved most unexpectedly. Feeling a phantom weight press against my chest, I downed a glass myself. I wished for the fire of liquor to burn away this weight, but I still felt suffocated. At first, I considered giving the order to bring you while I went to the other dungeon. But giving an abrupt order to rescue a support mage somewhere in a dungeon? Putting aside that it would seem suspicious I felt uneasy. And the rescue could have suffered a setback as you might have, due to unforeseen circumstances, harbored hostility against the Dark Knights and that wasn't even the worst scenario. If you were to end up dying he trailed off. I could understand his concerns, although I did wonder if it wasn't excessive. For example, Axion, who didn't have a good first impression of me. I wouldn't have even had the chance to show my capability. I tried to imagine what could have happened with Mayer giving a sudden order to save a support mage. At first glance, I would have seemed useless and someone without the slightest connection to the captain to top it off, it was a wonder whether the ones tasked with that mission would have managed to reach the dungeon in time. Without their captain there to rush them, what if they hadn't arrived soon enough? In reality, had Mayer been delayed even a little, I would have died to that cyclops. Just like that, I would have croaked before the second playthrough had even begun. It was meaningless speculation now, but the thought alone was chilling. A mere moment of hesitation can end up killing people. I feared that would happen to you. And, as you know, I honestly cannot trust others too much. It is a separate matter from acknowledging someone's ability. I cannot rest easy unless I solve the most important things myself. Mayer fidgeted with his glass, which was the same as mine yet it looked remarkably smaller in his hand. Like a man facing his sin, he continued in a clear voice. Yes. I gave up on Umbra. To gain a little more certainty in slaying the demon lord. Chapter, 93 Mayer believed completely that I was worth bringing over, even if he had to sacrifice an elite member of his or perhaps that was what he wanted to believe in since nothing could bring back his lost subordinate. Could it be that he was always looking for use in me to confirm that his choice hadn't been wrong? Was that why he was often worried about my life? Was there no other way than to dispatch the green spirits? I asked quietly. There was no other squad available that could clear that dungeon at the time, and actually, this is not something two should say in this situation. However, I genuinely believed that the green spirits could clear it, Mayer murmured. His confession wasn't quite for me to listen to. It was closer to him looking back on something he couldn't believe happened. I did not send them without any thoughts, you know. I had information as I had cleared it once I trained the green spirits according to the dungeon level and gave them plenty of support. Including holy water, I also conveyed to them the proper strategy. I prepared them perfectly, so much so that I did not doubt they would return alive this time. But they had failed. It wasn't Mayor Knox's fault after all, he didn't know everything in the world. But I, the player, was different. I knew why Meyer's calculations were off. Many dungeons rose in difficulty upon entering the second playthrough. From the game's perspective, the change in difficulty was taking into account the transferred skills and stats. But reality was a different story. 
it was too harsh on everyone else that wasn't a player who had those transferred abilities. I was certain the dungeon the green spirits headed to was one of those that had been affected. I contemplated on whether to tell Mayer about this for a while. It wasn't something I could pass off as first playthrough information, after all. But seeing Mayer suffering so much because he had no answers, compassion welled up in me and I made my decision. This was something I had to go over at least once to raise the special unit, anyway. I forced my lips open to speak. Among dungeons there are some that rise in difficulty in the second playthrough. Dungeons that change, in a way. How do you know, if that's the truth, then? The dungeon that the green spirits entered may have been one of them. It's not something you could have done anything about, Captain. You did your best. Meyer's mouth shut tightly and a heavy silence descended. For a long time, he gazed at his reflection in his glass. What could he be thinking? After taking a long time to organize his thoughts, he said, but doing my best was not enough. Because in the end, the green spirits was wiped out except for one he smiled bitterly, clicking his tongue and sighing with deep self-mockery. Perhaps I knew then by instinct that things would turn out this way. It explains why I merely trained the green spirits but did not have Axion or August join them the battle against the demon lord would be hugely impacted if I lost even them, after all. How utterly selfish. I think it was an inevitable decision to make as the captain of an expedition corps. My words were a consolation and, at the same time, my true thoughts. I would have done the same as mayor in the same situation. You are kind. That made me feel like a glass shard was poking my conscience. I'm being objective, I reluctantly refuted. Mayer tapped his glass with his fingertips, thinking about something. On his part, his fiddling held no meaning at all. But if the drunk captain were to loosen his control for even an instant, that glass would shatter or should I say explode from the powerful impact. As I was inside that radius of that potential explosion, I nervously stared at his glass. To my relief, it managed to escape Meyer's hand and scathed as he let out a big sigh. Perhaps there was a way to save Umbra, save the green spirits, and get you to join me as well. But for me at the time, that was the best I could do. I had no reply to that, and he continued over my silence. I do not regret choosing you after all. I would have gone to take you no matter how many times the situation repeated itself. His eyes shone with unshakable determination. Seeing him like that, I felt curious about something I had failed to think of. Why in the world had Mayer chosen me, even at the risk of losing Umbra and the Green Spirits? He couldn't have known I had so much use before we met, nor that I remembered the first playthrough. It couldn't be explained by the fact that he had his eye on me since then. Something was strange after all had I leaked some important piece of information in the past. Chapter, 94 I chewed on my lips. Asking Mayer the reason would be the surest way to find out, but it was Memorial Day for the Green Spirits the timing wasn't good. There would be a chance to ask later since he would want to find out how I knew about the changed dungeons. With that thought, I wet my parched lips with liquor. Mayer poured another glass for himself too, filling it up with an air of self-mockery. With him, you could always drink at your own pace. Yet, despite that freedom, the downside was that it was difficult to hold back. Mayer had already exceeded his drinking limit, from what I had measured from the last time we drank. Any more than that wouldn't be good, so I reached for his glass to make him stop. You've had too much. Mayer smiled bitterly but kept a firm grip on his glass. I can still go. I feel I can have some more with the idle thoughts in my head. Unable to budge him physically, I resorted to words. If you're getting idle thoughts, then talk instead. Isn't that why you called me to drink? To keep you company instead of your thoughts? Meyer's whiskey honey eyes wavered with bewilderment. It was as if he had never considered being able to share his anxieties with another person. You have a talent for bringing out wishes I did not even know I had. It's because you're too strict with yourself, Captain. You set too many standards for yourself. Others can't belittle you, you can't show your feelings, can't acknowledge your sadness in the end, you end up going in circles, unable to see what you actually want for yourself. He stared at me in silence and I added, so, what's bugging you? Mayer hesitated, seemingly having trouble answering me. 
I didn't know what it was, but I knew that he was 100% going to brood over the matter if he kept it to himself. In the past, I wouldn't have worried much about it. I would trust that his steely heart couldn't possibly be shaken by mere guilt. But the mayor Knox I'd observed while being by his side was different from the mayor I knew. In reality, he wasn't irresponsible enough to shake off the guilt growing in his heart. His indifferent appearance was nothing but a kind of self-defense mechanism. If he truly was heartless, he would never have reflected over the Blue Flames incident nor warned me about Nova. Most likely, Mayer defined that sense of responsibility and kindness as a weakness, thinking that they mustn't be shown to others. So long as he thought that way, it would be very difficult to get him to speak his mind, but I still had to. No good would come from piling negativity in his heart, especially when it was unknown how or when that'd explode. I tried persuading him again. Better to brood together than alone, Captain. Maybe two heads can solve whatever it is a little quicker. There is no need for a solution. The matter is already over. But my words might make you feel better, even if only a little. Or you may simply end up with a ruined mood, he retorted. I'd rather hear you out and get a bad mood than to keep feeling uncomfortable in the dark. How extreme, Mayer remarked in exasperation. He didn't look that displeased, though. I shrugged. I tend to prefer certain pain over uncertain hope. And yet you chose me over Fabian. Perhaps it's because I saw a certain pain in you, Captain. Won't lose a single word, will you, he sighed softly. Just because I'm weak doesn't mean I have a hobby of losing. And I've got no reason to let myself lose to you. Right. I find myself fond of that unreserved attitude of yours. Mayer nodded in satisfaction even though my retorts must have come across as insolent. The man was tolerant, that was for sure. I suppose that was why he thought of making me vice-captain. Before we knew it, the bitterness on his lips was gone. He was silent for a long while, touching his glass instead of drinking, before speaking again. What I did for the green spirits could it be that my actions pushed them into a greater hell? It's thanks to your support that they cleared the dungeon, Captain. But they must have struggled amidst suffering for months. And the end they met was a meaningless death. I couldn't reply to that, and so he went on. It is a horrible thing to endure for months in a dungeon. Your nerves will burn out from being on constant guard, so much so that you will wish for death. So what, you're saying that it would have been better for the green spirits to have been wiped out early like in the first playthrough, is that it? I asked. Mayer only smiled faintly instead of answering. The curve on his lips felt somehow gloomy, even hollow. Everything I am doing to change the future may end up for the worse, like with the green spirits. Even so, will you still trust and follow me? He gazed at me with his emotions playing on his face. The man was burdened by the guilt he felt toward the green spirits and afraid of not being able to change the future. Mayor Knox was a man of steel, strong and firm, unwavering and unyielding, which was why everyone put their complete faith in him myself included. Chapter 95 it made me tremble inside that he was showing his weak side to no one but me. It was a kind of emotional privilege that a man who was like a wary, wounded beast would soften only around me, and I wasn't used to it. My fingertips grew hot as if on fire with the desire to embrace Mayer and comfort him. Embrace him? I was startled by the sudden thought. It was apparent that the physical contact we shared, which he didn't remember, had greatly lowered the barrier in my heart. I curled my fingers into my palm as if hiding my feelings and, contrary to those emotions, assumed a cool tone. First of all, what you said is wrong, Captain. Wrong? I didn't know Umbra well, but I don't think she would have died in nothing but despair. There's no way someone who did that would have endured until the very end, let alone kill the dungeon boss. At his silent stare, I added, moreover, she left a survivor in her squad. Is that meaningless? No. And thanks to you bringing me to the Dark Knights, Sevi got to live. And you found a way to slay the Demon Lord, Captain. It's not like all your decisions lead to bad results. Knowing the future didn't mean life went my way. There was no such thing as a perfect outlook on life. One would only realize that what had to be given up, should be given up. I felt this deeply in the first playthrough. 
This was most likely that moment for Mayer now in the second playthrough. Some things you could only watch happen, even though you knew the conclusion. At times, something completely different from what you knew could happen. Such events would occur many times in the future. By changing the things that I could out of all the rest, one by one, I would someday reach the end of the unknown before me, and achieve an ordinary life. This was what I wanted to tell Mayer and at the same time, it was a promise to myself. I held up my glass to him with a deliberate hard tone to my voice. Let your mourning and regrets for the deceased end tonight. You can grieve later, once we've defeated the demon lord and you're being crowned as emperor. I had to heat and temper the iron called Mayor Knox and forge him into a sword devoid of the slightest hesitation. Only then would he be able to last countless battles until the moment he rammed his blade into the demon lord's heart. And he called me kind. I could only sigh at Mayor Knox's poor judgment of people. He gazed at me in silence for a moment, then raised his own glass. Yes. Until we have defeated the demon lord. With sincerity and a sense of mission, we clinked glasses. Some of my drink spilled onto my hand, and the sensation gave me an illusion of liquor seeping into my heart. From that day on, Mayer no longer showed his troubles regarding the green spirits. Maybe he had realized that there was no room for faltering until the demon lord was killed. He spurred himself even more in training his mana. This was better. Before, I would have worried if he wasn't rushing too much, but I felt it better that he had something to focus on like this. Uh, Vice Captain. Sevi timidly came over to me. The boy had looked terrible throughout the entire memorial service. I stopped walking to lend an ear. He hesitated for a long while even after calling me before he barely opened his mouth to speak. We'll be entering a dungeon soon too, right? I met his eyes as I stroked Sevi's hair. Why? Anxious. Even adults would fear stepping into dungeons again after bearing with a memorial. It was only natural that the still young boy was anxious. Besides, Sevi had a near-death experience with the blue flames. Although he had acted like it was nothing at the time, there was no way he was really okay. It's okay to be honest. If Sevi was too afraid to enter a dungeon, I intended on respecting his choice. He was too young. In this time and era, even children like Sevi were being mobilized under the excuse of being talented manpower. Personally, I didn't take too well to that. There were bound to be those with latent potential among other adults. It was just a matter of finding and nurturing new unit members. Sevi shook his head, however, calmly looking at me with his clear eyes. I'm not anxious. Just he trailed off, unsure. It was after he made up his mind that he continued in a whisper. I heard that the person who survived in the green spirits was the youngest recruit. I didn't know if that person was the youngest, but I did hear they were a recruit. Sevi seemed to project himself onto that survivor, lips trembling slightly as he squeezed out, if we run into danger in a dungeon if. It's just speculation, but I thought that you would also try to save me for the sole reason of being young, Vice Captain. I just I wanted to say that I don't want that. Sevi. I'm one of the Dark Knights too. I've made my resolve. I don't want to survive just for being young. Chapter, 96. Sevi's eyes were set with stubbornness, his shoulders wide open as he shouted that he would not survive alone. Had he grown in the past few months? The height of his shoulders was slightly higher than when we first met. But he wasn't all grown up yet. It wasn't exactly pleasant to see Sevi, still a boy, choose pride over his future. Noticing my disapproval, he added persuasively, I was saved once thanks to you, Vice Captain, and it was also thanks to you that I became a mage. That's why I have to repay the favor. I can't let myself get any more indebted. Gone was his always lively and cheerful air. Sevi clutched at my arm and I could feel a sense of urgency from him. Always repay a favor. It's our family motto. And as the heir of House Ventus, I have to uphold it. But your family wouldn't wish for you to die for a motto. Maybe. But I don't want to live on just because I'm young anymore. Bitterness flickered in Sevi's eyes as he paused to find the words to continue. In a somber tone, he began, For generations, my family has been gamekeeper of the southern part of Varen Forest. When you say Varen Forest, 
Yes. The area affected by the Felspawn that escaped a gate several years ago. Fifteen years had passed since dungeon gates began to appear. These days, you wouldn't find any Felspawn coming out of gates thanks to Expedition Corps being readily available to handle them. The incident in Varan Forest was a regretful result brought about by the late discovery of the gate due to its remote location. As one of few such cases, I too knew about it, albeit roughly. Sevi had avoided talking about his family until now. No one asked either, since his induction as a Corps member at such a young age foretold a story by itself. I could easily predict what had happened to them, but even so, hearing it from him didn't make it any less bitter. With his composure intact, Sevi continued, my whole family died then. My parents, grandpa, elder brother and sister everyone tried to save me, even as they were dying to the fell spawn. Only because I was the youngest I remembered then of how he had cried out back on the castle spire, tears bathing his face, shouting that he would become a mage and grow stronger. Was that desire born out of vengeance? I gazed at Sevi with mixed feelings as he quietly spoke with watery eyes. I do not want to be left alone like that, not anymore. I won't leave you alone, I said firmly. He was in an agitated state. I comforted him with the most rational words I could muster. I didn't form the special unit to die with you all. There'll be no death if you listen to me well. Do you trust me? I held Sevi by the shoulder and met his eyes, and he nodded heavily. I trust you, Vice Captain. But if ever something dangerous happens I'll do whatever I can to save you. That's all I wanted to say. Sevi's resolve was firm, and his unwavering gaze showed that. I could sense there was still a scar from his vague words, characteristic of a child, but that was precisely why I was sure I could trust in him. Such pure trust. That being the case I decided to secretly tell him about a future that might pass, something I had never told anyone before. Sevi. I have something to tell you. I'm telling this only to you because I trust you. What is it? Sevi's lit up at the word trust. After confirming no one was around, I faced him and said in a clear voice, if I ever look like I'm about to suicide when we're in a dungeon then let me be. Sevi turned pale. What? It was natural he was bewildered. After all that talk about saving lives and whatnot, I suddenly pulled out suicide. Even so, I calmed the boy in a collected fashion. I have it all thought out. I don't actually intend on dying. B but. You have to trust me when the time comes. Not even the captain knows about this. I'm asking no one but you. Well, of course. The captain would never allow it if he knew, Sevi exclaimed. His reaction was intense, maybe because he knew how soft Mayor Knox was on me. I added appeasingly, I know. Which is why I'm asking you. From what I had observed of Mayer, he was more delicate than people would think. He was not a heartless, cold-blooded dark knight. In truth, he was an ordinary person who could be as wounded as anyone, barring the fact that he was the strongest person in the world. But because he didn't show his wounds to anyone, no one realized how he was inside. Which was why I felt like something unexpected would happen in the final moment. I couldn't say what since I wasn't sure, but it certainly wasn't a situation I welcomed. Butler Vince's request to bring Mayor Knox back alive no matter what kept bothering me, too. It was necessary to prepare for that unexpected moment. Chapter, 97 I gave Sevi an advance warning. Everyone will be confused by my decision. When that time comes I want you to sort out the situation. Got it? I did consider telling August, but the priest was too suspicious and was bound to try and make me spit out answers. What I needed was someone who would bear my words at heart without shooting questions. Although, of course, this would only hold meaning if Sevi stayed with us until the battle against the demon lord. In the end, Sevi nodded slowly. He didn't seem very happy about it and I could see he had many things to ask, but he kept his little lips closed. Not long after the end of the memorial service, I submitted a dungeon raid application for the special units as I had reported earlier to Mayor. The target dungeon wasn't that high in level. But, due to the matter of the green spirits being so recent, Mayor couldn't hide his unease about me setting off on a raid. Don't they say, when in search of honey, expect to be stung? 
It was something I had to do eventually, anyway the man was so confident when it came to his business yet he was restless about mine. Even a parent watching over their child running an errand for the first time would show more composure. Or a hamster owner letting a hamster go out of the house. Only after several chaotic arguments did I barely manage to persuade Mayer. Thus, a week later, the first dungeon raid of the special unit was confirmed. The dark nights buzzed at the news of our upcoming expedition. The louder-voiced ones were vocal about the matter. Well you know, it's about time for them to go on a raid. The special unit's been established for a while now. A support-type mage being the unit leader it wouldn't be strange to be holding a memorial for them next. I doubt that, not with Reverend August accompanying them. It's not like the Reverend will clear the dungeon for them. No matter how much he heals them, it's all done for if the special unit can't defeat the monsters, don't you think? Makes me wonder if they'll end up starving to death in there. Starving to death in a dungeon. Now that would be the shame of us all. But not everyone was making a laugh out of us. The moderate faction thought that whatever the case may be, I was appointed as vice-captain of the Dark Knights. They frowned, finding their mockery inappropriate. One of them spoke up in my defense. Still, the most promising lad among the recruits joined them, and Sevi Ventus awakened as a wind mage. Humph. What help would a runt be when he can't even cast a proper spell? And it's not like it's certain whether he even became a real mage, nor do we know how high his mana efficiency is. Besides, who knows if that woman had the boy's hair dyed to blow some hot air. What would they gain from such deception? The cat would come right out of the bag after a couple of raids. She used it as hard propaganda that you can become a mage by joining the special unit, no? Since she's appealed her resourcefulness to his excellency, you never know if she'll kill Sevi later in some dungeon. Ridiculous. The men were loud and noisy. They were so absorbed in their talk that they didn't notice me listening in on the floor just above them, chin cupped on my hands. Hmm so this is the kind of rumor going around. You do not seem to mind it much, sister, August commented, lips twisted in displeasure. The priest wasn't like how he was in the past, wary of me, thinking that the rumors weren't circulating for nothing. I glanced at him with a grin. You finally realized that all that gossiping is nonsense. Seeing how you become disgusted with rumors with a single scandal between us, I wouldn't mind another one or two popping up. Cease that horrible thought. August cried, shuddering. I cackled at his reaction that differed from his usual lofty and dignified air. Whatever the rumors everyone will find out soon enough that those fellows down there are talking rubbish. The dungeon raid would be a success and Sevi's mana would grow at a tremendous rate. So much so that the naysayers wouldn't be able to deny it as a lie, even if they wanted to. And when that happens, people will be talking about how I awaken someone's mana. How would they react then? I can't wait to see. The look on your face says that you are bent on spreading rumors. He said and I returned a quiet smile. Reading the answer from the shady mirth on my lips, August clicked his tongue with a groan. I ask that you will not rumormonger excessively. I'll keep it to a fair level, just enough to not sully St. Marianne's name. And it's not like I'll be spinning total lies, you know. I do not know your definition of fair, sister, but well August trailed off. I didn't make any unnecessary remarks about that. Chapter, 98 even as August and I conversed, the core members below didn't stop yakking about the special unit's upcoming expedition. Ah, what sinful popularity. I clicked my tongue softly. The special unit's going to take another regular member, they say, so what are the chances of them failing a raid? Regular member. Who? I still haven't heard anything on that, but wouldn't you think it'd be squad leader Axion? He's pretty close with that woman then they really wouldn't end up dying. If squad leader Axion goes with them, then what about the Red Wolves under him? Will they take a break from raids? Bet the Red Wolves are gonna cry. They must have been overjoyed to be led by a flame mage, only for their leader to end up being mobilized as a backup for another team. They get a main dealer on top of a main priest. A special unit getting special treatment, wouldn't you say? All of them seemed convinced that Axion would be helping us out. Even if their nonsense proved to be wrong later, 
they pretend like nothing was said. I was all too familiar with their ways. The only thing that mattered to these people was to form a public opinion. Dungeon expeditions and assignments were a delicate issue. You could only level up in dungeons. Expedition Corps competed to gain rights over dungeons, and such competition was intense even within the same group. As the saying went, the richer the greedier. The Dark Knights were no exception to this, even with all the dungeons they could afford to obtain. The existing Corps members could have hardly welcomed the establishment of a special unit with dungeon priority. I was certain that there had been little opposition from them about the special unit's formation because we were low in level. We wouldn't threaten their interests, the middle and high level dungeons. But seeing how they were acting up already, the second core squads would start a riot if we leveled up fast enough to challenge middle level dungeons. Not that it bothered me much. The worst they could do was to mutter behind our backs like this, after all. All my efforts in leveling up and raising the special unit were to defeat the demon lord. Them, on the other hand, I doubted even a quarter of them had the will to truly fight against the ultimate evil. They were expressing displeasure at being hindered in leveling up, which to them was merely a means of increasing their self-worth. This was why none of these dissenters spoke up to Mayer about our unreasonable privilege. Their deception would only be exposed pretending to be indignant over this unfair situation. I'm starting to get tired of it now. Shall we go? Deciding I had heard enough. I raised myself from the railing I was leaning over. I felt a burning desire to give them what they deserved. August followed after me and asked, Come to think of it, you have yet to talk about the regular member that would join your raid. You would not really be taking Brother Axion, would you? I laughed ambiguously. No way. I said I wanted a seasoned melee attacker, didn't I? The priest frowned suspiciously but didn't ask further. A few days later, I went looking for Axion. June. Had he heard of the gossiping? He welcomed me with an unusually bright face. Have you come to take me after all? I welcome it. Trust in me and I'll make you level 50 in no time. It was truly regretful that I had to break his expectations in his bare face, but I had no choice. I'm here because I want to borrow someone from the Red Wolves, I said firmly. One of ours? Oh, just take me, will you? Or is it because of the rumors? They're all meaningless. That's not why I'm not choosing you. I just don't need you. Oof don't need me. There can't be a team that doesn't need me. Axion exclaimed. Your position overlaps with Sevi's. Sevi will have to work in sync with me eventually, anyway. It wouldn't be a bad idea to do it early, don't you think? Are you telling me that you want to practice chain casting with a level 5? I snorted. Axion, you're too strong. You joining our unit will only result in destroying the balance. If I were only focusing on level up speed, I would have asked the captain. He frowned. You can't bring the captain into this. I'll have nothing to say. That's my intent. Axion grumbled. It was already famous among our elite members that Mayer had given me a free ticket to use him whenever I needed. Then who do you want? Vegan. Spearman Vegan. Axion grew wide-eyed. I do hesitate to say this about one of mine, but why him of all people? He's a decent fellow who can pull his weight, but there's nothing special about him for you to choose. I had a harder time looking for someone decent among the seasoned regular members. More people were against me than I thought. Not being hostile didn't mean they were favorable toward me. It turned out there were only a handful of people I could trust to go into a dungeon with.